Living Reality My Extraordinary Summer with Sailor Bob Adamson Part 2 of 2 Chapter 4 Intimate Talks, The Fun Begins For the next several days, Vashti and I showed Bob and Barbara some of the sights of Longboat Key, Sarasota, and St. Petersburg. We took them to the beach, the St. Petersburg Pier, and the local bookshops we often enjoy. Occasionally, Bob would have a talk in our house with one of the locals which I generally sat in on. In these sessions, Bob gave his usual pointers, and the students asked whatever questions they had. And during our sightseeing trips, I peppered Bob with questions throughout the day. It was during these meetings, particularly at breakfast for some reason, that Vashti got her questions answered. This is why so few of her dialogues show up in this book. Vashti, incidentally, loved staying up till midnight crocheting and watching movies with Bob and Barb. And Bob loved seeing Vashti crochet, as it brought back memories of his mother doing the same. On Thursday night, Vashti boarded a plane for New Hampshire, where she was attending a crochet conference. Although a crochet lover from way back, Vashti had just begun to design patterns professionally. The conference was, in one sense, a present I urged her to take for being so agreeable to my bringing Bob and Barb here. A few months back, Vashti had been anguishing over whether to attend the August Chicago conference or the July New Hampshire one. Each conference had certain benefits that the other did not, and the decision was therefore difficult. Knowing this, I told her to go to both and not to give the cost or time away from the family a second thought. I would be forever indebted to her for letting Bob and Barb stay with us, and I told her so many times. Not that she needed persuading. Vashti was extremely excited about meeting Sailor Bob and hearing his teachings. She was also thrilled that we would be meeting seekers from all over the country who would come to hear him talk. Vashti and I actually enjoyed many laughs over the countless times people would ask her how she felt about having visitors and seekers in the house for a full five weeks. As if anyone had to twist her arm. By the end of Bob's visit, Vashti's spiritual search, which started at the age of nine when she started meditating, came to an end. Her fear of death, which I was totally unaware of, also ceased as did many spiritual illusions and misconceptions. In the end, having enjoyed two crochet conferences and all the wonderful spiritual knowledge, Vashi claimed that she was the biggest winner of the summer of 2004. By far, the most fun part of Bob's visit was the week my two closest friends, Emmett and Carrie, joined me in daily talks with Bob in our living room with the tape recorder rolling. Emmett Carey and I have been friends since meeting in high school drama class and later attending Carnegie Mellon University, a great drama school in Pittsburgh. We also all became teachers of transcendental meditation and attended EST and Lifespring seminars and many other self-development programs. A week in my house particularly brought back memories of teenage years when we spent summers together from morning until night. The three of us have remained in close touch, and like so many contemporary spiritual seekers around the globe with a profound misunderstanding of the nature of liberation, we spent countless hours pining for the day when we could gain the great enlightenment and experience freedom. We contemplated the futility of our dualistic lives and had no clue that it is impossible to avoid presence awareness. We had no idea that ultimate freedom is who we are, like it or not, know it or not. For five straight mornings Emmett, Carrie, Bob and I sat in my living room discussing our favorite subject. Occasionally Del, Vashti, Barbara or my friend Martin Timmons would join in. At the start of the week we treated Bob with utmost respect and deference. By the end of the week we continued treating him well but teased him at every turn. And he of course teased back. We told every spiritual joke we knew, and at meals Carrie constantly commented on Bob's strong preference for food. 
Bob blessed me with a spiritual name, Shri Brahasab, a source of mirth that lasted for several weeks. The crowning shot, however, occurred in one of the restaurants we frequented. After lunch, Bob noticed a crooked wall hanging and asked Carrie to straighten it out. Carrie thus inferred that Sailor Bob Adamson, disciple of the great sage Nisar, Gadaita Maharaj, had told him nay ordered him to go out and make the crooked straight. We concluded that Sailor Bob had authorized Carrie to speak, and that it was a divine proclamation which could not be rescinded. Thus it was a festive week, one that none of us will ever forget. In truth, Bob did encourage us to teach. He suggested that after he left, I form a group with some of the locals who had come to his talks and invite newcomers who might be interested. He advised Carrie to do the same in Connecticut. His obvious interest in our teaching was intriguing to us because, aside from his love of food, it was the only apparent desire we ever saw in Bob. Because of his remarkably free nature, it stood out. But, the fact that Bob appears to be devoid of preferences does not mean he doesn't have them. It's just that he rarely gets hooked by anything. Moods, preferences and judgments come and go, but they do so with great speed. They're not his as he would say, so who's to take delivery of them? But he seemed to want us to spread non-duality. Whether he wanted this for us, to help stabilize our understanding, or for the benefit of others, I don't know. The months after he left, I asked what motivated him to speak and he said, I really can't tell you James. It's just what's happening. When I asked whether it was because he felt for those who lacked the knowledge, he said no. Not really. It's just like if you see people walking down a street and know they're heading for a roadblock, you warn them to take a detour. This surprised me. He had spent thirty years helping others in such a profound way and was so simple in his answer. In the three months since he had left, I personally had sent at least fifteen emails expressing my profound gratitude for what he had done for me. And he had occasionally enjoyed telling me stories about others who got the understanding real good. He's most certainly aware of the incredible contribution he has made. Thus I assume the answer regarding his motivation has to do with seeing life as perfect, no matter which way it goes. And with his lack of vested interest in anything other than what is. Bob's interest in our teaching slightly startled me because I had told him on the first morning we spoke that I would not be teaching. This was, however, before my sense of separation and perpetual concerns over past and future had abated. For some reason, probably stemming from our phone conversations, I sensed that Bob would want us to teach, assuming we grasped his message. On the first or second day of their visit, Barb mentioned privately how pleased she thought Bob would be if Carrie and I got the understanding and then carried on the teaching. I gave this very little thought however because I was at this time trying to get the understanding myself. I was not thinking about anyone else. Further Sailor Bob or no Sailor Bob, I would not be pushed into teaching before I felt I had something real to give. In retrospect, it is easy to see why Bob expected us to grasp his message. At the time, however, I was not sure of my ability to necessarily grasp anything. I'd been on the path for over thirty years and was still seeking. The day I realized clearly that Bob was interested in my teaching was the afternoon when Kerry made his joke about being authorized to speak. This occurred in our living room, some time after the restaurant wall hanging event. Carrie announced the joke, and we all laughed heartily after which I left the room joking, but half seriously, great. Then I won't have to teach. Upon reaching my destination, the utility room, I saw Bob following me at which time I turned around to hear him say with puzzlement, what's this about not speaking? It's true that Bob wears a hearing aid and sometimes asks people to repeat themselves. But the moment he asked for clarification I knew something was up. I was therefore a bit startled. 
even as non-dual understanding was settling in more and more by the day, I felt it could be quite some time before I'd be feeling comfortable teaching others. In some sects of Buddhism, those who gain the understanding are instructed to wait a full ten years before speaking publicly. This is in one sense wise. If more teachers waited perhaps their teachings would be clearer and more effective, or perhaps fewer teachers would fall prey to temptations. But, looking back, if I had waited ten years to speak, what would have happened to someone like John Ali? Donna's life has been radically altered by the non-dual understanding she gained some months after Bob's departure. He's a friend of Emmett's and had been on the path for 20 or 30 years. Emmett had told Jana about non-duality and advised her to visit the Sunday talks I was holding. He was on vacation right then and wanted to spend some time hearing the teaching. So I invited her to Longboat Key, where she stayed for two and a half days, getting non-duality better than any of my other students. Within days of her departure, I was surprised to begin receiving emails of profound gratitude, which are still coming, that are amazingly similar to the ones I am constantly sending Sailor Bob. The same phenomenon has happened to Carrie, who has had two students who grasped non-duality so strongly their lives are forever altered. Contrary to what many think, Sailor Bob was never authorized by Nisargadatta. When people ask him if he was, he always says the same thing, no. But, it wouldn't have mattered one way or the other. Once I understood non-duality, no one could have stopped me. It is a viewpoint with which I wholeheartedly resonate. The book you are reading was begun less than one week after Bob left Florida and had nothing to do with Bob's desire that I teach. By the time Bob left, I was waking up in the middle of the night and rushing to the computer to put non-dual insights in print to share with others. When non-duality is seen, it is a bug that bites strong and hard. When non-duality or no thing is recognized, it seeks itself everywhere, much like the flame of one candle lighting others, as Bob so aptly puts it. Thus there are different viewpoints about who should teach and when they should begin. Subchapter Carrie Arrives On Friday night, Carrie arrived and we immediately sat down with Bob and Barb for a talk. Although Carrie had learned of non-duality only a year or so earlier, he had understood it quickly and immediately became consumed by it. He read many books in a short span of time and resonated powerfully with Ramesh Balsakar, Nisargadatta's translator and close disciple. Ramesh is now 89 years old and has written over 25 books on the subject. He has also spoken to thousands of students during his daily talks in his Bombay apartment. Before we had ever learned of Sailor Bob, Carrie was constantly talking about Ramesh's books and the insights he was gaining from them. The more Carrie had raved about Ramesh's books, the more I had wondered why he didn't go see him. Actually, I felt I knew the answer. It simply wasn't in Carrie's nature to jump on a plane and fly to India to see Kuru. Nevertheless, right after one of our long philosophical phone discussions, I sent him an email saying, I think you need to go see Ramesh. The message was sent innocently, inspired by my knowing how much Carrie loved Ramesh's teachings. Not in my wildest imagination did I expect him to follow the advice, even though it was given in earnest. Mind you, I had been to India twice in the 80s myself and had seen many others travel to the Far East for knowledge. Knowing Kerry, however, it seemed like a long shot. He had gone to Europe eight or ten times for spiritual courses, but India clearly wasn't his style. Or it never had been, until now. Kerry went to see Ramish and was powerfully moved. So much so that several months later he flew back, bringing his 15-year-old son with him. All teachers have their own methods, naturally, and Ramish's were different from Sailor Bob's. 
Ramish's main focus was on the issue of non-doership, which Kerry grasped in a visceral way. I watched as he gained relief from certain psychological issues that had plagued him for a lifetime. Non-doership did not affect me much at the time, and I watched with interest as Carrie's understanding became very deep. When Sailor Bob's book came along however Carrie like me was struck like a thunderbolt. Bob's teaching, simple as it is, is so direct, pure and profoundly uncompromising. I do not mean to compare spiritual teachers, particularly in print. Aside from the fact that each teacher has his or her own forte, the world is nothing if not diverse. Every teacher attracts the appropriate students for his or her particular teaching style. Furthermore, what is medicine for one is poison to another. In my view, Sailor Bob's teachings are remarkable in the truest sense of the word. They are remarkable for many reasons. His refusal to hold out promises of a better future, a future that simply doesn't exist. Right here, right now is perfect just as is. Period. His absolute clarity about the illusory nature of creation, and his exclusive attention on that which is real and permanent. His willingness to teach others and send them on their way without fanfare, guru worship, financial rewards and so on. In his utter simplicity, humility and lack of self-interest. The greatest gift of Bob's teaching, however, is his unwillingness to include anything dualistic. He avoids the usual traps and pitfalls others fall into. Many teachers unwittingly bring in duality by holding themselves up as special, for having transcended ordinary experience and attained enlightenment, a dualistic distinction to begin with. The more these teachers allow themselves to be worshipped and adored, the more they nourish duality in their students. Some teachers hold out the concept of a final understanding, which would be fine except that the concept becomes a dangling carrot that keeps others seeking forever. As long as one believes there is a special experience to attain, one will never allow oneself to simply be. And it is in the being, not the craving or doing, where one realizes one's true nature. One of the facets of Bob's teaching that touches me most is his absolute indifference towards spiritual or mystical experiences, miracles, people who can perform miracles, the final understanding, or people who are said to possess the final understanding. When Bob says there is no difference between a Buddha and an ordinary person, he means it. When he says that no one, not Christ, Buddha, Shankara, Lao Tzu or Ramana, has ever gone beyond no thing, he is positively correct. And most importantly, within minutes Bob, and any of his students, can show anyone with the slightest openness, that it is impossible to locate an independent self-center within ourselves. When that is seen, it becomes clear that we are in fact the same space or consciousness or no thing as Christ, Buddha, Ramana or any other saint, sage or seer. Thus we are understanding the same truths they did. Perhaps the biggest illusion most long-time seekers possess is the notion that included in awakening are special powers, miracles, 24-hour-a-day bliss and ecstasy and so on. And the notion that there is some kind of final understanding which brings on these so-called God-like attributes. To believe these ideas is to misunderstand non-duality and or to disbelieve what sages and seers have told us down through the ages. If all creation is in essence oneness or consciousness, or as scientists demonstrate space, light, then everything in manifest creation is a miracle. A blade of grass is a miracle. A wall is a miracle. A pumpkin is a miracle. And this is not to mention science, art, literature, aviation, medicine and so on. It is certainly possible that some who have taught spiritual subjects have displayed superhuman traits or enjoyed phenomenal meditative states. But, never have these teachers, the genuine ones at least, taught that these abilities were important. 
They have always spoken of such experiences as side effects that vary from person to person. Moreover, many seekers fail to realize that miracles and phenomenal meditative states are accomplished far more readily by persons from Eastern cultures. It is likely that genetics and cultural upbringing play a large part in these happenings. Cultural factors are almost certainly the apparent reason why Hindus have visions of Krishna and Shiva while Westerners more readily report seeing Christ and Mother Mary or experiencing the stigmata. Further, many Easterners have allegedly developed siddhis or supernatural powers without possessing any real spiritual understanding. Thus, miracles are not necessarily connected to the end of separation and suffering or the experience of wholeness. Because there has been so much erroneous teaching regarding miracles and liberation over the centuries, and particularly in the last several decades, seekers are now at a tremendous disadvantage. Those who desire liberation in order to enjoy miracles or pervasive bliss are completely missing the point. People approach non-dual teachings but are unwilling to give the understanding a chance to sink in because miracles and trance-like meditative states are not part of the promise, they are just delaying their own ultimate freedom. This is not to say such people must change or do something different. Whatever happens is certainly perfect. It is just what is. And in any case, no one actually needs to awaken. The dream is fine whichever way it goes because after all it is a dream. On the other hand, for those who can no longer bear the persistent sense of separateness and the disturbing concerns over past and future, perhaps it is time to seriously reconsider the need and or benefit of miracles, bliss and superhuman abilities. For those who have wanted liberation for the better part of a lifetime and have done their due diligence of meditating religiously and attending spiritual courses and flying here and there to see all kinds of gurus for years on end, perhaps it is time to reevaluate the meaning of liberation. Perhaps it is time to reconsider why one embraced spiritual life in the first place usually because all outer experiences were seen as blatantly transitory and unfulfilling. Finally, perhaps it is time to go back and read all the scriptures and other books on enlightenment to see how they relate to the non-dual understanding. Mind you, the habit of believing in miracles and bliss as part of ultimate freedom has been part of my existence for so long that for several months after Bob left, I found myself wondering about my own experience. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that Bob's teachings left me with nothing instead of something. And because there were no miracles or constant bliss, the question of my liberation kept arising. Whenever this occurred, I followed Bob's teachings of investigating the only truth I know. I cannot say that I am not, I cannot say I don't exist. Then, as I look inward to perceive my existence, what do I find? I find that there is no James, there is no self-center. And that is when I realize viscerally that I am free. Why am I free simply because I cannot find a self-center within? Because instead of being the someone or something that I believed I was for over fifty years, I now immediately see that I am no thing and that no thing which is the ground of being upon which all experience occurs is eternal, unbounded and unlimited. The no thing that I am cannot be cut by the sword, drowned by water, dried by wind or burned by fire as Krishna so eloquently said in the Bhagavad Gita. The absolute or unmanifest that I so dearly craved during the seemingly endless search of several decades is clearly who I am. But for all those years, it could not be seen for so many misunderstandings and false concepts. The biggest misunderstanding was related to bliss, ecstasy, miracles, special powers, and all of the rest of the spiritual materialism that unfortunately passes for freedom these days. For those who still desire miracles, incidentally, they are of course possible. Anything is possible because the purpose of the mind is to divide. 
and the more the mind divides, the more interesting phenomena people will create. Indeed, the desire for powers and special abilities captured my attention so deeply that one day in our living room I asked Bob why he did not want them. He quickly shot back why. Though this illusory person can impress other illusory people. I found his answer interesting, but told him I wanted powers. He then said in his typical free-floating way, well, if you want them, they can be developed. Anything is possible. Interestingly, however, unless one is using mystical techniques to consciously develop powers and abilities, they stand more chance of occurring when the desire for them is relinquished. Although I have not found myself walking on water, levitating, or creating ethereal bodies, life has become more effortless than ever. Daily efforts and desires seem to fulfill themselves with very little resistance. And when for some reason expectations and desires cannot be met, instead of the usual frustration and angst, there is, generally, acceptance. There is an understanding that things are exactly as they should be. Aside from the psychological relief this brings, it also somehow allows many of the thwarted desires to suddenly reverse and go my way. I've also noticed that when desires meet with failure and are then relinquished, events often turn out better than if the desires had been fulfilled. This is an interesting phenomenon and a miraculous way to live, compared to my past. To say this is different from my previous existence would be a vast understatement. Interestingly, some five or six weeks after Sailor Bob left I was able to give up my twenty-year astrology practice. This was something I had wanted to do for a long time, but couldn't because of financial needs and a family to support. Hindu Vedic astrology was a wonderful profession that I absolutely loved, but after so many years in the field, I enjoyed writing about it more than interpreting people's birth charts. I had felt ready to move on for several years but in addition to feeling constrained by finances, I had no clear direction of what to do next. So, one day in early October, I decided to quit and see what would happen next. I had enough accumulated investments to live for a while, but not for long. Within a month or so, I happened upon an investment that quickly produced several years of my normal salary. When I told Bob of how effortlessly my desires were being fulfilled and how odd this was compared to my past, he explained that when a person stops resisting every little occurrence and gets out of the way, intelligence energy has a chance to organize things naturally. He calls it effortless living. I did not, by the way, stop doing astrology readings because the practice interfered with non-duality. It does not. Astrology is a wonderful method to help individuals in their lives within the appearance. In the same way that when a toilet overflows we must call a plumber, an astrologer can help people utilize their greatest talents and avoid potential pitfalls. I stopped my professional practice mainly because I was exhausted from doing so many private readings over several decades, while at the same time writing five intricate and demanding astrological textbooks. Note. I stopped astrology in 2005 and then started up again in 2010, a few years after the 2008 economic crash. It has been, I must mention, an easier, more enjoyable, and fulfilling career by leaps and bounds than before non-dual understanding. Contrary to the teachings of some 20th century gurus, everyone who gains liberation or grasps non-duality does not immediately fulfill all desires and enjoy wonderful worldly circumstances. Although one's approach to and experience of life must almost certainly become dramatically easier and more graceful anything is possible regarding events and circumstances. Lots of sages have endured all kinds of difficulties even after their so-called awakenings. Indeed, Sailor Bob encountered some very rough years health-wise and financially after being with Nisargadatta. 
Despite these hardships, however, Bob said that underneath it all was a distinct sense of well-being. At any rate, below begins the six or seven days of intimate conversations that Carrie joined in on. Carrie has an excellent understanding of non-duality. He also has a remarkable intellect and a wealth of knowledge in meditation and Hindu, Vedic spiritual teachings. His insights are valuable and the questions he brought Bob made for very stimulating talks. Tub Chapter Carrie Bob Barb and James Friday night, July 23 There's no me to get enlightened. Carrie, Ramish distinguishes between an intellectual understanding and a leap to total understanding. Something that is sudden and irreversible, self-verifying and self-validating. He describes the suddenness like this, there are so many steps to the top. You're climbing step, step, step without knowing when you've reached the last step. Then suddenly, you've reached that last step, and you realize that there are no more steps. You've only climbed one last step, and yet there's a suddenness about it because you realize it's the last step. Of course this is all conceptual. This leaves people who feel they haven't had that experience thinking they have a good intellectual understanding of the knowledge, but not a total understanding. And that the total understanding lies somewhere in the future. This is a big departure between the way you teach and the way he teaches. Bob, I go back to what the ancients say. Existence is non-dual. There's no person that can climb any steps and get anywhere. There's no final step. In the immediacy of right now is the knowingness or the presence awareness. That's all there is. It's beyond or prior to the mind. It's prior to any labeling. There's no entity to get anything. The idea of an entity is when a thought arises. Carry, the entity is the thought. Bob, right. And the thought has no independent nature. Where's it going to go? What's intellectual and what's not? There's no label necessary. What it amounts to is this, what you're seeking you already are. The idea of a seeker or a search is nothing more than an idea or a concept. Carry, so the idea of a sudden shift is irrelevant. Some people come to you and hear the teaching, and they come back week after week or month after month, and so on. Then, there are people who come to you and get the understanding and never need to see you again. This implies there was a moment when they said, Aha, I got it. Bob, there's just a seeing. The very idea that there was a moment is false. In omnipresence, what moment could there have been? Harry, only the ever-present moment. Bob, presence is only a label also. There is a seeing, but in fact there has always been a seeing. It's just that it was ignored. In the seeing, as it's recognized or cognized, you know there was never a time when you were not. James, the distinction enlightenment becomes irrelevant. There is no enlightenment. Bob, and the seeking that seemed to go on for all those years becomes irrelevant. James, I think what Carrie is asking about is this, within the world of illusion, there's this great enlightenment that happens. But, you don't acknowledge that, do you? Bob, the great thing that happens is illusion also. It happens in the world of illusion. James, the term enlightenment is ridiculous. As soon as someone uses the term, I just hate it. Carrie, I cringe when I say it and I cringe when I hear it. James, there just is no such thing. It's the essence of absurdity. People think there's a me who's going to get enlightened. When you explain that liberation is when you lose the me, they think, wow, I can't wait until I lose the me. I'm going to love that. What a joke. And that's exactly what I went through. Carrie, I was speaking with a woman on the phone the other day, and she asked me, do you have the understanding? I couldn't say no and I couldn't say yes. What I found myself saying was, I'm not looking for answers anymore. I'm no longer seeking. Bob, 
you could say there is understanding. Harry, I did say something like that but I also said that the understanding doesn't feel personal. It has nothing to do with me. Bub, it can't have or it wouldn't be the understanding. James, there were many times when seekers asked Ramana Maharshi questions, and he would just sit totally silent without answering. They would then repeat the question several more times and he still wouldn't answer. Then the next day he would address their inquiry in some way. But, essentially certain questions were properly answered only by silence. Bob, there's no teaching and no one to be taught. There's just a natural resonance. Innately we already know. When it's spoken and heard, not with the mind but with the heart, it resonates. Not the physical heart, but the heart as a symbol of the core of your being. The core of your being is waiting to resonate with this teaching. From then on, it's like lighting a candle from another candle. The flame is recognizing itself, and there's a subtle rejoicing. This is conceptual also, but there's a subtle rejoicing with the energy and stirring with what is called the search. But there's something here that is not the mind or the intellect that already knows this. Carrie, it's a place where there are no questions. Cognizing emptiness is something I resonate with. There's a sense that there is just nothingness. Bob, there's no self-center within you. There's no independent nature to your I am thought. When you see the falseness of your reference point, you realize there's nothing but space or emptiness inside. Carrie, yes. I see. It's interesting, I don't have a smooth life and it's become very clear that even after understanding nothing changes. My moods and thoughts are still here, but now I'm aware that they're taking place on this non-changing awareness. That term space like awareness is a great description of it. Bob, like I said, there are still emotional ups and downs. Take the E off emotion and you have motion. Like waves on the ocean, there's still water. Carrie, so what about this idea of a sudden awakening and the sanctification from the guru who acknowledges that the disciple has made it? For example, Ramish has authorized a few people to speak. These are people he has authorized. In due respect, he doesn't use the word enlightenment and doesn't like it. He uses the phrase total understanding. Bob, Carrie, let me ask you this, do you have the understanding? Carrie, yes. Bob, well could I authorize you to speak? Carrie, I don't think you could stop me from speaking. Bob, so what's all this about someone authorizing someone else to speak? Carrie, well one thing Ramish says to people sometimes is if the talking happens talk. But, don't go hanging out a shingle saying you're speaking. Because that would be a personal agenda. In Advaita circles, there's a subtle message that you're not supposed to want to speak. Though everyone has a story about how they got dragged into speaking. What nonsense. These people want to talk where they wouldn't be talking. Also within the satsang spiritual gathering talk, environment, there's an assumption that those who ask questions don't understand. Though, many people sit back at lectures and won't open their mouths. They don't want to reveal that anything is missing. They want to feel like they have the understanding. Barb, the ego is still in the way. Harry, understanding can be there. Questions can be there. Anything can be there. Contractions can be there. There can be a forgetting. For me that no longer negates anything. I no longer think oh. A question has arisen. Therefore I don't have the understanding. Bob, whatever can be remembered or forgotten is not you anyway. Carrie, I've realized that it doesn't matter what comes up. What comes up doesn't define what's here. It's just what's coming up. It could be anything. Bob, that's right. It becomes all-inclusive. Whatever comes up is appearance. Have a look, who is it happening to? 
It's happening to me. And who is this me? It's a false reference point. Thub chapter. No destiny, no free will. Carrie, what about the concept of destiny, Bob? I understand that there is no destiny or free will. They're just concepts. Bob, they're labels. Carrie, but there is an apparent destiny and an apparent free will. Bob, there can be an apparent anything. All appearances and any possibilities are possible. James, well, after something has happened, would you say that what occurred was destined? Now that it's happened, wouldn't you say that was destined? We're being lived right. You were being lived to speak on non-duality. I was being lived to practice astrology. That's destiny. Bob, you're talking about the appearance. You're talking about what happened in time, which is a mental concept. James, joking, that's the problem with Bob. He only wants to talk about reality. He never want to talk about the appearance. Bob, that's what happens even in the scriptures. They move into duality. There's nothing simpler than one. Carrie, it doesn't leave much to talk about. James, how do you have satsangs? Bob, you just talk. That's what's happening. The idea of destiny exists only from a reference point. We look at life from a viewpoint of 70 or 80 years. But, if the reference point were 70 or 80 billion light years, what would our reference point be then? We think we are the end all and be all. But, the reference point we're using is false. And because everything is in essence, oneness, all reference points in the appearance are false. Carry, so the concept of destiny implies my destiny. And it implies that some god-like entity or force is looking out for me and creating a chain of events that is ultimately good for me. Bob, yes. Exactly. If you use the reference point from 50 billion light years away, then this earth is less than a speck of dust. Where would we be on that speck of dust? Or take the life of a gnat. It hatches in the morning, mates in the afternoon and dies at night. How could it ever conceive of our lifespan, of 60 or 70 years? Barb, and the term destiny seems to imply time. It implies a beginning and an end. Bob, there's a saying, no birth, no death, no time, no space, no destiny, no free will. James, nothing ever happened. Bob, but the seeming happenings go on. Barb, even the word limitless is a concept. It's hard for our minds to grasp this. Bob, we'll never grasp this with the mind. The nature of the mind is to divide. You can never grasp non-duality with something that is dualistic. It's just a movement of energy, and the boundary that we put on it is the word, the label. In the Bible it says in the beginning was the word, the label. And the word was God. Carrie, some teachers of non-duality are a bit more compromising. They sort of emphasize the life of the apparent person they're talking to. Clearly, some students aren't ready to hear such pure non-dual teachings, and they have to go back and live their lives. So the teacher tries to give the person something to make that life easier. Instead of trying to negate everything, instead of saying, you're just an illusion, there's nothing, 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 the teacher gives them something they can use. Maybe explaining in detail that the person is not the doer, and the happenings of their life are largely due to genetics and upbringing and so on. Bob, I would tell the person to look for the cause of their problems, which is the self-center, the belief in the separate entity. That's the cause. It's only a me that can be fearful, depressed, sad, or whatever. Have a look at the me, and see that it's just an idea or a concept with no substance or independent nature. James, joking, you're killing me, Bob. I'm losing my identity here. Bob, in losing that you're free. 
you're free to be what you've always been but we're ignoring. When the cause of the problem drops off, the effects fall away. You don't have to go to a psychiatrist or anybody who's going to perpetuate it for you. These people think they'll patch you up and make you whole. It's a waste of time. James, are there many takers? Bob laughing. How can one be many? Who am I? James, there's this technique that Ramana used to teach where you ask, who am I? People do this for years and years. Harry, that's because they're expecting an answer, instead of understanding that no answer is the answer. Bob, the questioner is the question. If that question isn't being asked, there's no questioner or question. Without the questioner or the question, you're left with the immediacy of the moment. Carrie, the question establishes a false center within the questioner. There's an assumed I asking the question. The very question establishes the me which actually doesn't exist. It's funny, the knowingness doesn't need to know anything. Bob, it's empty. Carrie, it doesn't need to know anything, and therefore it knows everything it needs to know. It's an all-knowing and a nothing-knowing. Bob, it's all-knowing. It's an emptiness-knowing. In knowing that, you don't have to try and conceptualize a knowingness or an emptiness. It's there naturally. Carrie, thoughts arise out of that knowingness. Kind of a non-experiential experience, this knowingness that I am prior to thought. Bob, the thoughts are not attached anywhere. They're not independent. So there's no need to fixate on them. Carrie, but even now some hang around longer than others. But, they're starting to look like black spots on a white sheet. Bob, some people say their thoughts are more annoying after the understanding because suddenly they're so noticeable. Nisargadatta used to say now and again, an old thought pattern comes up, and then it's immediately discarded. Carrie, Bob I feel funny mentioning Ramesh's teachings to you. It almost seems rude to come see you and then talk about another teacher. But, the reason it comes up is because there's a need to integrate what I learned from him and what I've learned from you. I respect both you and Ramesh tremendously. Bob, yes. The important point is that in the end you leave both of us behind. Leave Ramesh behind. Leave me behind. You have enough understanding to stand on your own two feet. I never needed Nisargadatta after I grasped what he was teaching. I went to see him once about a year later. And I still think of him. He kicked everything out from underneath me. He kicked out all my concepts. He didn't want me to hang around after that. James, we have to kick the guru out too. The guru is just another concept. Bob, you have the understanding. Now, let that develop within you. Let your own understanding come through. When a little child starts walking, he might fall down after the first few steps. But, then he gets up and is eventually running and jumping and so on. All we teachers can do is point you toward what has always been ignored. We've been so conditioned to look outside ourselves. That sense of separation has made us think that if we amass, accumulate, and acquire, we'll become whole and complete. But we were never separate in the first place. All the teaching can do is point you to where you never looked before. When you do look, you see that what we've believed in falls apart. False can't stand up to investigation. And you're left with what you've always been. James, non-conceptual, ever-fresh, self-shining presence awareness, just this and nothing else. But some people will hear this teaching and say yes, but I don't have the experience. I don't have the feeling that liberation is supposed to give. Harry, well that's because it's really a stripping away of those very expectations and concepts. Bob, they believe everything they've read about all the wonderful experiences and they believe they have to have them. I had all kinds of experiences, visions and yogic kriyas, spontaneous bodily movements and God knows what. 
James, can you tell us? Carrie, no, I don't want to hear them. They annoy me and I don't want to hear them. Because of the damage that was done by having those beliefs. James showed me the Papaji books, and he's talking about seeing Krishna and all kinds of miracles like that. I put the book right down. It makes me angry. Bob, yes, James showed me that book. I only glance at it, but all the talk of miracles is rubbish. It's useless. Carrie, not only is it rubbish, it's damaging rubbish for the student who reads it. All it does is make the person feel further away from the understanding. Bob, and keeps them looking for bigger and better experiences. Carrie, and without them you think I don't have it. I'm not good enough. James, well, what you're saying is true. But, at the same time, I wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't read those books. I started Advaita with the Papaji books meaning Papaji, and the three-volume Papaji biography called Nothing Ever Happened. Non-dual teachings are in those books, even though they're mostly about his non-stop miracles. Kerry, James and I studied for a while with a teacher named Andy Reimer. He used to break down enlightenment into two stages, awakening and deliverance. Awakening was when you've realized you're not the body or the mind. Deliverance was when you become stabilized. I think that means when you're no longer constantly getting caught in the reference point and the me. James, I remember being surprised at his definition of enlightenment. He said it's when you know with absolute conviction that you are not what you appear to be or what others consider you to be. That sounds like non-dual understanding. It has nothing to do with visions, powers, samadhi, lack of desires and all that. I was surprised. But, now it makes sense. Carrie, Bob, what do you make of the stories of all the miracles the Indian guru supposedly do? And the story of the enlightened sage who has himself walled into a cave to die because he's ready to die and go home. Bob, that's all in the manifestation. The essence that you are was never born and never dies. It never changes. It's no thing. And no matter who it is, no matter what great sage or seer, they can't go any further than no thing. What they're appearing on is no thing. Carrie, I love the phrase no thing. The clearest experience that's with me all the time, actually there's not a focus on it all the time, but as soon as you bring the focus on that no thing, that's the reality. There's no thing in here. That's obvious. There's obviously a physical body, and there's obviously a physical world. But, it's all one thing, and this one thing is no thing. You can't call it an experience. It's like a lively insight or something. Bob. One of the things that moves people into duality is the writings of these traditions. That's a trap. All the traditions say existence is oneness, it's one without a second. But, then they go into duality by writing about it. Carrie, I read somewhere that Buddha said it's one without a second and then wrote 10,000 verses on it. Bob, Buddha said that every sentient being has been your father and your mother. That means Buddha, Christ, and all of them have been your parent. And you've been their parents. Carrie, what did he mean by that? Bob, the vibrating life energy has manifested as everything. In essence, everything is the same energy. On another subject, it says in the Bible that God made man in his own image and likeness. People think that means God looks like us but the image is the pure intelligence energy. Carrie, the no thing. James, joking, you mean God doesn't look like me? Bob, in essence he is you. Carrie, when you hear people's different visions or experiences of the divine, which are very real for them and sometimes lead to awakening, they always see the God that they believe in. The Christians see Mary and Jesus, and the Hindus see Krishna and Shiva. I don't think the Jews have anyone to see. James, the burning bush.
scary. In the Bible Moses says, I am that I am. How many biblical scholars have any idea of the real intention of that statement? Or how complete that is? Bob, when I lecture I say I'm not speaking to any body. I can't because that body's got no independent nature. If there's no life force in the body it's a corpse. Nor am I speaking to the mind. The mind can't see or feel or hear. I'm speaking to that sense of presence that expresses through the mind as the thought I am. That sense of presence is an awareness of presence, or a presence of awareness. They're not two. Just this and nothing else. And that's the immediate introduction to the natural state. You are with it, that is you. Subchapter. Carey investigates the illusion of death. Carey, let's talk about death. Bob, it never happened. Life continually lives on life. All that was born was the thought I am. The me. And that's what dies. That's why the mind is constantly dividing and chattering. It doesn't want to die. It never had any life anyway. It's like a leech, clinging on to that pure intelligence energy. Believing it has some power. Carrie, what happens when the body drops? Bob, it's just a switch in energy. It reaches its peak or zenith, and then disintegration starts. Enzymes break the body down, and maggots come along and feed off it. The body goes back into the earth, and then a seed sprouts from it and grows a blade of grass. Then something eats that blade of grass and so on. Life lives off life. James, how about when the mind realizes it's going to die? Bob, that's the point. You can die right now, to that sense of me. And then there's no problem possible. Then you don't care about the so-called other death that comes along. James, well as long as we're alive we never completely lose the reference point. It's never completely lost. Bob, reference points will seemingly be there, choices will be made, preferences will be held, but the conviction is there that there's absolutely no entity doing any of those things. James, does your reference point ever come up and... Bob, it's not my reference point. Reference points come up. There's no doer, but doings will seemingly continually happen. But, to whom? James, I understand no one has a reference point, but a reference point arises. For example, I may think, oh, somebody has done something to me. And then I remember there is no me. At the moment of death, I expect a really big reference point would show up. Bob, at the moment of death, there's nothing to think. You won't know when you've taken your last breath. James, at the moment right before though, when the train is coming right at you I expect there would be a big reference point coming up that says oh, I'm about to die. Bob, yes that will be a thought. And imagining about what death is like. Carrie, and that could take all kinds of different shapes, enlightened or not enlightened. It could be the nature of this body to have lots of fear. It could be the nature of your body to not have that same fear. For example, my father was in World War II. After that he was never afraid of anything again. And of course he wasn't awakened. I know that if I were diagnosed with terminal cancer, there would be an intense reaction. My recovery time from that emotional reaction would be pretty quick. My awareness of that reaction being projected on the no thing on the pure awareness would also be there. But, the emotion would be pretty gripping. Bob, you don't really know what would happen until it actually occurs. Carrie, of course. But, my sense of it is there would be fear. How would you react if that happened? Bob, how would I know? You don't know anything about what will happen in the supposed future. There are many cases where in times of crisis people do things they never expected. There was a recent case of a man who was about to throw himself off a cliff. 
Another man there leapt forward, risking his life, and grabbed the suicidal man back. Afterwards, people asked him why he did that, because he almost fell off the cliff himself. He answered, I don't know. I couldn't have done anything else in that moment. Carrie, there's an interesting phrase. Death is part of living, not dying. My understanding is that after death there's pure awareness, but there's no awareness of the awareness. The awareness is not aware of itself. Bob, it's just purely aware, self-aware. Carrie, but self-aware implies a center, doesn't it? Bob, no. Like the sun which is self-shining. It doesn't need another light. The sun doesn't know light. It can't know darkness and it can't know light. It has nothing to compare itself to. It just shines of itself. And that's what's happening to us right now. We're self-aware. We don't need anything to tell us we're aware. When that thought comes up, I'm aware, that's just a translation of what's already happening. All thoughts do is translate, but they're so closely aligned to that awareness, or pure intelligence energy, that they've come to believe they are the power themselves. That's what has to be seen. Prior to any translation, the knowingness, or being, is there. Carry, so it's like deep sleep. Awareness is there, but there's no one to be aware. Bob Wright. Thub Chapter. Bob Carey, Dell Emmett, Martin, Barb, and James. Saturday night. July 24. No method needed, just understanding. Dell, in Zen, there are koans to sort of jolt a person into the awareness. Is there anything, any method within non-duality like that? Bob, when you say is there a method to help you reach awareness, where's the you? There is no doer to be found anywhere. There's no self-center that you can locate. Though there are no techniques or methods. Speaking of Zen, have you read Banke? He calls it unborn Buddha mind. He says, everything is perfectly resolved in the unborn. Why exchange the unborn for thought? Simple as that. Instead of leaving everything as is, we get stuck into the thought, trying to work out everything with thought. Del, because as you say we label everything. So how do we take the labels off? How do we stop labeling? Bob, just understand what a label is. A label is just a word or concept. The word can never be the thing. Without a label, the thing is just what it is, unmodified, uncorrected, and unaltered. When you see this room, do you have to tell yourself you're seeing it? No. There's just the seeing, in the immediacy before the label comes up. Emmett. Anthropologists talk about primitive tribes who have never seen photographs. When the tribes people saw photos of themselves, they had no idea what they were looking at. They just saw a piece of paper but couldn't make anything of the images. We recognize photos because we have been taught the distinction with a label called photograph. Bob. There's another story about the scientists taking natives outside of their forest. They had never been outside the forest, and when they were brought to the edge of the forest, they couldn't fathom distance. They had never seen any long distance before and didn't know what to make of it. Dell, if I have a desire and it gets fulfilled effortlessly, is life fulfilling itself or is it my desire? Bob. There's actually no entity to have a desire. Emmett, so we're just playing out this movie and thinking we're creating everything. Martin, the desire is an illusion. Bob, there is no entity there with any independent nature. You couldn't have that I thought without pure awareness or if consciousness weren't there. And that's all the seeming entity is. It's an I thought which we've added. With concepts, ideas, and images, we've built a concrete image of who and what we are. Of course, desires will happen, choices will be made, and preferences will arise. But, 
there's no entity there to take delivery of them. Problem is that the thought comes up and says I choose. If we could choose our thoughts, why would anyone choose unhappiness or depression? Sometimes a thought comes up and we don't act on it. Then another thought comes up and we do act on it. And then we say I chose. You never picked the thoughts in the first place. So we're being lived. Del, so the script for my desire is already there. Bob, the whole lot is already there. Del, so there's no predetermined life that is happening. Bob, when you say a life that is happening, what is happening? Patterns of energy are appearing. Patterns of energy are playing around and disappearing. But, has the pattern got any independent nature? Even though it appears to be, is the pattern of energy really substantial? It's like the reflection in the mirror. Is that reflection know it's in the mirror? Do any of the reflections in the mirror have a predetermined script? You can't say the reflection isn't there. But, if you go to try and grab the reflection, there's nothing there. You can't say it is and you can't say it isn't. It only appears to be. Del, here's a question that will make everyone here laugh. Can you tell who's enlightened in this room? Bob, everyone. And there's no one here. Martin, can you say there's just one here? Bob, it's one essence. But, even to say one implies that something other than one could exist. That's why they say one without a second. Or not two. Del, if it's habit of the mind that causes our problems, then do we just need to realize that? Then it's just a recognition, not an understanding. Bob, recognize that the mind has no independent nature. Can't stand on its own. Del, so the habits of the mind are based on our conditioning. Habits are patterns and patterns are energy. So how does the pattern stop? We have to disrupt that old pattern so we can see the new pattern of seeing everything as appearance. Bob, in this seeing that the thoughts have no power, no independent nature, you can't believe in it anymore, can you? Del, we can believe it because it's the energy that's been flowing since we were two years old. Bob, Yes, but you just questioned it and have seen that the thought cannot stand on its own. Del, so that's disrupting it. Bob, in seeing that it has no real substance you can't believe in it. You might get caught in the old habits for a while, but the intelligence will come up and say wait a minute. I saw the falseness of this the other day. There's nothing there. When the energy or belief doesn't go into it it can't live. Nothing can live without energy. That's all that's happened, we've never questioned these beliefs. That's all this is about, investigation. The false can't stand up to investigation. Dale, so that's how we disrupt the pattern. Bob, yes. Dale, joking, there's your method, guys. Group laughter. Bob, it's just like the metaphor of blue water in the sea. You know the water isn't blue. It's just like how centuries ago people thought you couldn't sail into the horizon or you'd fall off. At one time everyone believed that. Now you can't tell that to anyone. It still appears that way, but everyone has seen the false as false and they aren't taken in by it. You've seen there's no self-center in you. And if there's none in you, then, there's no center in anyone else. So who can ever be superior to you? Who can ever be inferior? What could I ever want of yours if we are the one essence? It doesn't mean to say if someone hits you, you'll necessarily turn the other cheek. No way to know how you'll respond. There's no set pattern. That intelligence energy that's functioning has brought you this far. You don't think it's going to let you down now, do you? Emmett. The process of questioning reality and our self-center is a function of our mind, isn't it? Bob, yes. Emmett, that implies that the mind causes the unraveling of our false conditioning. But, 
The mind doesn't touch reality. The mind is encompassed by reality or the no thing or oneness. Though we're using the mind to question reality. Bob, the only instrument you have is the mind. It has no independent power. It's an instrument. Thought is subtle word. Word is a vibration or pattern of energy. The mind vibrates in the pairs of opposite, good, bad, pleasure, pain, and so on. The mind is creative, of course. But it's also the limiting factor. I'm not good enough. I'm fearful. I can't do this. I have low self-confidence, and so on. And these become a reference point. Everything becomes relative to this image of oneself. When you see through this and see there's no entity within you, you've taken away the suffering or limiting aspect. Then the mind is left to utilize itself in a creative way. Dell, when we do this investigation you're talking about, and we come to realize that everything in creation is just an appearance, is it an understanding or a surrendering? Bob. In the investigation, you find out that there's no one to understand and no one to surrender. And we're talking about the timeless. Though when you say when, what's wrong with right now? Don't you see this right now? In the moment, you realize you're there. You can't get away from it. Where else could you be but in the omnipresent? It's immediate. You're knowing that you are. Full stop. The rest takes care of itself. Looking for the answer in the mind will take you down all kinds of different directions. The mind keeps dividing. The only way to the truth is full stop. Without a thought, there's not a damn thing wrong. Dell, so Barbara never decided to become a Bowen therapist. It just happened. It's life fulfilling itself. Bob, yes. Kerry, why differentiate between free will and destiny anyway? They're both just concepts. They're just labels. Bob, you can call it life fulfilling itself if you like, but it's really already fulfilled. Nothing ever happened. It's all only appearance. Kerry, when Dell asked about free will or life fulfilling itself, I could just hear Nisargadida saying, "Who wants to know?" Martin, Bob, you've used the terms audible emptiness and visual emptiness to describe the appearance. It seems inherently paradoxical because when you say emptiness, that is something. How can you know it exists if it's not something? There must be something that exists in order for it to have attributes. Bob, those attributes are appearance only. They're just intelligence energy appearing as patterns. Appearing as seeing, hearing, cognizing. Martin, I know that your life is different since you had your conversations with Nisargadatta. But now that you know, for example, that the table is only an appearance, does it change your experience of the table? Does it change your perception? Bob, no. I still see everything as it is, still seeing everything the same. But knowing full well that it's only appearing to be so, Martin. So your perceptions aren't transformed by that awareness. The world isn't transformed by that understanding, Bob. Well, there's no longer any belief in an entity that can do anything. There's no longer any belief in these things being separate entities. Their appearance only. There's just that one knowingness, Martin. Is the quality of your experience different? Is it more vivid? When you see objects, do you see them as, say, their utility, or do you actually see them as patterns? Bob, see what you're really asking is how do I relate to things? But there has to be an entity to relate everything to. In fact, there's just seeing, hearing, and actual functioning. So it's just a matter of seeing everything as it is, a change in understanding, not perception. Martin, so is your experience of perception before and after seeing the Sargadaita quite different, or is it the same? Bob, 
It's all the same. For enlightenment chop wood carry water. After enlightenment chop wood carry water. On the other hand, before getting the understanding there were chores that I had to do. I would think it's Joe's turn to chop the wood, not mine, and all sorts of commotion would go on. There was plenty of psychological suffering that went on because everything was being applied to me. Afterwards, everything simply became what is. There is no entity here to take delivery of anything. Of course there were habit patterns that came up for a while, and the seeming entity came up again. But, once it had been seen through it could never get the same intensity again. Now, there is a certainty and confidence that there is no entity here that has any substance or independent nature. The functioning goes on just the same. The feelings and emotions are there. But, the fixation on them doesn't hang around. There's no big bang or flash of light, though I've had plenty of experiences during the so-called search. The experience is never it. It's just a knowingness that is there. James, this reminds me of when I stub my toe. My first thought is always, who put that damn chair there? I want to blame someone for making this thing happen to me. It's indicative of the reference point, that there's a me this happened to. As opposed to seeing just what happened and realizing it's just what is. There's no difference in perception, but there's a big difference in the reaction. The chair and the toe haven't changed. The reaction to the event has changed. Martin, the reason I ask about your perception is because I've had my own experience, with meditation and all, of seeing the unity and manifestation and then the individuality of each object is lessened. It's just appearance. Appearance equals being and it's okay. In normal everyday reality, the separateness of objects is essential. We don't see them as different shapes and forms of one energy. We don't see the commonality. Bob, no, you don't go around saying everything is energy, everything is energy. You're seeing life as it is, and there is an acting accordingly. The functioning goes on quite effortlessly. I call this effortless living. You may see this body-mind taking a very active part at times, but there's no doer there. James, Martin, it sounds to me like you're looking for a change of perception, when all that really happens is a new understanding, which then affects how your life is lived or how your life is experienced. Harry, it's like seeing the magician's trick of making the tiger disappear. You see it over and over again, and the tiger disappears every time. But suddenly the magician tells you how the trick is done. You're still seeing the tiger, you're still seeing the trick, but you no longer see the tiger disappear because you know where it really is. So, is that a perceptual change? No. But because of the understanding you now have those words, perception and understanding, could blur together. But, in reality, it's understanding. It's not a change of perception. Martin, I think this may be a difference in our semantics. It's hard for me to see how, if I'm no longer caught up in the illusion of the tiger disappearing, there wouldn't be a change of perception. Bob. Martin, you won't find the answer in the mind. James, for thirty years I was waiting for some damn experience. I read all these books that said if you meditate long enough and well enough, you will have this very special experience. That's not at all what's happening here. I'm getting a new understanding, and the understanding is transforming my life. In all those books I read, people said that when they found liberation or awakening or whatever you want to call it, they realized they had always been free and awake. So that couldn't be a change in experience. It's a change in understanding, which then may alter one's experience. In other words, the person was awake when his or her experience was lousy and is awake when the experience is wonderful. Understanding is the only difference. Martin, 
unless there's a personal transformation, unless a person really embodies the understanding and lives it, then it's worthless. You can have an academic understanding and repeat what Bob says and agree with it, and yet not really understand it. If it doesn't transform you when you walk out the door, in terms of your actions, then it's worthless. A lot of academia is worthless for that reason. It's just information. That's why I'm asking about perception and experience. For example, with drugs there is a sense of expansiveness, colors become more vivid, the emotions become more intense and so on. James, if you suddenly understand how the disappearing tiger trick is done, how could your experience not be different? Martin, of course. I agree. James, everything Bob is saying here is showing the illusory nature of our self-center as well as everything in creation. Martin, what I'm asking is, in what sense is it different? Bob, the difference is that psychological suffering ceases. The entity that suffers is that imagined self-center. It's not that emotions don't continue to arise. But, with that suffering with anxiety and fear and anger builds up and snowballs and becomes overwhelming, now it disappears almost immediately because you're not fixated on those emotions. There's no entity that can fixate on them. There's no entity that can be transformed. All there is is the natural functioning. As far as perceptions go, everything seems much the same as it always was. There's no personal involvement with them because there is no person as such. Martin, thank you. That's what I was asking. Labeling dissipates energy. Dell, I find that trying to understand causes tension. If I drop all the effort and just let things be, then it all falls into place. The table is just the table, the snake is just the snake, and so on. Trying to figure this out just gets in the way. Bob, you can't try or not try. All you can do is recognize your resistance. And that recognition can only arise from the point of non-resistance. If you're totally resistant, you don't know it. You can only recognize resistance from the point of non-resistance. And that comes up of its own accord. You'll notice a subtle relaxation. That'll come up more and more. Dell, and then you reach full stop. Martin. One of the things that prompts my questions is that it seems like when a person stops believing in the reference point, there might be new sources of energy, or there might be expansion. Bob, there's not a new source of energy. But, most of our energy throughout the day, is taken up with the thinking process, to the exclusion of hearing, seeing, touching, and so on. There needs to be an overall openness where you're giving as much energy to thought as you are to the senses. The energy needs to be spread evenly, instead of constant mental chatter and worries that take away from your senses. Martin, I would imagine that would be a more vivid experience than being constantly stuck in the mind where you don't notice much of what is actually happening. Bob, when people stop labeling everything, they often start seeing things very differently. Labeling is a dissipation of energy. Any fixating or attaching to something or mental chatter is a dissipation of energy. Energy is in conflict with energy when resistance is there. When a person says, I don't like this, it's resistance to what is. That stops the flow of energy. Martin. So having the understanding or realization that all creation is an appearance is sufficient. You don't concern yourself with whether the appearance is really real. You accept that it's appearance and real at the same time. Bob, it's real in essence but not in appearance. It's the one essence appearing as many. The problem is that people take the appearance as a reflection but can't see themselves as a reflection. When you see that even we are reflection, you realize it's like one reflection trying to know another reflection. 
If it weren't for the mirror that is the essential oneness, there wouldn't be any reflections. Martin, so you don't damn the appearances for being appearances? Bob, no. Martin, in the West or in Greek plays, there was a message that anything transient had no value. In order to have any value, there had to be an aspect of timelessness or unchangeable reality. In Christianity, there's a similar feature with the physical body being corrupt or fallen. Your message is different. You seem to be saying that we shouldn't confuse appearance with reality. But you don't damn appearance. Bob, no, because everything becomes all-inclusive. There's a saying, first there are mountains and rivers. Then mountains and rivers disappear. Then mountains and rivers appear again. It becomes all-inclusive again. Emmet, that's the old Donovan song. First there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. Thub chapter, Carrie James Bob Del Judy and Pat. Sunday, July 25. Meditation versus Investigation. Del, last night I was reading Suzuki's book Zen Buddhism, which I hadn't read in many years. In light of non-duality, the book makes so much more sense. Bob, yes that's very common for people who get this knowledge. All of a sudden books they've read before come alive. Judy, can a person's energy start to function on a higher level where one's experience and the things we create become more beautiful or more subtle and grand? Bob, first, it's not your energy. It's one universal energy that's expressing as the creation. And it manifests in all diversity, in all the opposites. So the energy can and will express in higher or lower ways, as you call it. But, it's all the same energy. You will be attracted to whatever you need to be attracted to. This isn't one chaotic mess. It may seem that way sometimes from our limited view. But, from 15 billion light years away it would seem quite orderly. Overall life is functioning perfectly. Del Bob, do you meditate? Bob, there's no one to meditate and nothing to meditate on. Therefore, I can't be out of meditation. It's a natural meditation that goes on effortlessly and spontaneously. There's never any distraction. Dell, when I do self-inquiry, is that meditation? Bob, it's investigation. Dell, what's the difference between meditation and investigation? Bob, meditation is trying to still the mind. In self-inquiry, you're investigating with the mind to find out that there is no mind, to find out that there is no self-center or person. Del, in your process with Nisargadatta, were you involved in self-inquiry or transmission from Nisargadatta? Bob, there was no process. Even though I didn't know it then, there was no me present. There was a revelation, through the pointing out that Nisargadatta did, that I was able to see. In the immediacy of the moment, I saw that there was no entity here. There was no body or mind here that I could refer to that had any actuality, any substance or independent nature. But, in that scene, I didn't die or fall apart. I was just as is, the isness or beingness. And that beingness is constantly with you. If I ask you about something you did as a child, you'll tell me some story. If I ask, how do you know? You'll say I know. If I say, did you have the same body then as you have now? You'll say no, that body has changed. For the body is not you. Every cell in that body has now been replaced. If I say, did you have the same image about yourself then as you do now? You'll say no, I certainly didn't. Since then your image has been constantly changing. So what was it then that was you? It was the same knowingness that's there now, which everything has appeared and disappeared on. That essence, or knowingness that you are, has never been contaminated by any of the dramas or traumas that have happened to you. It's been untouched. 
It's the immediacy of you right now. Before you try to decipher what I'm saying, that sense of presence is constantly with you. And to the mind it is no thing. It's no thing you can ever grasp with a thought or a concept. You're nothing. Laughing. Pat, are the words knowing and being the same? Bob, yes. The Hindus use the term sat shit ananda existence consciousness bliss. Those three things are not different. They are three aspects of one thing. Existence is being. Consciousness is knowing. Bliss is loving to be. So being, knowing, and loving to be are ever with you. That sat chit ananda is actually who you are. It's not something you have to attain or acquire. You've never been anything other than that. Nisargadaita put it another way. He said that awareness of being is bliss. Isn't it? Don't you love to be alive? Pat, what about the word love? Bob, it depends what love you're talking about. If you're talking about the love-hate relationship, that's always in the pairs of opposites. That's a mind thing. If you're talking about the uncaused love, that's the light of being. Love is another word for light. Whenever anybody dies, a person or an animal, the first thing that happens is the light leaves their eyes. That light is love. Tell, that reminds me of a half his poem, even after all this time, the sun does not say to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. Bob, he understood. Pat, there's another one by half is, God only speaks four words, come dance with me. The effect of non-duality on the world. Dell, as more and more people get this non-dual understanding, will it affect the world? Bob, the world's problems are based on the belief that we are separate entities. The term Nisarga means natural or natural state. Dattatreya was the legendary primal guru. He wrote the Avidhat Gita. That's how Nisargadatta made up his name, combining those two terms. Natural means nature. Nature functions perfectly. If it's winter, nature isn't wishing it were summer. Tides come in and out at the proper time. Day follows night and so on. There's no conflict. But, our sense of separateness, that we gained at the age of one or two, brings along vulnerability and insecurity. And all the world's problems are caused by that. One nation conquers another nation in order to feel more secure and abundant. And all our psychological suffering arises because of that sense of separation. It's only a me that can be anxious, fearful, depressed, unhappy or whatever. The me doesn't feel complete. It feels separate. In our whole life, we've never looked inside to see the obvious, that we're not separate from nature. We are nature. We're not separate from air. Our bodies are made up of air. We're not separate from earth or water. Our bodies are made up of earth and water. Our problems all stem from feeling separate. James, so a person who is free of the reference point essentially doesn't suffer from worldly problems because he or she doesn't feel separate. But, if a person like that is right in the midst of war, in the midst of the killing, and watching it happen, Bob, there would still be no sense of separation. But they might be moved to respond in some way. James, so there would be no sense of separation and therefore no suffering. Bob, that's right. Harry, but Dell's original question is whether there are more people coming to this knowledge now. Barb, are you hoping that the world is getting better? Laughing. It doesn't need to. It's just as it is. Lots of people say the world's getting more spiritual. But that's only their own assessment that it needs to be better. There is no such thing as more spiritual. Dell, 
I'm just wondering whether the world is being affected by more and more people waking up. Bob, our essence is never affected. Since you were a little child, your body's changed and your self-image has changed. But, has the base that everything has appeared on changed? Not at all. The thing people never look at is the wakefulness that is who we are. Has that wakefulness ever changed? That's the base that everything appears on. It never changes. Not one iota. All the events of the day happen on that wakefulness. It's your basic experience of life and it never changes. You know that you're awake. Prior to that you're asleep. Dell, if there were 10 million people who were awake, would the war in Iraq still be happening? Bob, it may or it may not. We don't have to conceptualize it because it's not now. Carrie, once you've become absorbed in this, you go on the internet and find other Advaitins and see all the other non-duality books and you think it's everywhere. But, Bob's book, which is probably the best book on the subject, has only sold one, zero, zero, zero copies. That's not a big number. James joking, but just wait until Bob's United States tour. Harry, well we're going to promote that with circus animals. James laughing. Let's get him on the Jerry Springer show. There'll be fights. Advaita is the best way. Advaita is not the best way. Carrie, they'll have a surprise guest. Bob slept with my daughter. Group laughter. Del, last night I asked you if you could tell who in the room is enlightened, and you said, we all are. Well, there's a section in Nisargadatta's book where a person asks, if Ramana entered the room, would you recognize him as a liberated man? And he answers, of course. As a man recognizes a man, so a nanny self-realized soul recognizes a nanny. You cannot appreciate what you have not experienced. You are what you think yourself to be, but you cannot think yourself to be what you have not experienced. Bob, well, you might not know you're unbounded and free, but I know that you are. You couldn't be anything else. If you've got that ignorant belief that you're not, then energy goes into that belief and makes it so. You can't be anything other than that whether you know it or not. As it says in the Vedas, from Brahma down to a clump of grass. Even the clump of grass is that. And if I keep telling you this maybe you'll hear it. James, the terms enlightenment or awakening have no meaning if everyone is in the same state. Some are suffering horribly and some are living in freedom, but in essence we're all the same. Though the term enlightenment is a joke. Of course it's not too funny if you think it's real and you're chasing it. Bob, it's how we think about it. Shakespeare said, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Christ spoke of the reality when he said, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? You can think all you like, but it has no real effect. Dell, one problem is that I am so analytical. My left brain gets so immersed in this knowledge and I find that I can't comprehend it. And then I say, stop. Enough. Bob, listen to what you're saying. I am so analytical. You're putting that label on yourself, and energy goes into that. Then it's my damned left brain. Has your left brain got any power without the life essence in it? And who is analytical? Has that thought I am analytical got any power or independent nature? Dell, it's all based on my upbringing and my conditioning. Bob, what conditioning is there right now if you're not thinking about it? Dell, none. Bob, that gets rid of all your conditioning in one instant. Why take it up again? As Banke says, everything is perfectly resolved in the unborn mind. Why exchange the unborn for thought? On that unborn seemingly come thoughts, which are believed to be real. Thoughts come and go, but the unborn or pure essence on which everything appears never changes. 
is constantly with you. You haven't exchanged it for the transient thoughts. You stay in the unborn in the reality. Reality is that which never changes. The whole manifestation around you is constantly changing. Who you are is the no thing. And nothing can be added to that or taken away from it. That no thing contains everything. Something can't come from nothing. So you don't need to take notice of the manifestation. Pat, do Advaitans use the term God? Bob, the problem with the word God is that everyone has a different meaning for it. And whatever concept you have about God can get you lost in that concept. I prefer to say intelligence energy. Must desires be given up? Del, Nisargadatta says, all desires must be given up. Because by desiring, you take the shape of your desires. When no desires remain, you revert back to your natural state. Now those desires all come from the mind. And the mind gets us into trouble. Well, what about biological desires? Food, sex and all that. These aren't mind-based, they're biological. Bob, you have to eat to live. The next urge is to reproduce. These are natural urges. But, when they dominate the mind, they become a problem. Nisargadatta says desire is the fixation of the mind on an idea. Look at dogs. Sex isn't a big deal for the dog. It's not even interested until the female goes into heat and sends out the scent. Then it becomes an urge. But once the female is out of heat, the dog goes back to hunting or whatever. With humans, we get into sex and become compulsive about it. Then it becomes dominant because the mind fixates on it. James, I'm not sure I understand this. What's wrong with fixating on something as long as we stay out of the reference point? Bob, who's fixating on it? Me, me, me. James, let's say there are two people having sex three times a day. One of them is fixating on it and the other isn't. The one who's fixating on it shouldn't be doing that. And the other person is fine. Where's the problem? Bob, there's no value in shoulds or shouldn'ts. But, if the person is fixating on it, then it's becoming a problem and getting in the way of other aspects of life. James, as long as it's not a problem, the frequency is irrelevant. Bob, that's right. James, this is interesting because there are natural urges and desires and there's no problem with those. But, a few months ago when I said I was suffering due to desire you said, desire is a fixation in the mind. Just drop the fixation. So, there's a natural desire which is no problem. But, then that desire can become a fixation which is a problem. This is an important issue for me because when I want something very badly, non-duality suddenly goes out the window. I don't care that the world is an illusion, I want what I want. Gary, why are we getting into the concept that there's a me that could be fixated on something? Fixating is happening. The dropping of the fixating eventually happens. What's the problem? James, you're absolutely right. There's only an appearance of a fixation. Once the realization comes that it's an appearance, and that there's no me to be fixated on something, the problem starts decreasing. Carrie, Bob, a nanny could have desired just like anybody else. But, if it doesn't get fulfilled, he or she drops it before it affects the emotions in any serious way. But, that seems to imply that if you find yourself with strong desires, then you don't have non-dual understanding. Though some desires could be there, some desires could be stronger than others, but the transparency is there, even though the desire may be strong enough to keep you working on its fulfillment. What am I missing? Bob, who's calling it a desire? Is it a desire or is it just an urge to do something? You'll either fulfill the urge or you won't, but either way you can abide with it. 
When there's a me that's desiring then it becomes overwhelming. And as soon as you label it a desire, you're loading it down with every other desire you've ever had. Just like anger or fear or whatever. If it's just what is in the moment, you'll act on it or you won't. It's only a me that can have fear and anger and all. Those are the labels we put on these things, and that's what causes the suffering. Emotions are just what is. When we label them and dwell on them, we start suffering. As soon as something comes up, you might say, this is fear. How do you know it's fear? Because we've had this feeling before, and we labeled it fear. Well, as soon as you call it fear, you're not seeing it fresh and new. You're seeing it with the past label, and all those other fears you've had come into that moment. You're remembering all those past fears, and then it becomes worse than ever. And then you resist it, and it grows and grows. We move away from it, we don't want to be with it. In the labeling, we move away from it, and we're not with it as it is. If we're just being with it, we experience it fresh and new, and it's either acted on or it's not. The label becomes a reference point. Then you're relating to a name. Carrie, without the labeling, you can't say a desire is one thing or the other. It becomes a problem when you say, I shouldn't have this desire, or this desire is too strong, or I'm going to memorize this concept from Nisargadatta, and drop this desire. As long as it's spontaneous and no involvement with it, there's nothing to be said about it. Bob, right. You just fulfill the desire or you don't. Carry, and each desire is a separate arising of an individual thought. Maybe there's one and the next thought is, well, that's not practical. And you drop it. Or maybe it's I want this. I want this. I want this. But they can be all new individual arisings without involvement. Bob, yes they all are. But when you relate them to a reference point, I mean you're judging them from past events and experiences. That's what the me is made up of, past events and experiences and conditioning. And everything is judged from there is good, bad, pleasant, painful, I want it or I don't want it. I've had this before, I want more of it, and so on. Gary, what complicates this for the spiritual seeker is that now, not only is there a desire, but there's this overlay to the desire saying I shouldn't be having the desire. Because I have the desire, I'm not enlightened. Though the person has taken what was some involvement and referenced it back to the me, and now you have a double whammy. Dell, the guilt comes in. Bob, most spiritual teachings say we must get rid of desire and fear. Though as soon as we label these feelings, we think we shouldn't be having them. Then the guilt comes in. Problem is in the labeling or the fixating. James, so that's why so many so-called enlightened sages say that life doesn't change after awakening. They still have good and bad feelings. I never understood that. On one hand they write about their non-stop bliss and peace, and then in the same breath, they say they have good and bad feelings and emotions like anyone else. This means they are no different from anyone, but they don't go crazy labeling and fixating on everything. They simply accept whatever comes along. I think I used to believe what they said about bliss and miracles, and effortless living, but never took them seriously when they said they still have ups and downs and bad feelings just like any ordinary person. Dell, there's no difference between a Buddha and anyone else. Harry, every time we open our mouth we're talking concepts. But, certain things you Bob or other sages say are spoken from experience, like there's no self-center here, the me is just a mental creation and so on. But, when sages talk about things in the appearance, they're not speaking from any cognizing or experience. They're speaking from their own concepts. Bob, as soon as you open your mouth, you're conceptualizing. Carrie, there's a tendency for seekers to think that when gurus speak, everything they say is truth. But, this can't be true. 
James, that used to drive me crazy when I was in spiritual movements. You have six different gurus all saying their method is the best and fastest technique to liberation. Each one is just promoting ideas and the traditions he or she has accepted. But, the disciples are sure that anything that leaves their guru's lips is the word of God. Like everything they speak is truth. How ridiculous. Bob, that's right. Tub chapter, Bob Carey, James Dell and Emmett. Monday, July 26. Why gurus give techniques. Carrie, looking back did you feel a sense of growth when you were with Moktananda? Bob, there was always that idea that I was going somewhere and was going to get something. Hear it in front of the horse's nose. Carrie, the sense of a path. One thing that's a mystery to me is what these spiritual teachers do. I assume that someone like Moktananda had the understanding. Why do teachers let disciples have these illusions about techniques and a path, and if I do this, this, and this, I'll reach the ultimate goal? Bob, I'll tell you why. You know about Kundalini? The energy that rises up the spine? Carrie, yes. Bob, well Muktananda was able to give that experience to people by touching them and then he would give people mantras and techniques to cause the kundalini. But his basic message was kneel to yourself. Bow to yourself. Honor and worship your own being. God dwells within you as you. Full stop. Harry, aha! Bob, and he would often get up and tell the parable about the man who went to India searching for enlightenment. Seeker goes to one ashram and the guru tells him thou art that. So the seeker says, yes, I've heard that before. But it doesn't mean anything to him. It's not satisfying. So he goes to the next ashram and the guru says, I can give you the truth, but you'll have to serve me for twelve years. So the seeker agrees, and he spends the next twelve years cleaning up cow dung on the farm. After the time is up, the guru gives him the truth. He says to the seeker, Thou art that. All of Muktananda's disciples laughed at the story, not realizing that that was exactly what they were doing. He told them, God dwells within you as you. You don't see that? Okay, come and chant the mantra, enjoy the Kundalini, meditate, eat this way, do this and that. And they do that. Some do more than twelve years. They go on for thirty or forty years or more. After seeing this Sargadaita, I was fortunate enough to see that. Carrie, so many people who come to you have been on spiritual paths and are now ready to hear what you're saying. But, they still have vestiges of the concepts of old paths. And they wonder, wait a minute. I don't have to do anything to get this. Where's the technique? Where's the effort? How can this be truth? I think parables like the one you just gave are powerful for long-time seekers. It reminds me of the story of Buddha. Buddha struggled for years to get awakening and finally gave up. And when he gave up, that's when he got it. One issue I think is important is this idea of awakening and deliverance. People have experienced a sense of getting the understanding but then they suddenly get caught in the mind again, and they get confused. They think they've lost it. Doubts come up. Bob, clouds will always arise in the sky. But, the sun is continually there. It never changes. The sun weren't there, the clouds couldn't come up. Carrie, I love that metaphor. Without that sun, we couldn't enjoy the thunder clouds. And I enjoy those thunderclouds. Joking, I really enjoy it when I'm miserable. They're some of my best times. Group laughter. Subchapter. Emmett grapples with the mind. Emmett, since the creation doesn't exist, how do we talk about anything? Bob, talking is happening. Emmett, but as you say it isn't really. Bob, that's right. It's just an appearance. It's essence, 
is intelligence energy. Emmet, and the nature of this intelligence is to manifest this illusory existence. Bob Wright The manifestation has no substance or independent nature. It vibrates into different patterns. Just like the ripples and waves appear on the ocean, but there's still only water. Emmet, I'm trying to understand all this with the mind, and the mind doesn't even exist. Bob, the mind is just an appearance, and it's trying to find the answer to the appearance. Harry, joking, you're just a toaster trying to understand electricity. Bob laughing. Good one, Carrie. I may borrow that sometime. It's sometimes hard to see the illusory nature of creation, and then let go of it. But when you do let go, you find that you don't fall apart or disappear. Emmet. You and Nisargadatta speak about this experience of reality as if we could let everything go right now and just get it. You speak as if it's so easy, like this could happen right now. Just let go. It's so easy and natural. But you can remember a time when you were like us, when you didn't get it. One thing that seems to be consistently written about in scriptures is the idea of blissful experience and waves of ecstasy. It's repeated so consistently in so much spiritual literature. But you talk about those experiences like they're not worth much, they're just experiences like any other. My feeling is that if you could have non-dual understanding and have bliss all the time, it would be much preferred. Bob, any ecstatic state is an experience. Any experience will come and go. Nobody can be in that state all the time. It would burn them out in no time. You can have glimpses of it. But, that's not what you're looking for. Hindus use the term Sat Chit Ananda, existence consciousness bliss. The bliss feature is loving to be. Emmet, you definitely appear to be very joyful. But, you're also very casual about everything. Nisargadaita also seems casual, even dry. There's no appearance of joy in his writings. Carrie, what I heard is that bliss is the absence of desiring or expecting anything. Bob, that's right. With Nisargadatta, there's a lack of concern. That's the casualness. But, there's a natural compassion that arises also. You don't become bland and ignore everything. Nisargadatta used to say, there's nothing wrong anymore. Also he used to say, my emptiness is full. There are many statements he makes that can be interpreted as blissful. It may seem dry and casual, but the essence is vitality and the love of being. Emmet, that's evident in you as well as in Nisargadatta's talks, especially your compassion. You keep getting the same questions from people over and over and you have infinite patience and never seem to judge anyone. When I read, I am that, I kept wondering how Nisargadaita could bear listening to so many people challenging him all the time. Kerry, actually Nisargadaita had somewhat of an intense or angry nature. Compassion was there but impatience was too. He used to ask people, how can you ask the same question again? You've been here for six days. James, on the Nisargadatta video, Awaken to the Eternal, Stephen Walensky tells the story of how Nisargadatta told him at the start, you should be able to get this in seven days. Can you stay here that long? Well on the seventh day Walensky asked some question, and Nisargadatta got intense and shot back, you've been here long enough. You should know that by now. And he told him to leave. On the train home, Walensky realized that was his seventh day there. I guess he understood pretty well. He wrote a nice book, I Am That I Am. Bob, I can assure you that before this understanding there was no compassion here. I was very agitated. Emmet, you were talking about the idea of letting go, about how we could get the understanding right here, right now. Bob, here's a joke about letting go. 
There was once a man who fell off a cliff and grabbed onto a branch or rock as he was falling. He was hanging on for dear life, and he starts yelling, Help, help. Is there anybody up there? Suddenly he hears the booming voice of God answer, Yes. I'm here. So the man says, What do I do? And God says slowly, Let go. The man thinks for a minute and says, Is there anybody else up there? Group laughter. James, my favorite joke is the one that Wayne Lickerman tells in his book Acceptance of What Is. It takes place in a Jewish temple. In temples, they always have a janitor who's not Jewish to do chores that we Jews can't do on Saturday. Well, one day the janitor walks into the temple and he sees one of the rabbis prostrating on the floor in front of the Torah, the Holy Scripture. And the rabbi is repeating over and over, Oh God, I am nothing. I am nothing. The janitor becomes intrigued with this. Then as he's watching, another rabbi comes in and falls to his knees and says the same thing, Oh God, I am nothing. I am nothing. So now the janitor is very moved and decides to try it too. Though he prostrates himself and starts repeating, Oh God, I am nothing. I am nothing. All of a sudden, one of the rabbis says to the other, Look who thinks he's nothing. Laughter. Need to search for years? Emmett, Bob, you talk about this knowledge like anyone can get it. But, the people who get it have generally been seeking for years and years and years. Bob, that's right. I spent 16 years searching for it. And I can tell you with certainty that what you're seeking, you already are. And you can full stop right now and see it. Emmett, you say that, but how do you know a person can do that without first traveling on the path? Without all the experience leading up to it? Bob, drop all that rubbish and you'll see it's obvious and evident that you are that. When you go along with that story about the path and the techniques and all, you simply haven't paused long enough to see that it's evident. Emmett, so we haven't paused or experienced long enough. We have to dwell on that reality if we are to go by the evidence of people's experiences. Bob, now you're back into time again. You're not pausing. You're not full stopping. Knowing is immediate. You know that you are. You cannot negate that under any circumstances. Full stop. But, that's too subtle for the mind. Immediately people will say but or why or how. But you cannot negate the beingness that is here right now. Just let that sink in. Emmett, there appears to be a barrier to that understanding happening until the mind has been made soft enough to allow that in. That process seems to be necessary. Bob, who or what is going to do that? If what you're seeking you already are, who or what is going to remove that obstacle? Emmett, joking, the illusory mind is going to do it. Harry, there are people who get the understanding quite suddenly without having spent years seeking it. What's interesting is that whether the person strived for it or just stumbled into it, the conclusion is the same. They all say I had nothing to do with it. The path was apparent, but there was no one on that path. The thought you can recognize the understanding immediately fits the awakened person's understanding after the fact. There was no seeker and no path. There was only an apparent seeker and an apparent path. That's why so many of these people laugh so hard when they see it. The joke is that they should have gotten it immediately. What was all the seeking and drama about? It's pretty sad news, actually. It's like you're sitting with the Encyclopedia Britannica and the reality is you're the binding. Though of course there's confusion. You think you have to read the whole book and the answer is not there because you're the binding, not the book. Bob, how many people went to see Nisargadatta every day? Five or ten. Bob, when I was there, it was about that many. Later on after lots of Westerners heard about him, 
he started to have more visitors. But, not too many. The room wouldn't hold more than 20 or 25 people, completely packed. Carrie, it must have been hot as hell. Bob, it was. He had one fan going, and it was blowing all the incense and the cigarette smoke around. He usually had eight or ten sticks of incense going all the time. And there were bugs crawling out of the wall. Carrie, there's a charming story that Ramesh loves to tell about a sadhu who had no money and came to see Nisargadatta. The sadhu was so poor that when he traveled by train to Bombay, he would get on with no ticket and then get thrown off at the next station. Then he would get on and get thrown off again, and would do this over and over until he reached Bombay. Well, he happened to be a pundit of some kind, and when he was at Nisargadatta's, he occasionally did prayers or chanting for people who paid him a few rupees each time. When he was ready to leave, he had saved about twenty rupees and wanted to give it to Nisargadatta. Though Nisargadatta accepted it with great gratitude. The next day, the day the sadhu was going to leave, Nisargadatta gave him brand new clothes and two hundred rupees. Nisargadatta completely accepted the gift and then gave back more. It's an interesting story. Subchapter Bob James Carey Emmett and Dell July 27 The Matty comes and goes. Emmett, Bob, there are mystics and saints in the past who said they experienced Samadhi and claim that the experience is significant. What would you say to them? Bob, I would say good luck to them. That's their experience. But, none of them has ever gone beyond no thing. They could have a million experiences of all kinds. But, ultimately where do they finish up? No thing. Carrie, the Samadhi issue is an interesting hang-up. It's so prevalent. For so many, it becomes an objective criteria for whether a person's enlightened or not. You know, can you go into Samadhi? Can you close your eyes and go into this swoon that's like suspended animation, where you can meditate without food or water for days? To me, that thought has been an obstacle. I can't do that. So how do I integrate that into the great enlightenment? I like hearing Bob's answer, because it's one of those things on that list we've all developed of what great saints have been capable of doing. Emmett, well, it also distinguishes a different reality. A reality for those in that natural state. Bob, investigate the definition of reality. It's that which never changes. Samadhi comes and goes. Therefore it can't be real. It's an appearance on reality. In essence it is reality, because it's made of the same underlying consciousness that is the basis of everything. But, as appearance, it's not reality. It comes and goes. Carrie, you don't have to be self-realized to achieve Samadhi. Also, you could go into Samadhi for a month and you still come out exactly where you went in. Because it is a suspended state. So, if you're in a certain place in your understanding when you go in, you come out in the same place. One way, I heard it described is that if you haven't had lunch, and you go into Samadhi for a month, then when you come out, you'll be asking where's lunch. It's basically useless. And there are warnings in some writings saying not to get involved in it because it's very charming, but it doesn't really help your evolution. Emmet, in the Yoga Vasish, to an ancient Hindu scripture, there are repeated stories about sages who go into Samadhi for thousands of years and come out, Hello, how's everybody? Laughing. Bob, that's the beauty of that scripture. There are all kinds of experiences described but it's always coming back to non-duality. In spite of these wonderful stories, people living for thousands of years and going to the end of the world, the message of the book is clear. Creation is an illusion, and oneness is all there is. Emmet, that's true. Bob, it's a beautiful book. 
games. In the Papaji book nothing ever happened, Papaji talks about his past lives. I know a lot of Advaitins don't believe in past lives but he does. He said he had a vision of all his past lives and that he died in Samadhi in his last life. What happened was that he went into that state and was motionless for many days. Though his disciples thought he was dead. According to his vision, there was one disciple who said they should cut open his skull to see if he was dead. Though they did that and killed him. Though people can go into Samadhi and still not be enlightened. Because if he had been enlightened, he wouldn't have reincarnated again. At least that's what the Hindus teach. You keep reincarnating until you attain final liberation. Are there past lives? Del, why did Papaji believe in past lives? Bob, that's his tradition. Like if a Christian has a vision, it'll be of Christ. A Hindu will see Krishna or Shiva. A Muslim will see Mohammed. A Buddhist will see Buddha. James, many sages say that when you die, you see whatever you believe. If you believe in heaven and hell, you go to wherever you believe you should. There's a fascinating teaching in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the scripture that contains the Bhagavad Gita. There are two families at war. One of the families clearly represents the good guys and the other family are the bad guys. Well, at the end of the story the good guys go to hell and the bad guys go to heaven. The implication is that when the good guys, who were always struggling to be good, died, they felt guilty about whatever bad things they had done. So they believed they deserved to suffer, and they went to hell. And the bad guys never gave their bad actions a second thought. They felt they deserved to go to heaven. That blew my mind when I heard it. I was sure I'd be going to hell because I've always felt so much guilt about things I've done. Bob, in the Dezogshan scriptures, they tell you there's no reincarnation. But, then they go out looking for some child who is supposed to be the reincarnation of some famous Lama who just died. Gary, didn't Buddha say there are no souls and therefore there is no transmigration of souls? Bob, yes. Gary, I used to be a devout believer in reincarnation. And I got disabused of that belief when I realized it's difficult to integrate the understanding of having never been born with the concept of reincarnation. Once it's understood that the personality is merely a string of thoughts, images and impressions with no independent nature, what is there to reincarnate? Bob, exactly. And reincarnation implies time something that happens in the future. Time is only a mental concept. The reincarnation is also a mental concept. There's no past unless you think about it. There's no future unless you think about it. Carrie, so what we're saying is that yesterday when we all sat here talking, and which I have on tape, didn't happen. Bob, it happened. But, it was now when it happened. And it's now when you're recalling it. And it'll be now when you're imagining anything in the future. James makes the case for reincarnation. James, Bob, whatever happens occurs only in the world of appearance. It seems to me that reincarnation may indeed occur, but only in the world of appearance. So, when you say there's no reincarnation, that's only from a particular point of view happens to be the ultimate point of view, but so what? From the ultimate viewpoint, not a damn thing has ever happened. From the world of appearance, where we live, I think reincarnation does exist. Bob, well from the viewpoint of appearance, everything is reincarnation. The whole manifestation is appearing and disappearing and reappearing. It's all transient. James, Yes, but in the world of appearance, reincarnation is significant. It's significant because people are born with certain talents, abilities, and problems that must come from somewhere. Otherwise, life is a crap shoot. Why is one person born with some natural aptitude and another person not? It shows up at birth, a talent that can be developed shows up in the horoscope. 
Note, I am not referring here to the horoscope as seen in newspapers and magazines. I am referring to astrology as it has been practiced professionally for thousands of years and is based on the exact time, place, and date of birth. Bob, it's the way the energy gets patterned. Energy can pattern in any shape or form. Carrie, some Advaitins believe that all memories and impressions go into a pool where energies or patterns are taken from. This explains how someone could be born with a certain talent but not be a reincarnation of a whole person. Something is simply grabbed out of a pool of consciousness or a pool of memory. This also explains why sometimes little children can know things about a village or a house they've never seen before. Bob, child prodigies may be tapping into energies that already exist in consciousness. Dell, tapping into a pattern of energy. Bob, there's no actual one doing the tapping in. Just a particular pattern expressing through a mind-body. James, so, you're saying that when a person experiences past life regression, he or she's basically deluded? They're just tapping into some experience someone else had? Consider this, some people ask Nisargadaita why certain seekers could work toward enlightenment their whole lives, for 40 or 50 years or more, and never get it. And he answered that they may have latent desires. Latent desires, it's an interesting statement. He doesn't say they have desires that are unfulfilled or repressed. He says they have latent desires. These are desires that are yet to be born, and seekers who are already in old age. Bob, yes, but who has the desires? It comes back to that. There's a belief in an entity that never ever existed. James, I understand what you're saying. Let me put it this way. From the point of view you're taking, I agree with you. From the ultimate viewpoint, there's no reincarnation. But from that viewpoint, there's no manifestation either. Will you agree with me that within the world of appearance, reincarnation is certainly possible? And by reincarnation I mean, for example, some apparent human being in one life treats his son badly, so in his next life he is treated badly by his father. In the world of appearance, can you see that possibility? Bob, that's what appearance is, it's all appearance and possibility. In essence, everything is the same thing. James, in essence we're not here is what you're saying. Bob, that's what is here, the essence itself. Without that essence the appearance couldn't be. Emmett, the essence is here. None of the appearance is here. And within that world of appearance, reincarnation is just another possibility. It could exist in the world of appearance. It's just another drama, another plot line. Bob, how does that sound to you? James, it sounds like in the appearance there can be reincarnation. Emmett, yes, but in the end, if I can't participate in my former lives, it doesn't matter one way or another. James, some people are participating in a way, through past life regression. Some people say they gain some apparent relief or growth through that process. And I've seen people have that experience in my astrology readings. Carrie, yes but reality is in the now and everything you're talking about is in the past or future. It's imagination. It's in the mind which is the only place time can exist. So, is karma real? As long as you believe it is. Is reincarnation real? Yes, as real as heaven and hell. As long as you believe in it, it is seeming reality to that apparent person. But, it's no more real than the appearance itself. This is why it says in scriptures that when you enter the final door, that is, liberation, throw out even the scriptures. Don't take any concepts with you. You can't carry them through the door. They're all appearance. And the appearance is not the thing. The essence has none of that stuff stuck on it. Though it doesn't matter what you believe in, including reincarnation. 
Bob, exactly. That's good what you just said. And it's good what James said. Get into it yourselves. It's not me alone who knows this. You all ultimately know it, even if it comes out in little bits at a time. Different knowledge is coming out. Get into it. James, joking, Dell's holding back. He hasn't said anything. Dell, what I'm getting is that we have all the past lives within us. We are part of the whole, and each wave that comes from each individual encompasses every past life that has ever appeared. In essence we're every past life. I have every past life within me, but I'm only picking up or expressing whatever frequency this Dell appearance can pick up. Bob, that's what Buddha supposedly said, every sentient being has been your parents. And as sentient beings, you also have been the parents of all the other sentient beings, including the Buddhas and all the other sages. It's all one essence expressing in all sorts of different shapes and forms. Carrie, Bob you're so generous as a teacher. You're telling us hey, you all have this. It's not just me. I've never heard another teacher say that. They're more inclined to say no. Joe has it. The rest of you here don't have it. One other guy five years ago got it, and that was me. Group laughter. Bob, if I'm expounding non-duality, you are that, how can I deny or negate anyone? I be talking rubbish. Joking, you haven't got it. But I have. Carrie, from the tone of Nisargadatta's book it doesn't seem like he took your approach though. Bob, he took the more traditional approach. He got it from his guru in the traditional way. Though he taught in a similar way. He wasn't exposed to Westerners until he was much older. He wasn't well known until his book came out. Carry, it's interesting that many teachers will say I'm no better than you, but there's no emphasis on that fact. It's also fascinating that in so many traditional Eastern spiritual movements, the same knowledge you're teaching us is there. But, there's no emphasis on it. The emphasis is on mantras and techniques and behavior and all kinds of other stuff. And the emphasis is everything. Bob, that's right. Emmett seeks a time frame for getting it. Emmett, when you were with Nisargadatta, there was a certain point when you got it. Is that accurate? Bob, he pointed out that I am not the body or the mind. And I saw that. But, can you say there was a certain point when that happened? That puts you back into time. From the appearance point of view, I could say it was when I first saw him. I'd opened up enough to hear what he said. But, if you put the implication of time on when I caught it, you're back in time. And then you start conceptualizing it and thinking, I've got to do this, this, and this, so I can get there. When I understood what he was saying, I realized there was never a time when I was not that. Old habits didn't drop off immediately, of course. But, after seeing the falseness of something, you can never believe in it again. They could never get the same intensity again. When the old thoughts came up, they would quickly be seen as rubbish, and I would drop them. I would let go of them. No fixation or attachment to them. And there was no resistance to them, or I shouldn't be like this. I have to be in a certain state. There was no image of how I should be. No trying to change, alter, or modify thoughts or habits. That would be trying to change what is with a thought. When these habit patterns come up, they're just what is. The only way you try to change anything is by thinking about it. If it's left in its natural state, with no resistance, it leaves on its own. There's no cloud that's ever attached to the sky. Thoughts are not attached anywhere in you. Emmett, we're here listening to you every day, trying to get this ability to see the falseness all the time. But, it keeps coming back. Of course we will always be aware of the falseness, and then returning to the essence. But, is there a time when? Bob, no time. You're trying to manufacture a time. 
Emmett, is there ever a quantum drop or loss of the tendency to be stuck in time and stuck in the appearance? Or is it incremental, incremental, incremental? Bob, now hear this. What's wrong with right now unless you think about it? Emmett, nothing. And the fact is we keep thinking about it. Bob, in that brief second of no thinking, that is the thing you are looking for. In that moment where nothing is wrong or right, it is just as it is. Emmett and we. Bob and then gets you back into it again. In the pausing without thought, everything is just as it is. It's only in the labels that there can be good, bad, right, wrong, or whatever. Without that, everything is just what is. You're spontaneously knowing that you are. Emmett, but we are in such a state of vulnerability to the appearances that can take us right out of that awareness. Does there come a time when the appearances can't grab you anymore, when you are like concrete in that reality, so you can't be pulled out anymore? Bob, you gained that sense of separation at the age of two when you were taught you are an individual. You have to question that belief in the me. As long as you believe in that me, you will be vulnerable and insecure. Emmett, but was there ever a sudden grasping of this that made it complete once and for all? Bob, in seeing that there is no individual entity, who can it be gradual or sudden for? It just is. It was always so. Dell, Nisargadatta, said that he did self-inquiry for three years and then he finally got it. Bob, I can put a time on it too, but I'm telling you there is no time. Nisargadatta, said to stay with the I am. That I am, is a translation of that sense of presence. Right now you're aware of being present. Turn that around, there is a presence of awareness. They're not two. And that is the immediacy of all of us. If that weren't here, we couldn't have any appearance whatsoever. The appearance has no independent nature. It relies on the presence. In staying with the I am, you can't help but see this. James, as I understand it, awakening shows up differently in different people. For some it's gradual and for some it's sudden. A lot of the books we read make us think it has to be sudden because that's how it happened for that person. Like, for example, Eckhart Tolle, author of The Power of Now. But remember that Nisargadatta was often asking individuals whether their understanding came suddenly or gradually. Bob, that's true. Who cares about death? Harry, let's talk about death. We hear these sages say, I don't care if I die in the next five minutes. What's the experience that makes them say that? Bob, it's just the ego, the I thought or false self-center, that was born. And that's constantly in fear of dying. Because people haven't recognized the functioning prior to thought, the seeing, hearing, touching, smelling and tasting that's happening spontaneously, they fear death. People think that mind is all there is and that it's real. When they see that mind is just a bunch of concepts appearing on the essence, and that who you are is that essence, and that you as essence were never born, then the fear is over. And you can't say there will be a time you will cease to be. You can only imagine some conceptualizing going away. Though it's all mental stuff. You are no thing that was ever born. What's to fear? Who's to fear it? Harry, but there's still a big change when death comes. Right now we know we exist. Though awareness is aware of itself. Death is awareness unaware of itself. It's existence but it doesn't know it exists. Bob, that's right. It's just pure being. Harry, the funny thing is that if we weren't actually living the better part of our lives in the natural state, even though we don't realize it, we would be in a panic, fearing death, every moment of every day. It's only the fact that the core of our experience is the non-changing natural state that lets us walk around with an innate sense of immortality. 
That's probably why people don't take care of their health and why we do so many seemingly stupid things. How often does it happen that a person has a heart attack and suddenly becomes health conscious? Death has always been imminent, but suddenly the person is faced with it. Bob, that innate sense of immortality you were talking about becomes more evident when you see that the meat is false. When you investigate death and see there's no actual self-center there to die, immortality becomes more apparent. Emmett, I've heard that when Ramana Maharshi got cancer, he allowed the doctors to give him some major treatment. And I wonder why he bothered to try and save his mind-body. Bob, why not? I don't care much about death, but why do I take vitamins? Emmett, exactly. That's what I'm asking. What motivates someone once they're realized? Bob, the same thing that motivates you all the time. The pure intelligence, energy. James, you're being lived. Bob, exactly. Emmett, well, I've read stories about enlightened sages who sat around and let bugs crawl all over their bodies. He don't care about that, why care about death? Carrie, I could be wrong, who knows, but those stories never struck me as being true. So many stories are made up. James, there's a story in the Papaji book about a yogi in the woods who's living with an open sore, and there are bugs or worms eating it. When Papaji asked if he wanted him to clean it up, the man said, they're having their lunch. Let them be. Or something like that. Stories sound weird, but they could be true. Aside from the fact that there are infinite possibilities within the appearance, there are billions of people on earth, and everyone has some quirk or another. Anyway, letting bugs crawl on the body without swiping them away is just a bit more strange than doing nothing about cancer, like Nisargadatta did. He never tried to heal it, and he sat up giving talks in pain until the day he died. Hell, I can't even fathom how a yogi can live alone in a cave for 50 years. To me that's bizarre. There are infinite possibilities. Bob, they did give Nisargadatta some oxygen toward the end. Carrie, there's a story of a famous sage that Ramish talks about. The sage confused people who have preconceived notions about death. When he was dying, he was in tremendous pain and was screaming for his mother. People wondered how someone who was enlightened could be screaming like that. Well, the body cries out. As far as the yogi with the bugs, it may not have been anything cosmic. He may have just been tired of constantly swatting them away. Who knows? Bob, you don't know. And these stories get embellished all the time. People add to them to make them sound incredible. Oh yes, I saw the saint and blah blah blah. Carrie, joking, do you remember when Sailor Bob came to America and he ate the equivalent of ten meals at once? Group laughter. James, and he tapped me on the forehead and I had visions. Carrie, and when he was alone I saw him float to the cottage. And he took on everyone's karma. Bob, aha. I have to raise my price now. Carrie, what's interesting though, is that the only way a guru can actually take away anyone's karma, is to give him or her, the understanding. Karma only exists in the world of appearance. There has to be a doer for karma to exist. And there are no doers because no one has a self-center. So when a person gets the understanding and sees the illusory nature of creation, that's when he or she can be relieved of karma. James, that's true. But, I don't think we have to deny the existence of all miracles. I don't know why Advaitins are generally so skeptical of extraordinary happenings. Harry, there's a brilliant point that Leo Hartong makes through his book title. He doesn't call it awakening in the dream. He calls it awakening to the dream. We are still in the dream until we die. As Bob helps us see through the dream, he actually is relieving us of karma. 
That's what I think is really meant by the guru taking on someone's karma. But it's been so misinterpreted that people think it has to do with some great, fantastical experience. James, yes, but that doesn't mean there haven't been times when gurus did do something extraordinary for a person or a disciple. Look at the stories of Christ healing the blind with the miracles Papaji did for people. Are those all necessarily false accounts? Carry, not necessarily. Dell, how about the story of the Zen sage Chuan Tzu, who dreamed he was a butterfly? The next day he wondered, am I a person who dreamed I was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly now dreaming I'm a man? Group Laughter Subchapter, Bob Carey Emmett and James July 28 Emmett enjoys a full stop. Emmett, we read stories of angels and gods and all. What about that? Bob, when you talk about seeking and becoming and gods and angels and all that, it's a mind trip. The purpose of the mind is to divide. It never stops dividing. And that which is duality can never understand non-duality. So the answer will never be found in the mind. And the only way out of the mind is full stop. Emmet, but full stop doesn't occur on the basis of our mind or on anything really. Bob, you can just stop right now. Emmett, who can? Bob, no one. But, the stopping happens. In the very seeing of that, pause without a thought. Emmett, my mind will pause but. Bob, repeat I am I am I am I am quickly. Emmett, I am I am I am I am I. Bob, stop. Long pause, was there a thought there in that stopping? Emmett, no. Bob, did you fall apart? Emmett, no. Bob, still seeing and hearing? Still aware in that pause? Emmett, yes. Bob, that was beyond the mind in that instant. The pure knowing was there. That's what people talk about and struggle for, to go beyond the mind. In that pause, you were there. That's pure intelligence. Emmett, who took the action to stop. Who initiated the stop. Bob, there was a stopping. You're trying to find the answer in the mind. There was a cessation, a pause. That's all. Who's thinking? Who's seeing? Who's breathing? Who's beating your heart? Laughing. Emmett, when you made me stop, I saw intelligence energy. Bob, what was it that stopped? Emmett, thought. Bob, so thought can stop and begin. But, that which thought appears on didn't stop. And you didn't disappear. Prior to the mind is our seeing. You were beyond the mind in that moment. The knowingness or intelligence was still there. That is what the mind appears and disappears on. And you see from that that the mind's only a translator. It has no power or independent nature. The answer to life will never be found in the mind. Eventually you have to think, maybe I'm looking in the wrong direction. Emmett, isn't it the mind we're using in this investigation? Bob, yes. You use the mind to see that the stopping is needed. Group laughter. James, it's paradoxical. Carrie, we're using the mind to find out that we can't use the mind. James, Nisargadatta said, you have to think yourself out of this problem. There's no other way. And that's exactly what we're doing. I was startled when I heard that. Emmett, at some point, the mind breaks. Bob, Emmett, you're looking for the answer. You don't need the answer. Carrie, before understanding non-duality, if a question arose, and I wanted to express something, a stream of thoughts would occur. Now if there's a question my mind shuts down, so an answer can arise out of silence. Does that make sense? Bob, yes. 
it has to be translated into a thought by the mind. The thought I am is a translation of the knowing that you are, that sense of presence or presence of awareness. Thought I am is a translation. It can never be the reality. Without the thought, the knowingness is still there. You don't need a label for it. Emmet, that was the experience, the knowingness or emptiness, that I had when you stopped me from repeating I am, I am, I am. Bob, it left you in your natural state. That's it. Laughing. Carry to the tape recorder, make a note, Bob's laughing heartily. Group laughter. Subchapter. Silence overwhelms sound. James, in the last week or so, I've been getting more and more quiet inside. Harry, it seems like the quiet goes on at the same time the mind is chattering. James, yes. Bob, where are those Tibetan singing bowls of yours, James? James, I'll get them. Bob, Bob smacks the singing bowl, which rings loudly for seven or eight seconds. Notice how the silence overwhelmed the sound. No matter how much noise there is, the silence is much greater. Emmett, that's so dramatic. Bob, the same with movement. Get a bowl of water and stir it a lot. And then stop stirring it. The stillness will overwhelm it. Carrie, that same silence happens when I go to the floor of the NYMEX New York Mercantile Exchange. It's so intense there, it's hard to describe. There are thousands of people on the floor, packed in like sardines. And they're screaming at the top of their lungs. The silence dominates because the noise and the frenetic activity is so intense, it amplifies the silence. It's very tangible. It's hard to put it into words but the noise is on the background of silence. Bob. People search and search for years, looking for silence and stillness, not realizing it's the changeless background that everything appears on. That's what this teaching is about. It brings your attention to things we've never investigated before. Carrie, that reminds me of that great book title The Open Secret. It's amazing because the answer to life is hidden in plain sight. Hey that would make a great book title, hidden in plain sight. Emmett, when you had me say I am, I am, I am, it left me in the pure knowingness, which is where I want to be. And that is there all the time, even when activity or thought is happening. By seeing it in that one experience, I'll be able to always recognize that. My understanding can never be the same again. Bob, that's right. And so you see, nobody can ever teach you or give you anything. No one can do anything at all for you. When your attention is drawn to something, that's all you need. It happens right here, right now, where you are, not with anyone else. Carrie, that's beautiful. Bob, so kick the gurus out. I've just suicided myself. Laughing. Carrie, isn't that the meaning of that famous phrase? If you see Buddha on the road, kill him. Bob, yes. Carrie, you can't stand on your own two feet until you destroy the concept of the Guru. James, this issue about the silence taking place in the midst of noise or as the background of noise is interesting. Yesterday afternoon, we were in a store buying Julian a toy, and they had this loud, abrasive music on. I asked the cashier she had to listen to that all day long, and she said yes. I told her that in the morning it wouldn't bother me, but by the end of the day, I'd want to slit my wrists. By the end of yesterday, my nervous system was vibrating. Carrie, you want the answer. I'll give you the definitive answer. You had a five-year-old with you. All bets are off when you're taking care of a five-year-old. Group laughter. James, well that's right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Being frazzled by a five-year-old, often. Emmett, that's a question of the nervous system. James, that's actually my point. 
Some gurus say we must purify the nervous system, and then nothing whatsoever can make us frazzled. Bob, the answer is, go ahead and try that. Go ahead and purify the nervous system. Games, I did that crap for over 30 years. Bob, that's what I'm saying. Harry, I just described an experience of silence on the loud, crowded floor the NYMEX. That's still just an experience owing to my nervous system. Miss Argadita described an experience of being one with a flower. When I read it I thought, oh I don't have that. Something's wrong here. That's just an experience owing to his nervous system. Some people have musical talent, some people don't. Some people are good at math, some aren't. Bob, that's right. And even when you were frazzled by the music, James, it still only happened on the background of silence. The silence was still your background whether you were aware of it or not. James, exactly, but my experience was of being frazzled. I don't like that. Bob, who doesn't like it? The image you have about yourself, the self-center or reference point, is saying, this is frazzled. I had this experience before and I don't like it. But what is it if that reference point is not there? If it's not hitting that mental picture that you have of yourself? James, then, it's just a happening. Bob, as a happening, when it's not hitting that reference point, it's just a flow of energy. That's all. Look at it this way. You're frazzled, well just be that. James, be frazzled? Bob, yes. Be frazzled. Then, is it frazzled? James, no. It's just what is. Bob, you've got nothing to compare it to. If you're angry, be the anger. What is it then? Is it anger? Fear? Be the fear. Don't muck around with it separating. Be completely that. Just as it is. James, with no label. Bob, you don't need a label. If you're pissed off, be pissed off. Full stop. What is it then, if you're totally pissed off? It's not a mind trip then. It's just what is. What is means unaltered, unmodified, uncorrected. Warts and all. Just as it is. Group laughter. Seekers versus non-seekers, who's more screwed up? Carrie, when you say that, it makes me realize that seekers are often more screwed up than non-seekers. Because they're always self-examining. What does this mean? Why did I have that reaction? And so on. You get another observer, another layer of observation. It takes place for the seeker. Bob, seeking is the problem. Carrie, there are people who don't self-examine, who don't seek. They would laugh at this conversation and wouldn't spend three minutes listening to this stuff. They do what they do and don't care. They're better off than the poor seeker who's constantly self-examining. And yet it's the seekers who reach the understanding we're now discussing. Bob, the self-centers of those people who don't self-examine are not getting them into trouble in certain instances. But, they're also certainly experiencing a reference point about lots of other issues. With seekers, they have become overwhelmed by suffering from their self-center and feel they want to do something about it. Most of us who start seeking have had some traumatic experience that sets us on the path. Carry enlightened dissatisfaction. But, some people suffer and start seeking while others suffer and never seek. Bob, it's like the Bible parable. Some seeds that fall on the ground sprout a little, some a lot, and some not at all. In the scriptures they tell you that you have to give up the ego. You have to be selfless. But, none of them directly tell you that there is no self there. It's just a fiction. Carrie, it's interesting though. Seekers in self-examining could appear to be weak when compared to non-seekers who are so sure of what they're doing. 
someone who's strong by society standards doesn't do a lot of questioning about themselves. If they're challenged, they stand their ground. They appear strong. When seekers are challenged, they may look inward. They're vulnerable. What does that imply? It implies that their self-center isn't that strong a reference point. It's kind of loose. So the person appears to be weak. Maybe they run to a psychiatrist because they're getting beaten up by these people with stronger self-centers who actually don't have a clue. The non-seekers are telling them how it is when they don't really have a clue. They're going this way and that way. The so-called weak ego, which it could be argued is actually very strong, begins to self-examine. And yet, all examination has to eventually drop away. Emmett, the willingness to be vulnerable is a willingness to possibly self-destruct. It's a willingness to say maybe I'm not right. That self-destruction is what we're talking about. That ego has to be destroyed. Bob, it doesn't have to be destroyed. It's a fiction. There's no self-center there. The knowing that you are translates through the mind as the thought I am. You can't do much with I am, so you add on to that I am. You say I am this, I am that, I'm great at this, I'm bad at this, and so on. You add to that I am and form a mental picture or image of what you believe yourself to be. That seemingly concretizes and becomes a reference point. But, when you investigate it, you see it's only a group of ideas and images or concepts which have no substance. And above all, they are not independent. You couldn't have any of them without awareness. Though the ego is a fiction, there's nothing there. Emmett, that's right. And unless you investigate it, you don't see that. So there has to be a willingness to investigate, to self-destruct or have that fabric be totally unwoven. Bob, now you're starting to bring willingness in. Then we have to ask who's going to bring this willingness. James, you have to stop believing in the self-center, the false reference point. That's what Emmett's calling destruction of the ego. This can't be it. Carrie. When most people read or hear about non-duality, they don't walk away feeling like they got it. Bob, will they say I see that but? Or what if? And the big one is well, if I'm nothing, how will I live my life? And they're immediately back in the trap of duality again. And if a habit pattern comes up again, they'll say, this one's a strong one. In fact, it's got no power at all unless a belief goes into it. James, I think that what's behind that well I get it but. Is this feeling of this is it? This can't be it. I don't feel great. I don't feel bliss. First of all there are all these teachers saying how fantastic it's going to be when we get there, as if there's a person to be there when it happens. It's the height of absurdity. We're all looking for something, not nothing. When nothing happens, it's anticlimactic. It's like so what? What's the big deal? Bob, when you say so what? You've subtly moved back into it. See how subtle it is. I don't feel great. You're back in the mind. James, yes. Bob, this is it. Full stop. Just as it is. James, you give the person the experience of what is. You go through that process of I am, I am, I am stop. And the person pauses and stops labeling for a few seconds, and they see what is. They see that which is beyond thought or prior to the mind. And that's not great, it's not fantastic. It's just what is. It doesn't match their pictures of the great enlightenment that all these gurus and sages write about. So, the person walks away from it. Bob, exactly. They go straight back into the mind. James, straight back. I've seen it with some people who have come to hear you. Carrie, it occurs to me that the great experiences may have some truth to them, 
But first the person has to stop seeking so hard. Silence doesn't sing the first moment you pause thought and experience what's prior to the mind. That comes from relaxing into it. Bob, we're used to gross sensations. And that's what they're looking for. But, the beauty or enjoyment is in the subtlety and simplicity. James, there can also be a problem when someone feels they got it. The person gets it, the next step the mind takes is to say, I'm enlightened, I'm liberated, I'm awake. That can be difficult. There can be resistance to that. You start thinking I'm not good enough for that. Could I possibly be liberated? There are a million reasons not to take it on and stay with it. And there's only one reason to say this is it. Carrie, if you get rid of that word enlightenment and just say I understand, then you don't trigger those reactions. James, yes but you know the world we live in. We've already been conditioned by all these spiritual teachers and movements. Bob, get rid of the idea that I got it. Go back to the fact that I am is it, not that thought, but what the thought represents. That sense of awareness or presence is it. James, also you think I'm awake now but I was awake years ago when I was suffering. What is this? Bob, the suffering with the not suffering couldn't have taken place without the underlying wakefulness. That's the eternal constant. James, exactly. Bob, that's understanding. James, yes, and that was my first question when I called you months ago. When I asked, what role does the intellect play in liberation? What I meant was, is enlightenment just an understanding? Could it really be just that? It was shocking to me after hearing all about samadhi and purifying the nervous system and all that. It was bizarre. Though much misconception. Harry, I think there's an element that has to come into this for many people. And that's faith in the teaching. Because the understanding is so subtle and isn't initially supported by dramatic experience. Look at Nisargadatta's process. He said, my teacher told me I am the divine awareness. I am the eternal. And I believed him. And I abided in that. And he stayed with the I am for three years. I'd bet that for the first six months or a year there was nothing flashy about his experience. James, that's why there are millions of people going to these gurus who give out techniques and all sorts of things to do. And tell disciples, it's going to be great in the future. Non-duality is too simple for people until they're ready. I've noticed one common denominator to many people who are willing to say, I got it. They go searching and they decide, I'm not returning to my life until I find the answer. When people like that hear truth, truth that's genuine and authentic, they take it. These are the ones who are committed. The ones who said they refused to return to life without it. Bob, and the answer was totally different than what they thought they were looking for. James, that's right. But, they were so serious that when they heard truth, they took it. Carrie, that's earnestness. Nisogadatta was always telling people to be earnest. Bob, you were talking about purifying the nervous system. What nervous system is there if there's no vitality in this body? James, the nervous system is just another concept. Harry, there was a very interesting exercise Ramish talked about when I saw him. He says to analyze any action you take in the course of the day and see if it's really your action. For example, half a minute ago I made a decision to say what I said. Well, Bob said something prior that brought up my thought to say what I did. Emmett is sitting here with us because James called him up and said, Sailor Bob's coming here. James couldn't have invited Bob to come here if Merrill hadn't told him to get Bob's book. Though there is no action we can take that's really independent. All kinds of things have to happen for the next action to occur. Nothing is self-generated. It's all integrated into the totality. There's genetics, there's our upbringing and everything. 
up and that can go right back to the stars, to the astrology that James practices. James, absolutely. The horoscope shows so much of what's going to happen in a person's life. There is no need of a way out. Don't you see that a way out is also part of the dream? All you have to do is see the dream as dream. Wherever it leads you it will be a dream. The very idea of going beyond the dream is illusory. Why go anywhere? Just realize that you are dreaming a dream you call the world and stop looking for ways out. The dream is not your problem. Your problem is that you like one part of your dream and not another. Love all or none of it and stop complaining. When you have seen the dream as a dream, you have done all that needs be done. From Nisargadatta Maharaj, I am that chapter 5. Never the same again. From the age of 20, when I learned about meditation and enlightenment, there was one pervasive current of thought running through my brain. It began when I awoke and was there until I slept. And the intensity never lessened. It was, of course, the desire that my sense of separateness and incompleteness would one day be replaced by the peace or so-called bliss of enlightenment. By my late forties, my thinking remained unchanged except that expectations of success had seriously diminished. Shortly after Bob arrived, however, my worn-out concepts of, and desires for, liberation were replaced by the conclusion, I will never be the same again. Indeed, that thought became somewhat of a mantra for the five weeks of Bob's visit. And I heard similar reactions from others who spent more than two or three days hearing Bob's non-duality teachings. Amazingly, this was unrelated to experience. It had only to do with understanding. During Bob's visit, there was no transmission of bliss, no trance-like state of meditation, and no tapping on the forehead. There was simply a reaction to following Bob's instruction to investigate the belief in the me we have all lived with since childhood. It was a reaction to seeing clearly that the past and future are nothing more than mental images. If past and future are illusory, then so is our entire existence. If past and future never happened, what exactly did? It was a reaction to looking within, and, instead of experiencing an independent entity, finding emptiness or no thing. It was a realization that since no thing has been with me ever since birth, while absolutely everything else about me has changed, then emptiness or no thing must be who I am. That being the case, who I really am is, and has always been, whole and complete. That being the case, who I really am is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. For ten years during my thirties, I had taken the Werner Erhard EST seminars. Werner is not an Advaitin, but he's a brilliant teacher. Many times I had heard him state emphatically, this is it. This is how life turned out. Stop expecting it to be different. He also said, life has no meaning. Get used to it. Life has no meaning, and it has no meaning that it has no meaning. For years I wondered what it would be like to be able to really comprehend such statements. Somehow Sailor Bob had a similar message, said in different words. But he said them in a way I could grasp. It was all simple and painless. It was as if we were little children entranced by the beautiful blue ocean, and Bob handed us empty buckets and said, Go fetch me some blue water from the sea, and watch what happens. It was exciting beyond description. The effects of this understanding have ranged from changes so simple and normal, they are barely worth mentioning to a radical shift in life. While the Bobs, as we sometimes called them, were here and visitors were streaming through our house, I was so busy and so excited, there was no way to fully appreciate the changes that were occurring. A few weeks after they left, however, I noticed a blatant before and after effect. Life before Sailor Bob and life after. The most revealing experience, initially, occurred every time I awoke from sleep. 
For Bob, my first thoughts upon awakening were directly connected to feeling separate, limited, and incomplete. And they were always accompanied by some corresponding desire that when fulfilled would supposedly set the problem right. There was often a sense of impending doom and a probing of what could possibly go wrong. This was naturally followed by a strategy of how to control any problem or potential predicament. Even in the best of times, there was always something missing and always something needed. The kicker was that no matter which desire might get fulfilled, the feeling of separateness and incompleteness never abated. Not even close. I could never get enough of what would not bring peace. Still, desires persisted. If, as they say, the definition of insanity is doing the same action and expecting different results, I should have been placed in an insane asylum decades ago. After Bob's teaching, waking from sleep is radically different. Instead of feeling something is lacking and needs fixing, there is a sense of wholeness and completion. There is nothing missing, no sense of becoming and no worries about the future. There is finally a sense of belonging. Instead of a bunch of niggling, needy thoughts and desires demanding attention, there is simply life as is, presence awareness, moment by moment. The experience is so normal and undramatic it is barely worth mentioning. But, it is so contrary to my previous life, it is still surprising, and it is a relief beyond description. In the months since my sense of separation has disappeared, I have also felt frequent moments of concentrated well-being or bliss. But, bliss in my view, is a poor description for what is actually a sense of intense natural well-being. While this may seem moot, the word bliss generally conjures up great ecstasy or the kind of miraculous peak experiences that sometimes take place during periods of extended meditation. The occasional sense of concentrated well-being, on the other hand, is something normal and natural that spontaneously arises from time to time, completely uncaused. This peace or joy, or whatever one wishes to label it, bubbles up strictly in the absence of distractions. It occurs on its own, with no particular rhyme or reason, and is clearly related to being or no thing. What it is unrelated to is any particular action, belief, desire, occurrence, or otherworldly phenomenon. Thus it is, as Bob says, uncaused. While I cannot speak for others, I can say that in my experience the intensity of this well-being makes it unlikely to persist for long periods of time. There is a somewhat dominating presence to it, which overwhelms the normal focus and attention that one needs for daily living. I've even occasionally commented to my wife that if I weren't such an active person, the brief episodes I enjoy might last longer. Ultimately, I suspect the bliss that seekers have read about and consider the long-awaited prize is, to a large extent, a mind-created phantom. I am not saying that the bliss experiences many liberated people speak about don't exist. Nor am I asserting that some people haven't felt a state of bliss or extreme well-being for a year or two. In manifest creation anything is possible. Indeed, in my late twenties I experienced a state of heightened awareness that lasted nearly two years and was brought on, in the world of appearance, by the impact of a devastating divorce. Based on the periods of extreme well-being I have felt lately, however, I suspect that unless one lives a very settled or hermit-type life with little activity, such occurrences will be brief and transitory. At least that has been my experience. One of the most interesting effects of understanding non-duality is how quickly problems, worries and upsets pass. When apparently bad things happen, intelligence energy comes up to meet the challenge. When disturbing thoughts begin to express, they try to cause their usual trouble, but have nowhere to stick. First they meet with the knowledge that there is no James. Then they struggle against the realization that past and future are unreal. Then, 
they bang up against the awareness that who I really am is eternal and immortal. Problems generally become non-issues. This is, of course, the polar opposite to life before non-duality. At that point, there was no conceivable way to win. Life enjoyable as it was in many ways, was essentially a vicious circle of solving problems, the solving of which made no lasting or significant difference. Death was always around the comer. The worldly pleasures of money, power, fame, love, and whatever else one can name were never enough. They could never fill the gap that was created the instant in which individuality was believed. And even if there were peaceful times, who could possibly know what problem or tragedy was lurking around the comer, in a future that was considered real? By the time I noticed the changes that had taken place, a few weeks after Bob and Barb left, I found it fascinating that I could not pinpoint when they had happened. I knew early on during Bob's visit that I would never be the same because my perceptions and beliefs were clearly altered. But, it was only after all the excitement and activity abated that I realized the lasting change in my experience. The fact that I did not know when my sense of separation had dropped away was both remarkable and a verification that time does not exist. The present moment is all there is. At any rate, events happened as they did. Any explanations I can offer are both false, because there are no real causes in the transitory world of appearance in which we live, and after the fact. In the world of concepts and appearances, however, there are two things worth noting. One was my fervent desire to grasp non-duality. This intensity allowed for a certain courage and willingness to ask anything and everything I needed and to press Bob if necessary. The other was Bob's extraordinary ability to convey the understanding. I am referring not to his intellect, but to his tendency to focus almost exclusively on oneness, on the reality of existence, and to acknowledge the illusory appearance we live in only when appropriate and useful. In this he was certainly masterful. The conversation you are about read is a highlight of what I have just described. It is an example of my intensity in drive meeting Bob's ability to stay rooted in reality and teach only that. The talk took place the same night as the conversation that ended chapter 4 and centered around why it appears to take time, which clearly does not exist, for people to grasp non-duality. I felt that somehow people should grasp non-duality immediately, instead of having to mull it over or process it for months or years. The words you are about to read do not come close to conveying the full extent of fireworks that were happening. There was a great deal of intensity, shouting and back and forth drama. Bob's tone was more confronting and adamant than ever before. My question, I am sure, would have been answered with infinitely more patience had it come a week earlier. But, Bob knew exactly where I was in my apparent process and had no intention of letting me off the hook. In fact, he said as much within the talk. For my part, I was comfortable with Bob as soon as he arrived. But, by the time of this talk, the comfort level had grown, and I was pulling out all the stops. I was pressing him to the limit. As voices grew loud, we were actually interrupting each other in order to press our case, a slightly embarrassing fact as I listened to the tape. In retrospect, it seems that perhaps the question I was asking was not what it appeared. In retrospect, perhaps I was testing something in myself in the teaching or in Sailor Bob. Conversation is a wonderful example of the necessity to finally, once and for all, drop the mind. As Bob so often states, the purpose of the mind is to divide. Until one does a full stop, there will be question upon question upon question, and never a truly helpful answer. The answer to life will never be found in the mind. The answer lies in being. And more specifically, in being without labeling. When the mind finally stops, whether briefly or for a long period, 
oneness is the only possible experience. While Bob was here, there was no way for me to grasp the significance of this fact. In my house was one of the best living examples of non-duality, and I wanted to take full advantage of the fact. I had no desire to sit in silence with him. Though I asked anything and everything. And Bob, being the great teacher he is, did his part to kick everything out from under me. It was therefore not until a few weeks after Bob left that I noticed my mind becoming very still. It was then that I began to understand what he meant by living without labeling. And it was then that I began to have glimpses of what Nisargadayata meant in the following interchange from, I am that, question, you are giving a certain date to your realization. What happened? Nisargadatta, the mind ceased producing events. The ancient and ceaseless search stopped, I wanted nothing, expected nothing, accepted nothing as my own. There was no me to strive for. Even the bear I am faded away. The other thing I noticed was that I lost all my habitual certainties. Earlier I was so sure of so many things, now I am sure of nothing. But, I feel I have lost nothing by not knowing because all my knowledge was false. My not knowing was in itself knowledge of the fact that all knowledge is ignorance, that I do not know is the only true statement the mind can make. In the following conversation, one of the most dramatic of the summer, I was questioning while Bob was mercilessly kicking everything out from under me. The fact that we were both jovial and that there was so much laughter did not by any means diminish the intensity of what was happening. It was an important experience. Subchapter, Carrie Bob Barb Dell and James Friday Night, July 23 Eyes a label. Barb, I had an incident once that is similar to the process Bob uses to show people the pure awareness that's prior to mind. Dell, you mean the one where he has us say I am, I am, I am, stop. Barb, yes. I was about 18 or 20 years old, cuddling with my boyfriend on a hillside. There was a river at the bottom of the hill. It was lovely. Bob, joking, I hope that's all you were doing. Group laughter. Barb, it doesn't matter because... Dell, joking, it doesn't matter because it's just a label. Harry, it matters because it's happening right now. Group laughter. Barb, anyway, we were enjoying ourselves, and I heard a sound in the paper ruffling. And suddenly I saw a big snake. I don't remember a thing after that except being at the bottom of the hill. Of course my boyfriend came down and asked what's wrong. I told him I saw a snake. But, I couldn't remember anything except the snake and then being down at the bottom of the hill. I didn't remember running. I didn't remember anything. I was there and I didn't know how I got there. It was a perfect example of spontaneous action without labeling. Carrie, I have a friend named Greg Good who's had the understanding for many years. He was telling me about the amazing implications of the fact that every thought and experience we have is out of sync with the happening. Bob, exactly. Carrie, because the whole thing is after the fact. We're never in the present moment, experientially. We can't be. It's all interpreting what already happened. James, that's why there's no ultimate satisfaction in living this illusory life. Everything's about labeling and interpreting. That's why everyone's chasing the silence beyond or prior to the thought. Life as labeling isn't satisfying. Kerry, Krishnamurti said as soon as you say something's beautiful it's over. Bob, our very reference point is a label. It's a dead image we're referring to. The reference point is invalid because it's based on the past. I mean, and the rest of it are just words. Where do those words come from? They're not fresh and new. They're old labels. Subchapter, Dell relaxes into emptiness. Dell, 
Nisargadatta and lots of spiritual teachers talk about the idea of witnessing life. And they make a big deal about it. Well, once this so-called entity is beyond the witness. Bob, hang on. No entity can be beyond. The entity is a witness too. You have to see the falseness of the entity. That's the main thing. If you see the falseness of the entity, is there any witness? Is there anything beyond the witness? Dell, no. Bob, what are you? Dell, no thing. Bob, just presence awareness. No thing. So, have you stopped knowing? For you to be able to say no thing, the intelligence energy must be there. That is what you are, no thing, in which witnessing and every other thing is appearing and disappearing on. If you are no thing, and you're still hearing, thinking, seeing and so on, it must be the emptiness or no thing that is causing or allowing that. That's where the activity is coming from, from that knowing capacity that's in that emptiness. Dell. So how does the personality that we have? Bob, who has it? The characteristics of the personality are just patterns of energy that are appearing on that no-thingness, which is emptiness. So if it's emptiness, who's having them? They're just appearances like a cloud in the sky. Is a cloud attached to anything? Of course not. Once you start creating an entity and getting involved in mind stuff, you keep going down the wrong track. The nature of the mind is to divide. And it can only divide in the pairs of opposites. It'll go on forever. Whatever you think about will be a division. And division is dualism, it's duality. Non-dual as we've just explained is empty. In that emptiness can there be a center? Can there be a circumference in space? Dell, no. Bob, just relax into that emptiness right now. No center. No circumference. Have you fallen apart or disappeared? Dell, no. Bob, just pure awareness, emptiness with no center and no place. Even your body is appearing on that emptiness. Dell, is it possible for a person with no spiritual knowledge to be living this reality, this non-duality, without having a clue about it? Carrie, he's asking can a person be enlightened and not know it? Dell, I didn't want to use that word. Carrie, we all hate the word but it communicates it. Bob, the whole world is like that. Everyone's enlightened and doesn't know it. Laughing. But seriously yes that is possible. If they've been like that their whole life with nothing to compare it to, how would they know it? Carrie, there's a French man named Steve Jourdain who was realized and thought that everyone was having the same experience he was. In fact he was having a completely different experience than others. And then certain things happened that made him realize he was different. Barb. It's easy to adopt a feeling of being special. In fact, we're all actually the same. Many so-called spiritual people think we're special because we've got this knowledge. There's no difference in anyone, no matter what people are doing. Because they're only doing what they're doing because they're being lived to do that. Some of them don't want to ever stop being a seeker because they'll find out that they're nothing special. Dell, they'll lose their labels. Barb, exactly. Why does it appear to take time to get it? Bob, what's Bra Sab doing? Any questions there? Ask your questions. James, the ability to let life be, the ability to let experiences be, without resisting or pushing anything away, comes simply from the understanding that there is no individual? Correct. Bob, yes. It's a natural state. Look at a little child. It's not locked into any trouble before reasoning has started. The interference is based on the idea of a separate identity. Dell, 
The emotions and feelings, or likes and dislikes, are based on your personality and upbringing. They'll come up but they won't take hold. Bob, they're just part of the functioning. We've had these reactions so much in life, so habitually and so often, that so many events can trigger them. Something brings on bad memories, and suddenly tears are there almost instantly. With so much repetition of these things, we've hypnotized ourselves. Just like a stage hypnotist. He puts people under a spell, and has them do all kinds of tricks. And he gives them a post-hypnotic suggestion, so that after their spell, all he has to do is snap his fingers, and they're back in the spell again. Though we've hypnotized ourselves into these reactions through constant repetition, without checking and looking to see who it's happening to. We've never turned inwards and had a look. As soon as we do, we see that these ideas and beliefs we have about ourselves have no validity whatsoever. James, will the repetition of looking within to see who it's happening to become a deconditioning process? Instead of resisting any unwanted feeling or experience, we'll ask ourselves, who is this happening to? Bob, there's no deconditioning process. It's immediate. The recognition of resistance to anything comes up spontaneously in that intelligence energy. There's nothing to do. You can't be non-resistance. You can recognize resistance from the point of non-resistance. In that moment of recognition, you're out of it. James, within the world of appearance, the world that we live in, it looks like a process. You told us that after you got what Nisargadatta was teaching, you left his flat and then within minutes you were back in the mind again. Five or ten years later, it was easier to be non-resistant and to avoid getting caught in the reference point. Bob, see, this is what consistently happens when people ask, what happened for you? I tell them the story and they think it has to be the exact same way. They don't see what I've been saying beforehand. It's always the same, oh, he had it in a flash. And this one had it this way. And this was a process. And he did this for years and years. And they don't recognize what I'm telling you now. This is about knowing you are present and aware immediately, just as is. You can go into the story of how it happened to someone else. Or the process was this way or that way. And there was an entity there doing this, and I've got to do the same. But I keep pointing out that you're already knowing that you are. This is something you can't negate. James, well actually that's what my question is about. It should be immediate. But, somehow it's not. It appears to happen in time for many people. Since there's really no such thing as time, why does it appear to take time for a person to get the immediate recognition? You seem to have the immediate recognition and I don't. I feel the same way you felt when you left Nisargad, Atta's flat, and went straight back into the mind and into reactions and all that. Now that I have the understanding, it seems like that should be the full stop. Not two or three or five years later. Bob, what does the word seems mean? It means appears to be. Though, you're taking the appearance to be real. It's appearance only. James Wright. There is no such thing as time. Therefore, now that I have this understanding. Bob, whose thought? Whose understanding? And what's this now? You split up all those things. Even now is a concept of time. Even the word presence is a concept of time. James laughing. I can't ask the question. I don't know how to ask. Bob right. And in that stopping, where does it leave you? James, in the present. Bob, instead of staying in that and realizing there was nothing to say and nothing to do, you said, I can't ask the question. This is getting deep now. Have a look at what you're saying. You'll never work it out in the mind. Never. James, this goes back to what we were talking about today. The way people say I got it but. 
Bob, you see that? James, yes. Bob, why do it? Laughing. James, why do it? Because. Bob, because. Cause. Laughing. James, what? Bob, because means cause. Cause and effect. Who's the cause? More laughing, drop it. You're trying to find a way out of it again with another question. To sit in that emptiness for a moment. James, I can't. I need to ask this from a different point of view. Laughing. My reference point is going crazy here. I understand reality. Or, I have some understanding of reality. I am presence awareness. Bob, what's the definition of reality? Laughing. You're not going to get away with this, James. James, that which is eternal. That which never changes. Bob, can the changeful understand reality? Can the changeful understand the changeless? James, no. Bob, who's the I that understands reality? That's the changeful trying to grasp the changeless. We'll stop again. James, but I want to talk about the appearance. I want to talk about where I live for a minute. Group laughter. Bob, well, what are you here for? To talk about the appearance or understand reality. James, I want to understand. Bob, mocking, I want to understand. Is there understanding right now? James, joking, Bob's resisting me. Group laughter. Bob, is there understanding there right now? Are you knowing that you are? James, yes. Bob, isn't that understanding? James, yes. Bob, then what do you want to know? You're trying to understand the content? There'll be a million questions there. But, just stay with that. When I kick everything out from under you, just stay with that emptiness. I can kick everything out from underneath you, all the time. But, can you fall out of that knowingness? James, no. But, how is this helping with my question? Bob, sarcastic, all right. Go on, ask your question. I'll chop it off. Group laughter. It'll keep you in this forever. Go on, ask your question. James, what I'm asking is this, there's no such thing as time, it's just a mental concept. There's only the present moment. Understanding is happening that the reference point is false. Since that understanding is happening right now. Pause, if something upsetting were to happen, there would most likely be a recognition of resistance. Bob, you're asking a hypothetical question about something that might happen in the future, and it's taking you away from the understanding right now. James, yes I get that. We're not allowed to talk about that. Bob, look, you can talk about that as much as you like, but if it's taking you away from right now and right now is where reality is. Pause, if something should occur in the future, when will it be happening? It'll be happening right now, and you'll have the tools to handle it right now, because you're used to being with the now. Why are you hypothesizing what I'm going to do in the future? You're right into concepts again. James, I know that. Bob laughing. Why bother asking the question? James, I want to know why a person who gets the understanding. Laughing. Carrie, this is great. James, I want to know why, since there is no time, why it's not instantaneous. Bob, it is immediate. James, bear with me for a minute. Two days from now if something upsetting comes up, there will be a reaction. Bob, do you understand that there is no time? That the present is all there is? James, yes. Bob, loudly, why the heck are you talking about two days from now? James, because I live in the world of appearance. Bob, two days from now is time. What is time? 
James, illusion. Bob Wright, a mental concept. So you're conceptualizing about some future that's non-existent. James, well, you know how I'm able to predict those car bombings in Iraq every day. Group laughter. Here's another prediction. Today's Wednesday. I predict we're all going to be here in this room talking again on Thursday. Even though there's no time, watch me be accurate. Bob, yes, but it'll be now when it happens. Group laughter. James, all right. I think I see it. Bob, well, don't think it. Know it. James, my question's absurd because there never will be a future. Bob, right. And drop the question. And what's left? James, wait, wait, wait. I got an idea. More laughter. How about this? I'm feeling slightly embarrassed. Everyone's laughing, and I'm thinking everyone's laughing at me. So there's some resistance here. It's very, very slight, but good enough that I can bring it up as an example. Okay. I'm feeling some resistance. Oh, but now resistance is over. Bob, you recognize that? James, yes. Bob, as soon as you recognize it, you're out of it. James, okay. It took five seconds for the embarrassment to leave. Oh, now I'm embarrassed again. Bob looked at me a certain way and laughed. Oh, this time it only took three seconds for the embarrassment to go away. That was interesting. I got upset before, and it took five seconds to disappear. Then I got upset later, and only took two seconds. Why did it take five seconds, and then only take two seconds, since there is no such thing as time? Why am I? Bob, wait a minute. James, wait. Why am I? Bob. No. You wait. James, non-resistance seems to be getting better or faster. Something is getting better. Bob, you agree there's no such thing as time, and you're going into time constantly. Though it must be a belief in time that has to go. James, yes. I see your point. Okay. Bob, you see the point. James, yes. Bob, where are you right now? James, the present. Bob, laughing. Simple, isn't it? Conceptualizing is okay when you know you are the reality. Bob, now while all this talk about time was going on, did you ever move away from presence awareness? James, no. I was always in the present. But my reference point was all over the place. Bob, well, what are you? The reference point or the reality? James, reality. Bob, right. Well, know that constantly, and then you can conceptualize all you like about it. It becomes all inclusive again. James, wait a minute. You're not going to stop me if I conceptualize again. Barb, get Bob to make a promise for the future. Bob. Realize that the changeless background is what you really are. Then whatever appears on it is understood to be appearance. It's no big deal. There's no personal involvement about the Iraq bombings, for example. James, was there personal involvement in the last ten minutes when I was asking all these questions? Bob, yes. There was somebody who wanted to know. James laughing. Well, how can I ask Cassions? If I conceptualize again, you're going to say there's somebody who wants to know. Bob, yes. But then, if you understand that there's no me there, James, if I know I'm the Eternal, how can I conceptualize? Bob, the same ways clouds appear in the sky. James, isn't that what just happened? I was in the presence awareness, even though I was conceptualizing. I may not have known it, but Bob, did you know that? Was that knowingness there, or was there involvement with the embarrassment? 
James, there was a big me going on. But, that was an illusion. You knew that I am that. But what's the difference? Bob, of course I do. But did you? James, no. I didn't know that. But that doesn't matter. Barb, as long as Bob knows it. Laughing. James, how could I ever be anything but that? Bob, that's right. James, you knew I was that as I was talking. Carrie, all I know, James, is that you've helped to make a really good talk on tape. That'll be a great dialogue for people to hear. James, joking, well, I'm going to nail Bob. I'm going to get him at some point. He thinks he's like Ronald Reagan. Nothing sticks to him. Group laughter. Carrie, he loves it. He looked about twenty years younger during that interchange. Bob, you can't nail me. I'm no thing. Laughter. Carrie, you're not here. James, I'm going to nail the appearance. Bob, you can have the appearance. Take it. James, we'll get Bob. We'll find a reference point in him. Dal, Bob, did you wrestle with Nisargadatta with this stuff? Bob, he'd get me up front and kick everything out from under me. No, 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 no. James, good thing he didn't speak English. You had the interpreter as a buffer. Bob, and my reference point would get pinched. Ah, ah, ah. Barb, we took our friends to see him and that's what happened. Bob, just the same as James was doing. Laughing. Carrie, what's fascinating is that all of that back and forth wrestling that you, Bob, had with Nisar, Kadayata, happened after you had the understanding. Because you got the understanding in the first few days you were with him. But, then, the fine tuning took place. Bob, well, that's the same here with James. James, same thing. Carrie, that's what I call the small rocks. You really worked hard to defend the small rocks. Laughing. Barb, I went over to India with a friend and her daughter. And Bob took them to see Nisargadatta. They weren't very impressed, and that was apparently because Bob and Nisargadatta were yelling at each other like what just occurred. My friends thought everything was supposed to be peace and light. They had a concept that enlightenment is peace and light. So they weren't impressed by Nisargadatta. They weren't interested. Carrie, they probably didn't think that enlightenment smoked cigarettes like Nisargadatta does. There was a time if I had gone to see Nisargadatta and seen him smoking when I would have walked out. Barb and James, if those words about embarrassment were true, at least you had the courage to ask your questions. James, well, it was just an example. Del, he was playing. James, no, I wasn't playing. I was looking for an example, and when everyone was laughing, there was a tinge of some embarrassment. It was tiny, but it was something I could point to that was happening right in the present. Carrie, James, the difference between you and Bob, versus Bob when he was yelling at Nisargadita, was that you have less of a reference point going on. Bob was really fighting with him. He was attached to his position. You were discussing. But, you quickly let it go. Bob, any more questions? Dell, no. Harry, Bob, you said something earlier that I'll never forget. Fifteen billion light years away from here, it's still now. That's amazing. It really conjures an image about the ever-present now. Bob, you can only evaluate time from a reference point. And the Earth is not a valid reference point because it's traveling around the sun. Carrie, time for bed. I'm tired. Dell, that's part of why I was laughing. Carrie, oh it was the engagement. Passion going back and forth was scintillating. Dell, actually I was laughing more at Bob than James. 
expounding was so intense. For me it was like a spike going down deeper and deeper into railroad tracks. Subchapter. Vignette the next morning. Questions can keep us in duality. James, the problem I had last night was that asking anything about the future is totally negating the knowledge of non-duality. Bob, it's subtly moving you away from presence. James, it's negating any understanding. To Carrie and Emmett, why didn't you guys give me a smack? Bob, you've just seen it. James, when that reference point was in action, I really wanted an answer. I want to know. I want to know. Bob, if I'd have given you an answer, it might have appeased your reference point for a few moments, but then another question would have come. And another and another. James, I'd be back into duality living as if there's a me. Bob, yes and that's what we do all the time. It's pointless asking questions. Where are you going to go from there? When there's no question, there's no questioner. You can only fall back into emptiness. In the no question and no questioner, you still are. James, I see. By the way, I have another joke. Emmett, let's hear it. James, there was once a man who traveled all over India in search of enlightenment. He searched for years and years and years. Finally he found an ashram where the guru said, I can give you liberation, but it's not easy. It's a long hard process. At which point, the seeker said he would do anything to reach the goal. So the guru told the man he would have to go into a room and meditate day and night, and food would be brought to him. That way, he would never have to leave the room. He had to stay in silence the whole time, until the end of the year when the monks would come and check up on him. Then, he would be allowed to say two words. Bob, two words. James, yes. Two words. Though one year goes by, and the seeker has been meditating and praying, and he's been in complete silence the whole time. The monks come into his room and ask, so how's it going? How's everything? The seeker gets a pained look on his face and says, Bed's hard. The monks answer, Oh, great, great. Just keep meditating. You're doing fine. You'll get there. Then, another long year passes, and the monks come to see him again. How's everything? How's your progress? They ask. Again he gets a pained look on his face. This time he says, food's awful. The monks reply, oh great, great. That's fine. Just keep meditating. Then, a third year goes by, and they come to check up on him again. The monks ask, so how's it going? The seeker says, I quit. They answer, it's about time. You've been complaining since you got here. Group laughter. Bob, that's great. I'll have to tell that in Australia. Sub chapter, Bob Carey Emmett James and Anne. July 29 morning. The following conversation mainly involved Bob and a local woman named Anne Feely. While Carey Emmett and I had breakfast in another room and spoke privately with Bob. After 30 or 40 minutes, the rest of us joined in. What follows are excerpts from that morning. Subchapter. Life lives on life. Anne, it seems that if I were to get to the place where I thought life was unreal, I'd be laughing all the time, like an idiot. I don't think I'd be able to operate in this illusion appropriately. I'd be saying this is all a game. Bob, but if the I is false now has it ever been real? So, who has operated in the illusion up till now? You were being lived throughout all the dramas and traumas and everything. Whatever you did in the past, did you think you did that? And I did. But, I don't anymore. Parts of my life were horrible. Does this mean that if I hadn't had the belief in me, I wouldn't have had the bad experience? Bob, probably not. But, life, 
took you through that and now you've turned around and are looking at this non-duality. And, yes I know that about myself. Bob, doesn't that imply that there's an intelligence or higher power that's looked after you? And, then why are some people tragically dying in their story or their horror? Bob, there's a tree outside that has thousands of seeds on it. When they all fall to the ground, how many of them will germinate and become trees? And, so what about the ones that don't germinate? Bob, they go back into life. Life lives on life. Those seeds will fall on the ground and rot and then become fertilizer, so something else can grow. And then after that grows, something will come along and eat it, and so it goes. Life lives on life. It doesn't know death. It can't know death. James, how many microbes did you kill when you wash your face today? Thousands? Millions? We think our life is valuable, but from a bigger perspective all life is the same. It's all valuable. So the problem comes from the reference point. Anne, why do Advaitans use the term pointers? Bob, there's a pointing toward your true nature. I can't do anything for you. Nobody else can do anything for you. Innately, you already know this reality because it's your true nature. Instead of looking out there for the solution, you start looking at what's being pointed to. Once you see the truth, the old habit patterns start falling off. And, so you're on this earth having this experience but are aware that it's not real? Bob, yes. Just like when you go to the ocean and see blue water that isn't really blue. It's the same thing. As the Bible says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Sub chapter, doing good when you're not the doer. And, in this becoming free, do you then start doing good for humanity? Bob, you can't do anything. You never could and never will. But, a natural compassion will arise. And then whatever happens will happen. Carrie, after getting this understanding, it may be that doing more good happens. But, it may not. That has to do with your nature. There are people who are do-gooders who don't have the understanding. And there are people who have the understanding and don't give a damn about what's happening in, for example, Africa. There's a great story about the seals being clubbed to death. The great sage J. Krishnamurti saw the news story about it on TV and turned it off because he didn't want to see the brutality. Bridget Bardot saw the news story and started a movement that brought the killing to an end. Krishnamurti was the so-called realized soul, but it wasn't his place to be moved by that. I only bring this up so you don't have an expectation that unless you suddenly become a selfless servant, your understanding is incomplete. Anne, a person wouldn't become evil, would they? Bob, not if it's not in your makeup. Were you evil before the understanding? Kerry, good and evil is a reference point, a human construct. Talk to your dog about good and evil. Anne, is it helpful to be in the company of people who are awake? Bob, it can be helpful in keeping you in the reality for a while. But, you take this understanding wherever you go. Initially, you may go out and the 99% of the world who don't understand this may drag you back. But, after a while, if you keep coming back to this understanding, instead of them dragging you back, you'll start dragging them in. That's when you can stand on your own two feet. Keep reading the book Bobs and more and more insights will come up for you. And, when we die. Bob, it's only the me that dies. You can die to the me right now, and then your worries of death are over. It was the me, the sense of separation, that was born. It's only the me that dies. And, are more people awakening these days? Bob, maybe so. With mass communication and the internet, the knowledge is more accessible. And it's your natural state. Why shouldn't people awaken to it? And, I know. So why aren't more people doing it? 
Bob laughing. Worry about the others later. Get it yourself first. James, nobody's doing anything in. And it's not you doing the awakening or pursuing awakening. Awakening is pulling you. I was on the path for over thirty years, thinking I was doing it. It was just happening, and then I attributed it to me. Oh, I decided to meditate. I decided to do this and that. The other person decided to become a Christian. The other person decided to become an alcoholic. And everyone thinks it's them who did all this. In fact, we're being lived. Things happen, and then we say that's me. I decided to become an astrologer. I decided to write books. Well, there is no me. Look at Carrie. For the past five days, he's been coming up with these witty statements and metaphors. How does he do it? Well, it's not him doing it. The thoughts arise in his head and come out of his mouth. The same thing happens when I write. I'm not doing the writing. I sit down, look at the computer, and thoughts come up. It's not really me. Harry, joking, James, I was being polite. It was me making those witty statements. Actually, it's easy to let go of your accomplishments and say they're not yours. The challenge is to realize you were never responsible for any negative thing you ever did. You never committed a sin. You couldn't have. Anne, I was hoping you could just hit me on the side of the head and give this understanding to me. Carrie, laughing. What the heck do you think he's been doing? He's been hitting you on the head for the last half hour. James, your head's in the lion's mouth now. Bob, you've come to the end of the road here. Sub Chapter: Bob, Carrie, Emmett, James, and Barb. July twenty-nine evening. Bob and the devil, heaven and hell, all mine stuff. Carrie, Bob, this is such a rare opportunity for us, being able to spend day and night with you. We all have this background image of the guru on the day as who, to our knowledge, has never used a toilet in fifty years. In your talks, you try to let everybody know that you're just like us. Those are great words, but we're still hearing this great wisdom coming out of your mouth, Emmett. It's true. We've always been looking for someone who's perfect, Carrie. We wouldn't listen to a teacher unless we felt he was somehow more than us. What would be the point? Though we automatically put the teacher on a high platform, Bob. That's why I say to everyone in the immediacy what you're seeking. You already are. Instead of stopping and seeing that people go into the old habits, that there has to be something more. This is too simple. But you couldn't be anything else. If the ancients were telling the truth that existence is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent, then there's no room for anything else. Everything must be that. The idea that if I do this or that, I'll get somewhere is impossible. You that right now, Carrie? Joking? No, that can't be it, Bob. You're holding back. To the tape recorder, make a note. Bob is holding back. We can tell by the look on his face. Group laughter. Why was the concept of God and heaven and hell created? One theory is that heaven was created because of the mortality that comes with the sense of separation, the me. So we had to create some story we can believe in that the me will survive after death. Though now we have the motivation for heaven. But. If there's no hell, then everybody goes to heaven, and that isn't convincing. So we have to work to get there. And reincarnation is the same thing. It's still a story of the survival of that me, of that ego. That's our biggest motivation, our biggest fear. The death of the me. Emmett, in the last year, I've realized that reincarnation isn't very comforting anyway. Because even if it exists, I will remember my former lifetime. Though even if I come back, I'll be another person entirely. I don't remember who I was before and what good things and bad things happened to me. Though it's completely irrelevant, 
I'm dealing with my life as it is now. I can envision the possibility that the illusion we live in might include reincarnation and karma and all that. It's conceivable the same way that God as an originator or creator is possible. Harry, I went from a firm belief in reincarnation to a firm belief that it's complete nonsense. And now I recognize that we just don't know. And any firm belief is a reference point. As you said, it's a moot point. It doesn't matter whether it exists or not. Bob, but you see that all takes place in time. It's all about becoming. And there is no becoming. Non-duality is all about being. You can't negate your being. After the sense of separation comes upon us, we're geared to look out there to become whole. Because we feel separate. It's all about acquiring and amassing. And then we get the wealth or material security, and what happens? We still feel incomplete. Then we imagine maybe there's a God out there who will make me whole if I do such and such. And with God comes the idea of resurrection. It's all mine stuff, never about essence. Then you have God, and the devil, heaven and hell. It's all mine stuff. It's all about becoming. Emmett, but you don't constantly refer to the fact that life is an illusion and this conversation isn't happening, do you? In other words, this conversation is no less an illusion than reincarnation and gods and deities. Bob, that's right. Emmett, it's all one. Bob, we're having a conversation now and there's no one here to have that conversation. We're just vibrations or patterns of energy. What you have to realize is that with mind stuff, God and angels and the devil and all, it just continues. The mind keeps dividing. There's always more and more and more. It's duality. There's no end to it. Carrie, about a year ago, there were times when I'd become moved by some passage in a book on non-duality. And I'd put the book down and just relax into being, without labeling anything, for several minutes. Sometimes I'd sit there looking around the room for 30 or 40 minutes. Occasionally thoughts would come, but basically the senses were stopped or completely in the background. This was before I heard the concept of being without labeling. I told Ramish about these occurrences, and he called them free samples. And this happens now when I'm just resting, not doing anything. It seems to be brought on by a lack of resistance or something. Or by an acceptance of what is. It's a very settled feeling. And then there's a sense of what the sages are talking about. Bob, it's an empty seeing. You can't get away from it, you can't fall out of it. There's no point of getting a concept of silence or stillness or emptiness. Just know that it's there. Not even that it's there, but just an empty knowing. An audible emptiness, a visual emptiness. Carrie, there's a change happening. Before, there was a feeling coming from the concept. Now the concept is coming from the feeling. Bob, that's a translation of the experience. You don't even need that translation. If it comes up, it comes up. You might find yourself talking, and as soon as you stop talking, silence or emptiness is there. Carrie, that's what happens. It's happened a lot this week because of these talks. No me to get upset. James, Bob, you talk about investigating the falseness of the me every time a mental upset occurs. I find myself doing that, and it's powerful. But, sometimes the upset is so intense that it still takes a while for it to dissipate. Bob, once the mind gets into something, it's hard to stop it. But, are you just saying, there is no me, or are you actually investigating? Seeing it, not the saying of it. Saying it is just the concept. James, first I may say there's no me, there's no James. But there's no change. Then I actually start looking to find a me. I ask, who is this happening to? Bob, can you find anyone? James, no. 
there's no one here. It becomes clear that there's no one inside. Bob, that's right. It becomes clear there's no entity there. And you see it again and again and again. You keep seeing it again and again for short moments of time. There's no use trying to remember the concept that there's no me. You have to investigate each time some upset occurs. The investigation will come up more and more frequently. And then it'll come up of its own accord. The same as you know two and two is four. Games that's happening now. I ask why is this upsetting me? And then I look to see if there is a me and of course there's not. Bob, don't even ask why is this upsetting me? That's giving the me a seeming reality. If there is no me, who is getting upset? There will be no upsetting if there is no idea of a me. James, can I say upsetting is happening? Bob, there will be if there's no me to get upset. Just look at the happening and investigate and see there is no me for it to happen to. James, so when something is happening that doesn't feel good. Bob, that's just what is unaltered, unmodified, and uncorrected. It's a happening. If there's no reference point, where can the upsetting lodge? It will play around for a while and then dissipate. It has to, unless you keep referring it to a me. It's time to let go of the me. It never existed. You're nothing, you're emptiness. You're seeing that. You're convinced of it. James, I sometime have a concept that I shouldn't get upset. Bob, you never got upset. If there's no me, what was it that ever got upset? Patterns of energy appear, patterns of energy disappear. What was it that ever did anything? Once you know there's no me, there's no need to even investigate. It's immediate. Expecting perfection. Barb, I have a question for the three of you. You all did TM for so many years. What were you expecting to be the result? James, first it was all about bliss and miracles and special power. I eventually reached a point where all I wanted was an end to resistance. I wanted to be able to just accept any experience that came along without grief or suffering. Emmett, I had a concept that enlightenment meant perfection, purity. Carrie, it's hard to even remember. I had a very vague idea of bliss and a total lack of suffering. A total loss of fear. Immortality. I don't really know what kept me going because I wasn't terribly focused on those things. It was all vague. In fact, we didn't think these things through. Even a little examination would have told us that the rapture we imagined enlightenment to be couldn't possibly last long, or we wouldn't be able to function. We could have figured out the practical aspects of enlightenment if we had put our minds to it. Emmett, we didn't though. Carrie, no we didn't. Bob, if you had, you would have seen that you were already perfect. Barb, because of my religion, I had an idea I was supposed to be perfect. Emmett, everything is based on the notion of an individual me. Christ is the image we're given. Bob, Christ never actually fit the image they present. He was supposed to be perfect in non-violence. Yet he belted the heck out of the money lenders. He got angry, he rebuked people. But... Over the years they make him out to be their image of perfection. Emmett, right. Any negative things about him must be some mystery that we mortal humans can't understand. Carrie, plus whatever things were covered up. Who knows what truths were distorted over two thousand years. God is the positive pole. God is the good and evil is the opposite. Non-duality tells you that everything is God. Good and evil are only human perspectives. Bob, good and evil are dualism. In fact, they're not two. It's all one. That's the simplicity of it. It doesn't get more simple than one without a second. Or no thing. Carrie, here's another thing we made up, 
omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscience. What did they mean? All-powerful, able to move mountains, all-present, able to know everything at any time, able to see everything all over the world. When you distill it down, these terms are presence awareness. They're none of the things we thought they were. Bob, the other way attributes the terms to an entity. We call it God and put a bigger and better label on it. All it really means is all presence, all power and all knowing. Nothing other than that. Subchapter, Bob and Vashti, James Carey, Emmett and Dell. July 30. The mind in conflict with the mind. Bob, presence awareness or awareness of presence is who you are. Full stop. Anne, but I still have ego thoughts. Bob, who does? When you say that you're referring it to that I thought, which was added to the events and circumstances to form a mental picture. So, when you say I still have ego thoughts, the I is a thought itself. So thought believes it's having thoughts, and that's a conflict. It wants to get rid of thoughts because it doesn't like them, or it wants different thoughts. Though it's mind in conflict with the mind, you'll never get anywhere with that except suffering. And, any question I ask will basically be a cloud on presence awareness. Bob, that's right. Emmett, when I first heard this knowledge I thought that clouds thoughts were bad. As if we should be getting rid of them. Bob, people think they have to get rid of the mind. Mind isn't the enemy. It's a wonderful tool when used properly. Emmett, from the absolute perspective, there is no preference of a human being's awareness over a dog's awareness. Bob, no. Emmett, religion has taught us that we're better than animals. That we're a higher form of evolution and are therefore superior. That's all mind stuff. The dog is living the presence awareness as much as we are. Religion gives us a reference point to hold all the other reference points together. James, when I told one friend that every time he washed his face he was killing thousands of microbes he said that humans are the highest form of evolution, so that fact is irrelevant. Group laughter. Carrie, in most cases, a well-cared-for dog is happier than its owner. All a dog needs is food, shelter, and some loving. Look at our list of needs, love, money, power, recognition, and on and on and on. It never stops. Choices will be made, but by no one. Anne, Bob, I have intense political leanings. Though now I'll just be seeing them as thoughts. Bob, you might take an active part in them. But who's doing them? Is there you there doing them? That's just how the functioning happened. Anne, but it seems like I'm making a choice. Bob, choices will be made, preferences will be held, reference points will come up. But, there's no entity they could ever happen to. We've merely believed there's an entity here. Has the eye got any ability to choose? The eye is just a thought. It has no power or independent nature. It's powerless. It wouldn't even exist without the presence of awareness. Thoughts are just patterns of energy. You are the livingness itself. Nothing can ever be taken away from intelligence energy. It's perfection itself. The rest is all appearance. Anne, I want to say that I have to think about all this. Group laughter. Bob laughing. You won't find the answer in the mind. Anne, no. Carrie, I can certainly see how someone's nature could be political. At the same time it's really important to realize that the pairs of opposites are integral to each other. You can't have evil without good. They define each other. They're different ends of the same stick and you can't have a one-ended stick. So where is the railing against evil, in a sense? You lose some of the steam to say, this shouldn't be. We should eliminate that. 
you can't eliminate anything. So the understanding of non-duality took a lot of the steam out of my feelings about anything. Games, and yet, so much of the fun of creation is the ability to stop a war or cure polio or fix some apparent problem. It's just fun. It's not significant but it's fun. Carry exactly. I have no interest in politics, but someone else could have the understanding and still have a political nature. Bar, back in Australia, there was a man in a phone booth having a talk with Bob about non-duality. And when he heard what Bob was saying he said, if there's no meaning to anything and everything is an illusion, I won't do anything. And Bob said, try staying in that phone booth for the next 30 years. Group laughter. Bob, thinking can cause so many problems. If you look at herds of animals, you'll see that when a lion chases a herd and finally catches one, the herd runs on for a while and then stops. It gets back to grazing or whatever and forgets the past. That happened to us, we'd be looking back all the time wondering, is he still there? Is he coming after us? All the head stuff would be going on, instead of getting on with life. Dell, whenever I catch a cockroach in my house I pray for it and then kill it. Group laughter. One day I caught one, and I threw it outside so it could live. In a second or two a lizard came out and ate it. Bob, it was good for the lizard but bad for the cockroach. When you're in India, you find yourself giving money to one beggar and telling another to get lost. Why? That's just what happened. And, yesterday Dell said that he got upset about something, and he recognized that the problem may have had something to do with his upbringing. The event triggered something that reminded him of his past. With that recognition are future upsets less likely to happen? Bob, sure. You might catch yourself quicker. And, if my intensity about a problem isn't too much, or if I find it amusing then I see it as a game, and it doesn't matter. Barb, the knowledge of non-duality makes life so much easier. It's easy to stop worrying about future problems that may never come to fruition anyway. Carrie, sometimes things come up that are just aspects of totality. For example, sometimes when I get angry, it's just an emotion happening. It doesn't feel like it's mine, it's just a happening that everyone with me experiences together. Advaita is not a prescription for getting better. Bob, Braha Sab's pretty quiet this morning. James, joking, I'm not taking delivery of anything today. Group laughter. Dell, lost your reference point. James, oh I'm sure that'll come up soon. Bob, did you ever have one? James, the imagined reference point will come up. Bob laughing. That's better. James, Anne, regarding politics, I was telling someone about non-duality and she was getting into it quite well. I was explaining that there's no blame or guilt for anyone because there's no doer. It's all an imagined I. Well it was all fine until I said, we don't even have to blame George Bush for the war. The thoughts are arising in his head, and he's following them. The conversation came to a dead halt. Group laughter. That ended the Advaita talk. Emmett, everyone has their limits. Gary, most people do. For my wife, it's child abusers. We can talk about non-doership for an hour, but if I mention child abusers, it's all over. And so my need to make somebody wrong can come up. James, anything can come up. Everybody has their own conditioning and personality traits. Based on your personality and conditioning, certain thoughts arise. With the knowledge of non-duality, however, you start to realize that those thoughts aren't you. They're just patterns of energy. I think if you're looking to make Advaita a prescription to make life better, it's not a great idea. This isn't about getting better. It's about accepting life as it is, and seeing through the illusion. 
If you use this as a way to make life better, then you're still in the mode of chasing pleasure and avoiding pain. And there's no end to that. There's just no end. Also, if you make Advaita prescription, there'll be limits. You'll say everything is fine unless I get gripped or everything is fine unless I have a bad experience. Well, everybody's going to reach some point where there'll be some huge problem. If you understand non-duality, it won't matter how big or small an upset or problem is. You'll start investigating who the problem is happening to. But you don't do it as a prescription. You do it like that, you're screwed. What I'm saying is you have to allow for anything and everything. Because creation is duality, so anything is possible. Somebody could come in here and start shooting us all with a machine gun. Emmett, joking, not us. James, if you make a prescription out of this, you become susceptible to the oh god, I didn't really get it syndrome. You'll say I felt good for a few weeks and now I feel bad. Oh, I didn't really get it. Well, why would you be looking to feel good? You can only feel good and happy and wonderful because there's also the possibility of feeling sad and lousy. There has to be room for everything. You can't feel good unless you're also going to feel bad sometimes. And you can feel really fucking bad. That's okay. When you feel really fucking bad, just remember at some point to say, I'm feeling bad. Who's feeling bad? Or, I'm feeling bad. Alright, I'm going to feel bad. Just feel bad until it dissipates. But, don't resist it. And, we could get lost in it. Games, yes, but what's wrong with getting lost in it? In the creation, we're all here getting lost. Some people are finding answers. Some people are staying lost. Some are getting lost and getting answers and getting lost again. Life goes on. Anything is possible. There, that's my diatribe. Bob was looking at me for being so quiet. Bob, that was very good. And thank you. I needed that. Barb, that was good. Laughing. James had been holding back. James, I had to say something before Bob put me on the spot. I saw him staring at me. Dell, now we have to edit the tape because you said the F word twice. Bob, that makes the tape. Leave it there. Laughing. Carrie, absolutely. These are Americans here. Barb, that's interesting. I was so absorbed in what you were saying, and I really don't like that word, and I didn't notice you saying one of them. Bob, joking, you're not listening, Barbara. Barb, I was listening to the substance, not the frills. James, the if word is just another boundary. We have so many boundaries. Everything happens by itself. And so when I'm planning, Bob, Plans will be made, but there's no plan maker. Barb, make all the plans you like, but don't get attached to them. Anne, I see. Emmett, Bob, where do we draw motivation from? Bob, do you need any motivation to beat your heart or grow your hair? Well, that extends to thought. Thoughts arise, and we think we're the thinker. Everything happens by itself. Barb, Everything is just a happening. Some people are seeking enlightenment and some aren't. But that's just what's happening. Nothing is actually better than anything else. And, well, I've become very good at looking at so-called negative thoughts and catching them. But, that was me catching them. Today what you're teaching is different. There's no judgment of positive and negative about the thoughts. Bob, just what is? Carrie, when you were having thoughts originally, they were from a particular reference point. Then, when you started catching the so-called negative ones, you had a second reference point. So were you better off with two reference points? Who's to say? 
but when non-dual understanding happens, it isn't an additional reference point. An Advaitin friend of mine tells the story of when he was little and found out there was no Santa Claus. He saw his parents putting presents under the tree. When that happened, his belief in Santa Claus was destroyed, but it wasn't replaced with another reference point. He didn't have to keep reminding himself there was no Santa Claus. When the first concept was gone, it left an absence of concepts related to Santa Claus. Is that right, Bob? Bob, yes, that's pretty good. Carrie, pretty good. Uh, oh, that was a B minus. Bob, who wants to know? Roop laughter. Carrie, joking, the snideness of the guru. Snideness is happening. Bob, more concepts. Group laughter. Expecting bliss and miracles. Anne, I thought that when I got this knowledge something spectacular would happen. I would be able to read minds or something. Bob, and where did those concepts come from, from reading? Anne, yes. Vashi, I thought I would be able to live on the scent of rose petals. Ever since the age of 13, when I read Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, there was always a thought in my mind that that was possible for me. Bob, yes, but was he living on the scent of roses? He's talking about somebody else. Was he able to do the things he's saying others can do? Harry, he died of a heart attack in the middle of dinner. Dell, according to his disciples, that was a planned transformation. Emmett, these miracles are all taking place in the realm of illusion. Not necessarily deceptive illusion. There are all kinds of laws of nature within existence. We can't say these things aren't possible. But miracles are just another experience. It's a moot point. It would be the false self enjoying the ego experience. A person might think, wow, people will know I live on the scent of roses. Or I lived without food or whatever. That's all ego stuff. Bob, it's all appearances and possibilities. The appearance is just how it appears to be. In essence, it's still the one reality. Emmett, I was just seeing the possibility of somebody who had believed in all that stuff for so long feeling like a chump for being deceived. But, it's not a deception. It's just another level of awareness. Bob, that feeling of deception or being a chump is just another mental image. That has to go also. You always were the one reality anyway. Emmett, innocent deception doesn't sting as much for me. If I thought that all the gurus were frauds and con men, that would draw a lot of energy out of me. Carrie, the expectation that you had and of the miracles and powers are the same for almost everyone who comes to these talks. Maybe there's one in 100 who doesn't have them. And, well after reading Bob's book and then talking with him, I walked out of here yesterday feeling like I got it. But, then all day I was thinking this can't be it. Where's the bliss? It's not a negative thing, but I had a story about what would happen once I got the understanding. Bob, that story has become your reference point. You're referring your experiences to the belief of what you expect to happen. Everything is judged from that reference point. Though so you have to investigate that reference point and see it's false. It's just a bunch of thoughts that have no real substance, no power, and no independent nature. And, as a child, I wondered why there were so few so-called chosen, awakened people. Bob, no one is chosen because there are no actual entities. There are just a bunch of energy patterns appearing as people. Living with the five senses wide open. Emmett. Bob, we've all heard the expression before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. But something changes about the way you chop the wood and carry the water, right? Bob, before enlightenment, life is all about the me. 
I have to chop the wood today and I don't want to. It's a hard job. Well, why should I have to chop this wood? It's the other guy's turn to do it. And so on. Afterwards, it all just gets done. It's a happening. No one takes delivery of anything. No one is concerned with it. All the mental commentary is gone. Vashi, Bob, you've spoken about how when a person gets out of the way, the five senses can assume their proper place. You said that with the five senses wide open, they function more equally and fully. So, if a person is chopping wood and carrying water with the five senses wide open, then the experience of that activity would be different or richer. Bob, activity would be effortless. Your attention would be on the whole thing. There would be equal attention in all the five senses. The hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, and touching would have equal proportion. What people do is they put so much attention in the mental function. Past, present, and future concerns, and so on, instead of attention being evenly divided. If the senses were functioning evenly, there would never be a problem. Imagine looking through a keyhole. You can't see too much. But, if you knock the whole door and wall out, you can see the whole view of what you're dealing with. Fashy, so your emotions wouldn't be all tossed around. You wouldn't be thinking, oh wow. I feel good chopping wood today. I hope I feel like this tomorrow. Bob, no. Everything is just as it is in the moment. If it's good, it's good. Let tomorrow take care of itself. You're still with the hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, and seeing. You don't go into the thinking part, anticipating and imagining a future. And you're not going back into memory. All your energy is overall. The Buddhists have a saying: "Be utterly awake with the five senses wide open." And they say: "Be utterly open with unfixated awareness." You don't fixate on anything. Vashi, would you say this kind of attention is more like that of a child? Is the unfixated awareness what a child would use if he or she were chopping wood? Bob, yes. The little child is in the natural state until reasoning brings on the sense of separation, and that separation brings on every ism, capitalism, idealism, atheism, communism, and all that. They all are brought about by the idea of me and other. If there's no me and no other, then everything is just what is. Vashi, so if a child and an adult both had the five senses wide open. The result would only be different in the sense that the adult would get more done. Bob, yes, the adult has greater capacity. Thub chapter. Later that night, Mariel and Jack arrive. Mariel Barretts was the friend who first told me about Sailor Bob's teachings. He advised me to order Bob's book, even though it could then only be purchased from Australia. Years earlier, Mariel had told her friend Jack Smith about Advaita. And he became quite interested. Eventually, he came across Bob's book and told Merrill about it. Muriel and Jack arrived in Sarasota midday on Friday, in anticipation of the first weekend public talk, which started the next day. Thus, I invited them to an intimate gathering with Bob, Barb Dell, and myself Friday night. After some greetings and small talk, Muriel and Jack were somewhat quiet and deferential. The Bob gave a non-duality lecture and asked for their questions and doubts. Despite having read many books on the subject, Muriel and Jack found themselves in the same position of so many other students. They understood the teachings, but felt they were getting it intellectually, not experientially. Below are excerpts from the meeting in which Bob addresses that critical issue. The talk was almost certainly one of the best of the summer. It had a powerful impact on both Jack and Meryl, who by the end of the weekend saw their search come to an end. As Jack eloquently expressed it to Meryl on their drive home, case closed. Thing through the mind, Meryl, the mind just keeps going. It doesn't stop. Bob, 
the mind will always keep going. Many seekers think the mind has to stop. As long as you have a body, the mind is going to function in the pairs of opposites. But, in seeing through the mind you're not bound by it. If I told you to go to the ocean and get me some blue water, what would you say? Merrill, it's impossible. Bob, that's right. You see the blue water, but you're not taken in by it. You've seen through it. It's the same with this. You're not taken in anymore by the concepts within the mind. They still arise, just like the ocean water is still blue. But, you know the truth now. Like the Bible says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. You're free of the imagined bondage of the self. That's all this is really about. Jack, no one can tell the truth because any time you say something, there's a positive and negative aspect. Bob, as soon as we open our mouths, we're conceptualizing. But we use concepts to point to the truth. That's all we can do. I can't teach you anything. I can only point. Jack, in the final analysis whenever we speak, it's a belief system. Bob, a belief system becomes a reference point. A belief is never the thing. So we have an invalid reference point again. It's not worth anything. What you are is timeless, spaceless, bodiless, mindless, birthless, deathless, pure presence awareness, just this and nothing else. Jack, but that's another belief. Bob, it's a concept. Jack, that's the problem. No matter how far back we go, it's a belief. We can't know anything beyond the phenomenal world. Bob, no and you don't need to. The fact is that we can't negate our knowingness right now. That's the only fact we know. And there is no time other than right now, unless we're conceptualizing. We can't say there was a time when we were not, because we would have to conceptualize to do that. And we can't say there will be a time when we don't exist, unless we conceptualize. Jack, okay. Case closed. Long pause. I get it, intellectually. Jack, but we still have to go on living our lives. Bob, not you, Jack. You're being lived. The idea of a me is false. You can't find a self-center anywhere inside. Jack, even so, when you get diagnosed with cancer, you get scared again. Because you're going to die. Bob, well, then you can understand why people who understand non-duality lose the fear of death. They know that this body can fall apart without touching them. Just like a wave on the ocean is just water. We're just like the ocean, ever-changing but never changing. Jack, but we can't be convinced of this. Bob, oh yes you can. That conviction comes. That's the beauty of it. Once you see clearly and that conviction comes, then nobody can ever toss you out of it. Who can move you away from nothing? All the saints and saviors have never gone beyond no thing. And I know for certain that I am that no thing. Don't you? Jack, therein lies the crux of the matter. Intellectually I have to say yes. Bob, don't you see that all our problems come from labeling something? Why put that label intellectual on it? If you haven't got that label then you know. The same as we create a difference by calling ourselves human beings and God the supreme being. But, if you understand the word supreme and human as labels, and you take those labels off, can you separate the beingness? Pointing to glass, this is being a glass, this is being a table, that's being Muriel, that's being Jack, this is being Bob. Take away the labels glass, table, Muriel, Jack and Bob, and what's left? Being. Being means a zing. When you hear this you resonate with it because innately you know it. That's why you've been on the searching track. Non-duality is your natural state, but it's been glossed over by your acquired mind, by your reasoning. 
It's like the sun, which is always in the sky but is sometimes hidden by clouds. When you hear this knowledge, it's like the sun breaking through the clouds. You've been waiting to hear this for so long. As Ramesh Balsakar says, you've got your head in the tiger's mouth. And as Nisargadatta said, this is like putting a match in a bale of cotton. Once the match starts to smolder, you can't put it out. It'll burn until the whole bale is gone. Jack, I wonder when I'm going to go on fire. James, Bob, I just understood something. I've heard you say a hundred times that when people say, I get it intellectually, they should get rid of the word intellectually. Well, if a person sees the blue ocean and then finds out it's not really blue, they don't say, well, I know the ocean isn't blue intellectually. If you know it, you know it. Or if you're outside in the dark and you realize the thing you thought was a snake is really a rope, you don't say, well, I finally realized intellectually that it was only a rope. If you know it, you know it. It's the same with the reference point. If you know that the reference point is false, there's no reason to say, I know it intellectually. If you realize there is no me, then you know it. The mind searches with yes buts. Bob, people always have this hierarchy, someone knows it but I don't. That's what we've been conditioned to believe, somebody's got it and somebody doesn't. Everybody and everything is that. If what the ancients told us is true, that existence is one without a second, how can you not be that? Why believe that you aren't that? Start from the fact that you already are that. And then all you have to do is find out what's stopping you from seeing that. What concept are you holding that's in the way? Merle, it's just a story we make up. Bob, that's right. You can make up whatever stories you like. But, you don't believe fairy tales. You can enjoy them, but you don't believe them. Jack, so in the final analysis this is all the conditioning. Yes, buts. Are the conditioning over the I am. Bob, like clouds in the sky. Jack, yes, those are the clouds. Bob, if you ask yourself what conditioning is there if I don't think about it, and you pause without thinking, there's no conditioning in that instant. But what people do is try to analyze the conditioning. It becomes like peeling the skin off an onion. Take a layer off, and there's another one underneath. You can do that forever, and never reach the end of your conditioning, because another but will come up. That's why you'll never find the answer in the mind. It's the nature of the mind to divide. We go down one path with the mind and think we've got to the end of that, but we're never satisfied. The mind will branch off and go into another path and continue to divide within that path. The mind has worked out all kinds of things. But, the answer to life will never be found there. Using the mind for realization is just looking in the wrong direction. Merrill, we were taught that when someone becomes self-realized, he or she has a change of vision and laughing. He's light all around. Bob, that's all part of a story to create a hierarchy, the hierarchy that someone's better than someone else. Are joking, you've disappointed them, Bob. Jack, you haven't disappointed me. But I've always gone into the yes buts. That's what you've helped me with now. Now I'm beginning to see this clearly. I see that I'm searching with the mind every time I say yes but. Bob, the answer's not in the mind. So, you full stop when the mind comes up. In full stopping what's left. You're still aware. And that presence awareness has been uncontaminated by anything that's ever happened to you. It's the same presence awareness that has been with you for as far back as you can remember. Your body was different, your thoughts were different, and your self-image was different. What stayed constant? That no thingness, that cognizing emptiness or pure awareness, has never changed. It's just like the reflections in a mirror. All kinds of reflections come into the mirror, but the mirror is never contaminated by them. 
You can't say the reflection isn't in the mirror because you're seeing it. But try and grasp the reflection to see if it has any independent nature apart from the mirror. You can't. Though you can't say the reflection is and you can't say it isn't. It's just as it is. It's appearance. It's the same with us. And if we're appearing as a reflection, fine. If the reflection's rubbed out, fine. Nurring is still the same. Jack, but there is fear about when I die. Because I'm identified with this me. Bob, look at what you said, the fear is about when I die. When you analyze fear, you'll see it's always a projection into the future. There's nothing to fear in the present moment. Any fear will be a projection in the future or an image in the past. It's never about what is. We can always handle what is. If I dropped a snake at your feet right now, the appropriate response would take place. You'd run out of the room or something like that. There might be some heavy breathing or heart pounding. And after the event, you'd label that fear. But, in the actuality, it wasn't fear. It was a natural response to keep your body alive. When we put the label on, we take on all the baggage of the past that the label carries with it. And then we move away from what is. We don't want what is and we start resisting. And the resistance causes all kinds of problems. Jack, I got it. Bob laughing. Keep it. It's yours. Don't let it go with a butt. Jack, this is great. Dell, Bob, you were talking about personality today. In the last three or four days, I've noticed that my usual patience is changing. Bob, if you were attached to it, maybe it needed to change. As long as you're not trying to be any particular way. Just let the natural functioning happen. Dell, the patience was mind-driven. It was from the ego. Now I get angry once in a while. Bob, does it last long? Dell, no, not at all. Bob, nature always flows in the pairs of opposites, but they're never in opposition. With us, instead of letting energies come and go, we hang on to the ones we like and resist the ones we don't. By holding these resentments and emotions, we cause all kinds of problems. Is searching a waste of time? Jack, this is like Nisargadatta, saying to stay with the I am. Bob, he means stay in the sense of presence awareness. Have a look and you'll see you can't move out of it. You can't go into the past or the future. You can go there in the mind, but when you do that, it's still the present. Try to get out of the now. It's impossible. When you realize you can't ever be out of the present, then, the concern disappears. Jack, years ago, I read that even the term now is not accurate. Bob, there's no such thing as now. Now is a subtle concept of time like past, present, and future. But, I use the term to point to the momentary beingness. We have to use words or concepts to point to the truth. Jack, it's a shame I had to read 40 years worth of books to find out the simplest thing. Bob, we all say that but back then when you were searching it was actually now. Just like right now it's now. When you see that now is all there is, the past disappears. I was searching for 16 years myself. And when I saw the truth, I thought those 16 years were wasted. But, nothing was wasted. It's all just as it is. And even though you didn't know it at the time you were seeking, you were that anyway. And if all the traumas and traumas hadn't happened, I wouldn't be sitting here now talking to you. We were being lived then, just as we are now. If I were the doer, I'd be worrying about taking the next breath and beating my heart. But, that's our natural state. Jack, I have another but here. Other people think I'm a mental case if I tell them, I'm not the doer. Bob, well if you've seen that you're not the doer and you have that conviction then it doesn't matter what other people think. 
let them stay in their apparent bondage. I spoke to a person this morning who said, I understand all this now, but when I go out into the world again, I'll forget and get caught up again. And that does happen sometimes because 99% of the world believe in that false self-center. If you listen to them, you can get caught up again. But, if you continue to investigate and see for yourself, you'll start dragging them in rather than them dragging you out. You know the truth and you're free in that truth. Jack, I see. So how do you like it here? Have you been to America before? Bob, Barbara has been here before but it's my first trip. I'm having a great time. They're spoiling me. James, he's spoiling us. I'm getting this knowledge. Bob, joking, what's this getting? Group laughter. What are you? James, non-conceptual, ever-fresh, self-shining presence awareness. Just this and nothing else. Jack, he's got the rap. Barb, you are nothing. James, I am nothing. Oh, God. I am nothing. Bob, look who thinks he's nothing. Group laughter. You're not getting this. You are that. Is there anything other than that? James, no. Bob, one without a second. Though, you must be that. There's no getting that, you are that. James, a few months ago on the phone with you, I wondered how anyone could get to that point of really knowing they're not the me, not the false reference point. Now, I no longer question it. I get caught up sometimes, but then I immediately investigate and see the me is false. I see that there's no self-center here. None at all. I don't feel that I have to get somewhere. For that I'm eternally grateful. And in a strange way, I don't know how I got here. Bob, you were always there. If there's only that, you must have always been there. Meryl, what about emotions and fears and such? Bob, that's the natural functioning. Thoughts, feelings and emotions are one and the same thing. Then live without them. But, instead of holding on to them and resisting them, we let them come and go. The main thing is to leave everything unaltered, unmodified and uncorrected. Though if a thought comes that I don't like this thought or feeling, you just let it be there until it passes. There's no acceptance, no rejection, no attachment and no detachment in what is. You might have an attachment that comes up. Leave that unaltered, unmodified and uncorrected. That gives it a chance to move on. If there's any fixation on something, it stops the flow. Any blockage of energy is conflict. Had enough? James, we have a big day tomorrow. The public talks begin. Barb, how many people are coming? James, probably 10 or 15. But, they are serious seekers. Most flew in from other states. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. Think Tzan, Sin, Sin, Ming Chapter 6 The Weekend Talks On Saturday, July 31, Bob gave the first of three publicized Weekend Talks. People traveled from around the country, while those living near Connecticut, Chicago and Santa Cruz waited for Bob to visit their areas. Twelve to fifteen people showed up for the first two weekends. The third was unfortunately interrupted by the first of a record four hurricanes that hit Florida in 2004. Those who came were clearly earnest and sincere. They also seemed well versed in non-duality. At the same time, some were probably in the same boat I had been in two weeks earlier, waiting for a dramatic experience that would confirm that liberation or awakening had occurred. 
Them had the same fanciful expectations about liberation that today's spiritual movements convey, special powers, non-stop bliss, the ability to perform miracles, blah blah blah. A few said they enjoyed periods of freedom or peace, but the experiences were transient. Others had good understanding, but wanted to know how they could stop from occasionally getting lost or caught up in attachments and desires. Most had read Bob's book or heard his CDs, which state unequivocally that the search is the problem. They had heard that what you are seeking, you already are. But printed words were somehow not enough. So they came to see whether hearing Bob in person would help. In some cases I believe it did. I was touched by how many thanked me heartily for bringing Bob to the States. Them even offered donations to help with expenses. When introducing Bob, I advised participants not to leave until all their questions and doubts were answered. I conveyed my brief but profound experience that one could read Bob's books or hear his CDs as much as they liked, but there was no comparison between that and interacting with him. As far as I could tell, many grasped Bob's message. Whose search ended and whose did not, I have no clue. But. Everyone appeared happy and thankful for the weekends. My favorite talk occurred on the third and final Sunday, one that was almost canceled due to Hurricane Charlie. The storm hit Florida about 75 miles south of Longboat Key and would certainly have affected our area had its path not been remarkably narrow. In that regard we were very fortunate. Nevertheless, we endured several stressful days as Bob and Barb experienced their first hurricane evacuation. We spent one full day trimming trees, securing items on our property, gathering valuables and rearranging furniture in case of flooding. Early the next day, we headed north to Orlando with our five-year-old son, our dog, three visitors, Emmett, Bob and Barbara and three cars tightly packed with luggage and belongings. Vashti, with good foresight, had made hotel reservations in Orlando early on, before they were all taken. As fate would have it, when we reached Orlando, radio announcer said the storm was headed straight toward us. So we headed to the east coast and then drove south to Fort Lauderdale. By the end of the day we had traveled ten or twelve hours, often through heavy rain. All hotels and restaurants were closed, and our first meal other than breakfast came late at night. The only enjoyable feature was that Bob and Barb got to see some of South Florida and meet a few of my relatives. At one point Bob commented that the event would make for an interesting part of the book I was beginning to consider writing. The next morning, Saturday, I checked phone messages and was startled to hear that two women had traveled all the way from Arizona, dearly hoping to meet Bob. So we scheduled a talk for Sunday. The meeting was one of my favorites because of the passion evidenced by these two long-time seekers. Their hunger for liberation was palpable, and whereas so many seekers seemed quite passive, they pressed Bob beyond the norm. What follows are excerpts from all three weekends. On Saturdays Bob spoke for twenty or thirty minutes and then took questions. Sundays were questions and answers only. Because the discussions were so similar to the material already presented in this book, what follows are brief excerpts. The discussions were profound, but the issues nearly identical to the ones Bob answered in his first two weeks. Some of the participants are named. Those whose names are unknown are labeled V for visitor. Bob started each of the Saturday talks with the following message. Subchapter, The First Weekend. Day with the I am Ness. Bob, I can't teach you anything. I can't tell you anything. All I can do is point you to what you already innately know. I'm not speaking to your body. Your body's nothing without the life essence in it. And I'm not speaking to any mind. What mind is there apart from consciousness or awareness? How many thoughts can you have if the life essence isn't there? So I'm speaking to that I am that I am. 
I'm speaking to that awareness of presence, or presence of awareness, that which you can't negate. The knowing that you are, just that and nothing else. Though there's no me here speaking to you. There is, there'll be no communication. But, if there is a speaking and a hearing. If there's a hearing from the heart, not the physical heart, but the essence, then there will be a heart to heart. If there's just essence to essence, then, there will be a communication because there is that oneness. Now any questions, doubts or arguments? Steve, Nisargadatta said that his teacher gave him something to do, and he did it for three years and then became realized. Do you have anything like that in your teaching? Bob, Nisargadatta, said to stay with the, I am Ness. He's talking about the sense of presence, the knowing that you are. Steve, stay with that. Bob, yes and realize that you can't get away from it even if you try. Even if you begin thinking about past or future, you're doing that in the present. You couldn't be thinking without that presence awareness that is always with you. Sometimes there are seeming clouds in the way. But the awareness is there anyway. Just like the sun is always in the sky, even on a cloudy day when it's blocked by clouds. Knowing that, you're no longer fooled into thinking it's gone. So there's nothing you need to do. And, after being with you last week, I was able to see clearly. But, can a person get lost again after that? Bob, once you know that the sea water isn't blue, can you ever go try and find blue water? Anne, I've done that my whole life. Bob, but you'd never go try and get blue water from the sea now that you know it's not really blue. Anne, so why does the question keep coming up for me? Bob, because the sea still looks blue. You say that clouds come up from time to time. Notice that they come up in the present. They come up now. Those clouds are just appearance. They're not real. So when the clouds come up, you can still rejoice in the fact that they're just appearing on nowness. Even though the cloud appears, rejoice in knowing it's still really presence awareness. Relax in that. And, so there will still be reactions. Bob, there'll be responses. They'll come up sometimes. And, I'm having trouble sleeping lately. Bob, when you say I'm not sleeping, you've attributed it to an entity. That causes conflict. You want to sleep, so there is resistance to not sleeping. That resistance is conflict, and it keeps you awake. You can't do anything about resistance. Because you aren't the doer. You can recognize the resistance from the point of non-resistance. There's no doing or not doing. Just seeing, seeing, seeing. All you need to know is that the me is false. James, there's a Nisargadatta quote that I love. Liberation is not a matter of acquisition, but a matter of faith and conviction that you have always been free and a matter of courage to act on this conviction. The interesting part is the courage. So many seekers say, I've seen that the me is false, but I only know it intellectually. People say they know for certain the sea water is blue, but they only know the me is false intellectually. For some reason it seems to take courage or some special faith or conviction for people to just say they know the me is false, period. If you know it, you know it. Just have the courage and conviction to say it. Muriel, it's a huge loss. James, exactly. A huge loss. And all that really gets in the way is the picture we have of what liberation, or awakening, is supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like all heaven breaking loose. Instead it's nothing, no thing. It doesn't match the picture. Though people seek without finding until they die. Thief, well that's the reason I came here, for inspiration. And to find out how to make this knowledge real. I've read all the books, but that doesn't seem to be enough. James, what's made this real for me has been interacting with Bob for two weeks. Let me ask this, do you know that the me is fake? 
Steve, yes. Games, that's all that you need to know. Now that doesn't mean that you won't still react or get caught in the reference point. If someone says they don't like you or does something harmful, it doesn't mean you won't say ouch. You probably will. But, after 10 or 20 seconds or 2 minutes, you're going to say to yourself, wait, who was that person talking about? There's no me here in the first place. He's talking about a fake me. He's talking about an appearance. In the last few weeks, many of us have been asking Bob whether there comes a time when there's a deepening. Does there come a point when we no longer get caught in the reference point ever again? And the answer is that it's irrelevant because the reference point is false whether we get caught up in it occasionally or not. As long as there's a body, there will be apparent preferences and apparent choices. But, they're only appearances. There's no actual deepening, there's only an appearance of a deepening. We're all that whether we realize it or not. Steve, it helps me to hear that. I could be feeling guilty or bad about something for a period of time, and then it eventually goes away. That means that whatever bad thing happened isn't an indication that I don't have the understanding, and I have to start over from scratch. That's encouraging. James, I knew Bob's teachings from his book and CDs, but it didn't make much difference really. Then he arrived and something happened. Bob pressed me. If I said I understood there was no me, intellectually or yes but. He would say wait a minute. Do you know it or not? Yes or no? And I had to say yes. Though at some point, you have to step up to the plate and decide whether the me is real or not. And then you have to live it. And that's what Nisargadaita meant I think when he said liberation is a matter of faith and conviction that we've always been free and a matter of courage to act on that conviction. That's why I felt it was necessary to see Bob. I wanted to know whether he was genuine or not. Bob appears as normal and natural as anyone. But, there have been a few times in the last two weeks when some issues have come up and egos have flared and suddenly it's been obvious that he's not acting from a reference point. That was something I definitely needed to see. That's when I could really accept the teaching and especially the statement, what you're seeking, you already are. Bob, in seeing that the search must stop. It's the search itself that's keeping you away from it. When you understand that simple statement James mentioned, then who's to search, and what is there to search for? There's a full stopping. Let that realization dawn on you, that you are. The search takes you back into time again. Search implies that there's something you don't have right now. There is no future. Omnipresence is all there is. Instead of looking to get something, all you have to do is see the cloud that's coming up and let it be. No need to fixate on the cloud. The chapter, focus on the space not the content. Bob, after getting the knowledge of non-duality, one of the things people often ask is, how will I live my life? No one can tell you how. Did you know how you were going to live your life up to now? Or did it all just unfold naturally? The highs, the lows, the good, and the bad has all unfolded the way it has. And it will continue to do so. Now are there any questions? Anne, when I left here last week, I felt like something changed. Well, what if my mind is just making all this up, so I can say this search is over? Bob, you're aware of all the thoughts and concepts coming up. Aren't they the content or the appearances in the awareness? They're things. And you're no thing. There's no thing you can grasp and say that is you. Changeful can never be you. Anne, so the personality can't see this. Correct. Bob, yes. He can't grasp no thing. Anne, why do I continue to need you to support me? Bob, because the focus is still going into the things. When I say to people, look over here. What's the first thing you see? 
Most say they see the wall or the light or a person. No one says space or emptiness, even though that's the first thing that is seen. The focus immediately goes into the content, instead of what everything is appearing in. There couldn't be any content if the space weren't there. It's the same with awareness. The focus immediately goes into the content of what's happening in the awareness, instead of the awareness itself. Now, take it back to where it's happening. How many eyes do you have? I'm asking from your present evidence, from what you're actually seeing. And none. I can't see any eyes. Bob, that's right. There are no eyes, but there is space there. Though it's an open window. How many thoughts are in that open window? Have you ever seen a thought in that space? Anne, no. Bob, it's always clarity and emptiness. In fact, you can't even see your head. But, seeing is happening. You can't see your ears, but hearing is happening. This is cognizing emptiness. Jack, can you speak about your own journey and how you got to Nisargadatta? And maybe tell us what Nisargadatta was like. Bob, I can go into all the stories, but of what value would that be? Jack, probably as important as anything else that people are saying. Bob laughing. What we do here is kick everything out from underneath you and leave you with that. If I start on the stories, that's all it is, a bunch of stories. My story might be better than someone else's. The what? And that's what goes on in so many groups and movements. Everyone talks about their experiences. My experience is better than your experience. This happened. That happened. This keeps people from understanding we are all abiding in the natural state. Jack, full stop. Bob, full stop. Wayne, how would you explain your compelling nature to help the suffering of others from the illusion? Bob, does it need any explanation? It comes up of its own accord. It's just what naturally occurred. There could be a compelling force, but why get in the story of it? That's all conceptual. Just let it be. Let it resonate. Can one move in and out of the understanding? Corey, I seem to move in and out of the understanding. When I move into it, I tend to say I got it. And that immediately takes me out of it. It's like I sabotage my experience. Bob, can and I move into it or out of it? I is just a thought. The sense of presence is prior to the I thought, that's how presence translates through the mind, as I am. So the thought I move into it and out of it is an appearance in awareness. Does the awareness move in or out of itself? Start from the basic fact, you cannot negate your beingness. That knowingness or awareness of presence is always there. Corey, right. Everything else is an assumption. Bob, so does that knowing that you are move in and out of itself? Corey, no. Bob, that's right. Concept might come up. And I thought may seemingly come up and move around, but awareness itself does not move in and out. So, you're telling yourself a lie that you move in and out of awareness. Wayne, the sage Rumi said, outside the ideas of right and wrong there's a field. I'll meet you there. Thub chapter, pure knowingness is what you are. Visitor, in the twenty-five or more years that you've been awakened, have you found any methods that can help us achieve this state? Bob, well get rid of the idea that there's anything to achieve. Start with the fact that you already are that. When something comes up that seems to be a problem, investigate and see how real it actually is. V. You seem to say that the knowingness prior to thought is better than thought. Why is it better? Bob, first of all, there's nothing wrong with thinking. The mind is not the enemy. It's a wonderfully creative instrument. But it can also do harm when we think we're not good enough, or we have low self-esteem and all that. 
but, in the knowingness that's prior to the mind, everything is fresh and new in that instant. But, when we go into the mind we get a label for what we're seeing. Each instant, pure seeing is happening. We're seeing just as it is. That means unaltered, unmodified, and uncorrected. As soon as we label it, oh I like this or I don't like this, we're altering it, correcting it, or modifying it. We go into it from memory of the past. And that's when problems and suffering arise. Pure knowingness is always what you are before the labeling. Look around the room right now. Pause what did you see? V, I saw the wall, all the people, the clock, and the floor. Bob, actually you saw much more than that. You saw the clothes everyone was wearing. You saw all the furniture. You saw the paintings on the wall. You saw all sorts of things. But, you didn't label everything. As pure knowingness, you saw everything. The pure knowingness is always with you. There's never any problem when just the knowingness is there. It's when you start labeling and translating everything that problems can arise. You can't imagine the pyramids without consciousness. V. If everything is oneness, then there is no judgment. Bob, that's right. When our sense of separation began at a very young age, and we began trying to become whole, that's when the idea of God came to us. This was an imagined or conceptual image about some future time when we would sit next to someone on a throne in a place called heaven. And we imagine a resurrection. Or if we're from the East we believe in reincarnation. This is all projection of a future time. Well the ancients have told us from way back that existence is omnipresent. It's timeless. There is no past or future. Ask yourself, is there a past or future if I don't think about it? V. So how about the pyramids and the Romans and Egyptians of 5,000 years ago? Bob, the only reality they have for you is right now when you're recalling them. Isn't that a fact? V. But when I'm looking at them. Bob, but you're not looking at them now. It's only a memory, an idea in your mind. You can talk about two billion light years away. But, it's right now when you're talking about it. If it's not divided from some reference point, you can't have time or space. V, so when I look at the pyramids. Bob, looking in this room right now, what's everything contained in? V, space. Bob, yes. In awareness or consciousness. Now aren't the Egyptian pyramids contained in that consciousness or awareness also? V. Yes. Bob, they're appearing to you as thoughts. The actuality's not here. And does the consciousness that's with you have any beginning? V. It's right now. Bob, it has no beginning. It has no end. You can imagine a time when the pyramids were not or when they will not be. But, that imagining couldn't take place without awareness right now. And that awareness has no substance. It's no thing that the mind can grasp. Pyramids are some form, they're some thing. V. Historically, the pyramids existed 5,000 years ago. But, you say there is no 5,000 years ago. There is only thought. When I think of what has happened within the last 5,000 years. Bob, it boggles the mind. Time needs a reference point, and there is no reference point for time. When did time start? V, so everything past is just in our mind? History tells us there was a past. You say that there is no time. So, everything is an illusion? Bob, it's all appearance. Go outside and look at the sky. Can you tell today's sky from tomorrow's sky? Can you tell space right now from the space five minutes ago? There's no reference point there. Where are you going to measure it from? Our reference point is always invalid. 
Your reference point is simply the image you have for yourself. Concept of time will work in the appearance we live in. But that doesn't mean it's real. The chapter, the psychological suffering goes away. V, isn't this just a play of semantics? In the end, what good is understanding all this? Am I going to be more at peace because of this information? Am I going to live a happier life? Bob, let me ask you this, who wants to know? It's me that wants to know, and this me is only an idea or image you have about yourself. You have to investigate and see that that me is false. It is just a bunch of thoughts you have in your mind. Now, without wanting to know, get on with the living of life and being and see how the functioning goes on from there. You'll never find the answer in the mind. You're being lived. When did you begin? When the sperm met the ovum in your mother's body. When your mother ate the food that grew her body to make the ovum. You can't find a time when you began. The how has this made your life better? What good is this knowledge unless it makes a difference? Does it make you really happy? Bob, the main thing is that the psychological suffering goes away. B. You have no psychological suffering? Bob, no. Years ago I was full of anxiety, anger, fear and so on. V, and when you understood this, everything stopped. Bob, not immediately. A lot of the old habit patterns could be triggered for a while. Like a post-hypnotic suggestion, the emotions could come back sometimes. But, after constantly seeing through them, when no energy or belief was going into these habits, they eventually fell off. Nothing can live without energy. And there was nothing I ever did. There was nothing I did to bring me to this. Years ago, I thought I was doing everything. But, it all just happened as it did. There's no independent nature in this so-called me. Only consciousness or awareness is real and that is who I am and who we all are. Anthony, is there anything in Advaita that speaks to the heart? What I long for is something that will touch my heart. This discussion is necessarily intellectual and that's wonderful. But, part of me would like to feel my way to the truth. What speaks to me most is not the words and concepts, but the equanimity you seem to have. What is the heart of this path? What is the feminine part of non-duality? Bob, when you relax into presence awareness and just be then you'll find what you're looking for. When you're living without so much labeling, accepting life just as it is, without trying to change, alter, and modify, then your heart will be satisfied. Everything we've talked about regarding what is real and what is appearance is in your dictionary. They call this the phenomenal universe, the manifest world. Look up the word phenomenon. It's described as that which appears to be. Look at the word nomenon, which is the unmanifest world. It's described as that which is. So the unmanifest world is reality. The manifest world is appearance. You can call it a dream if you like. Intelligence energy is vibrating into different patterns and displaying in different shapes and forms. Staying with that essence that you are, sitting with it for a while, you get the subtleties, and no matter what's happening in the outer, there will be a sense of well-being constantly with you. It doesn't stop all the dramas and happenings from occurring, but when you stop attributing the happenings to a me, you'll have a constant sense that everything is okay. Nothing is ever wrong. V, do you teach this full-time in Australia? Bob, yes. V, are people very interested there? Bob, not particularly. Most want to hear stories. They want to hear about experiences. Subchapter, you can't split up consciousness like a thing. Visitor, do we have any control of our lives? Bob, as an entity, no. V, then we are not responsible for what we do. Bob, no. 
V, then why punish criminals? They're just expressing energy. Bob, the judge who sentences the criminals is also just expressing energy. The judge isn't responsible for sentencing the criminal. The pairs of opposites are always functioning in the world of duality. But, this is all appearance only. The essence itself is never touched. Life is living on life. Can't know death. V. If the manifest world is just an appearance, why are we here? What is the point of this? What is my purpose? Audience member, there's no sense. There's no point. We're not even here. This is just like a dream. It happens and then after you wake up you realize it never happened. Bob, by asking what sense does existence make, and why are we here, and what is our purpose, you're trying try to split consciousness up like a thing. That's like a drop of water from the ocean trying to separate itself and ask what the ocean is doing. Ocean water appears as a wave or bit of spray, but it's still only ocean. Audience member, to visitor, when you try to talk about consciousness your brain gets in the way. To experience it is to know it. Bob, you'll never find the answer in the mind. The mind is a thing. What we are in essence is no thing. We are the unmanifest. A thing can never grasp no thing. We look for the answer in the mind where it can't be found. And there's no way out of the mind except full stop. In that full stop, your thought has stopped but you're still aware. There's a difference between thought and pure intelligence. Whenever you're being without thinking, even if for only a brief moment, you're beyond thought. People spend years trying to go beyond thought. But, it's actually simple. V. If society understood non-duality, so many laws and cultures would change. Society says a man should love only one woman. If we are all one, then when a man loves a woman, he is loving all women. Group laughter. And children would be told they belong to everyone. And my house would become your house. Bob. Manifestation vibrates into pairs of opposites. But, no matter what happens, predator and prey, wars or whatever, life isn't actually affected. Millions of life forms are carrying on. When they die, something else takes their place. More life develops from the ashes of those so-called dead life forms. Life never had any beginning. It never had any end. What you are in actuality is birthless, deathless, bodiless, timeless, mindless. Intelligence displays in all kinds of shapes and forms, but nothing actually ever happened. If the earth were blown up tonight, every particle would be in space. No particle would be lost. But, you could never call it earth again. V. Oneness is too easy. Bob, it's so simple we miss it. The ancients have been saying this for centuries. The chapter. The final weekend. The Sunday after the hurricane. The mind is just a translator. Visitor, I keep bringing past memories into present situations. How do I let go of the past? Bob, what you have to look at is this, who is hanging on to the past? The logical answer is, it's happening to me. Have a look. Where is this me that I call myself? Isn't that word me just a label? Without that label, what's there? Drop that label right now. What's there with you? V. Well, it's hard to drop the label. Bob, just pause for a minute and don't label. V. There's nothing. Bob, that's right. There's nothing. But, you're still here. You're still seeing, hearing, and touching. You're still aware. In that instant, you're prior to the mind. The mind is so closely aligned with pure intelligence that it's come to believe it's the intelligence itself. 
In fact, the mind is just a translator. The knowing is still there without the translating. Rita, if I were in a high level of consciousness, I would be able to live without any problem. I could let anything happen without any stress or fear. Bob, what you're doing now is what everyone does. You're looking for the answer in the mind. You're trying to work everything out. But, look at it another way. You seeing right now? Does your eye say I see? You're hearing now. Does your ear say I hear? Rita, no. Bob, you're translating the seeing with a thought I see. And you translate the hearing with a thought I hear. Now ask yourself, does the thought I see actually do the seeing? Rita, no. Bob, is the thought I'm aware the awareness? Rita, no. Bob, is the thought I choose the choice maker? Rita, no. Bob, what I'm pointing out is that the thought has no power. When you're trying to work out what to do and what not to do, realize that choices will be made and activities will happen. You being lived, and it's been that way since you were a child. Allow thoughts to do what they're supposed to do, just translate. The mind can be used properly. Content is happening on wakefulness. Rita, well if I would go within. Bob, if who would go within? You're looking for a reference point. Any reference point you adopt is false. Rita, if I could go within and be one with consciousness, I would be one with everything, and I wouldn't have to ask questions. I wouldn't need any answers. I would be one with hurricanes and everything. Bob, you are. Rita, but how do I bring that to conscious awareness? Bob, have a look. You're awake right now. You woke up this morning, got dressed and ate breakfast. You drove here and you're hearing this talk now. All sorts of activities have taken place. Has the wakefulness that has been with you all day changed? Rita, no that's always been the same. Bob, that's right. Though everything that has happened has been the content of the wakefulness. It couldn't have happened without the wakefulness. Though the content is appearance. This content is happening on the wakefulness. And the wakefulness has not in any way been contaminated by the happenings, by the appearance. But your focus has been in the content. That'll back right now and realize that before any thought is happening, you're still seeing. You're aware of seeing, hearing, and thoughts happening. Instead of letting your focus go into them, just be aware that they're happening. Then you'll get the taste and realize that you've always been that awareness, but the focus has gone into the content. If I ask you what the first thing you're seeing right now is, what would you say? Rita, space. Bob. That's right. But, very few people realize that. They always say the first thing they see is the content. So treat awareness the same way. Always remember that nothing can take place without that awareness that you are. Things are appearing in space, and in essence they can't be anything other than space. It's just that they're appearing different. Though all these appearances and things will continue happening as before, but they won't be attributed to an entity. Because the me has been investigated and seen to be insubstantial and without any independent nature. Then you'll realize that you've been lived ever since the time the sperm and ovum that made you came together, or even before that. Focus on the experiencing, not the experience. Rita, I've heard that before but I know it intellectually. I don't know it in my experience. I have had experiences of oneness, but then my focus fell out of it. So, how do I keep the focus on my oneness? Bob, you're focusing on your experience now. Experiences, no matter how sublime or exotic, are not what you're looking for. Experience comes and goes. You are the experiencing. You are the essence in which everything appears and disappears. Just the same as you are the seeing. 
The seeing is split up into the seer and the seen, the subject and the object. We focus on this, rather than realizing that the seeing is happening first. It's happening first and foremost, and things are appearing on it. Instead of looking for a bigger and better experience, realize that not a single experience could take place without the experiencing essence. You subtly relax back into that, and you realize you never left it. Relaxing back into it, you'll see there's a subtle warmth for well-being in that. It's constantly with you. Rita, so there's an experience there. Bob, if I like to translate it, yes. Innately, we already know this. The natural state has been covered over with reasoning and acquired mind. But, it's always there and you can always settle back into it. There's nowhere you can go to it or get to it, because you already are that. All that can happen is you can recognize that when you focus on the self-center or reference point, there's a resistance to what is. What is means unaltered, unmodified, and uncorrected. The only thing to ever correct or modify anything is the mind. When the mind is altering and modifying life, there's a subtle resistance or a tenseness within you. Then from the point of non-resistance, you'll notice a subtle relaxation, and in that instance you'll realize you're there. This will become a habit. V. Recently my husband and I were buying a house. Suddenly, I had a great fear about it. It was just negative conditioning from the past. How I break the spell? Bob, you have to remember that there's nothing wrong with right now unless you think about it. Drop everything and come back to the immediacy of the moment. Realize that resistance in the moment. You might need to remind yourself with a thought that the same old rubbish is coming up full stop. You struggle with the old thoughts, it just creates more resistance. It doesn't allow energy to flow. Thoughts, feelings, and emotions are always going to come. The idea is not to resist them. James, Bob, when you talk about how we are all being lived, it conjures up an image in me that there's someone doing that. But you don't mean that. Right? Bob, right. I don't mean that. Life is living itself. Life is fulfilling itself in all its variety of patterns of energy. The patterns of energy appear, and we mistakenly take them to be real. Everything in creation can be broken down into pure intelligence energy. The livingness is happening in all its diversity, which is duality. The whole manifestation is dualism. James, there's no how or why it's happening. It's just happening. And the mind cannot tolerate that fact. Bob, the mind constantly looks for an answer. Instead of taking its true place as a translator of what's going on, we put labels on everything, and that's where our apparent bondage comes from. Rita, the problem I have is that I want to be in activity and still be aware of who I really am. How can I be constantly aware? Bob, just know that everything is that. No matter how things are appearing, it's still that essence. Even when terrible things are happening, you see through the appearance and remember the essence. I know that all of you sitting here are pure intelligence energy whether you know it or not. I know there is no center within you that has any substance or independent nature. That's quite simple to see just like knowing 2 plus 2 equals 4. Once you know that, nobody can convince you that 2 and 2 equals 5 or 6. Investigate and know the truth about oneness then you will realize there is nothing whatsoever that is not that. Life is awareness constantly seeing awareness. Rita, if I'm thinking negative thoughts, should I get involved in them or let them go? Bob, get rid of the idea that there's a you that can do anything. Thinking is happening full stop. That's what's happening. If you're saying I think, you've split it up, you've divided it, and there will be resistance. In trying to stop it or trying to go along with it, there is resistance. Rita, 
so you presume I am so aware. Bob, you are totally aware. D, you've got this concept of awareness, and you think it's some sort of special state or some special way to be. Drop that. Drop your concept of awareness. Have you dropped it right now? Rita, right now I'm fine because I'm focusing there. Bob, drop the focus off awareness and just be. Rita, if I fear something I'll dwell on it. I'll think about it over and over and over. Bob, that's right. What I'm saying is start to look differently. Start asking yourself what's all this happening on? If I weren't aware could all this be happening? Doing that introduces you back to your natural state which is awareness. Under no circumstances can you negate your awareness. Under no circumstances can you say, I am not. You can't get away from presence awareness. Rita, so it's easier for the feelings to pass if I just feel something instead of saying, I'm feeling. Bob, yes because you're not taking delivery of anything. There's no reference point to take delivery. You may still take action based on an emotion. If there's fear, you may need to do something to get out of danger. But, you don't take delivery of the emotion. Just let thoughts and feelings be. James, fear is happening but not to anybody. Rita said she feels like she's a thinker and she doesn't want to be thinking. Well, she's not thinking. Thinking is happening, but it's not her doing the thinking. Rita, I know the theory very well after being with a teacher for seven years. Intellectually we all know it. But, how do we actually always be aware of that so we don't react so often? Bob, to James, tell her what you realized about understanding intellectually. Now, listen carefully to what he's saying. James, either you know something or you don't. If Bob tells you to go get a cup of blue water from the ocean, you would say you can't because you know the water isn't blue even though it looks blue. You don't say well, I know the water isn't blue intellectually. Rita, okay. James, so when you say intellectually I know I'm not the doer, or intellectually, I know it's not me thinking, it's not accurate. Rita, I agree. But, you're talking about concepts. I'm talking about practicality. How do we free ourselves from reactions and thoughts? How do we know all the time that oneness is all there is? I'm not talking about thinking this. I'm talking about being it. Bob, what you're doing is looking for a future event. What's wrong with right now? Anything wrong with right now? Rita, no. Nothing. But what if someone comes up and pinches me hard? Wouldn't there be a reaction? Bob, a response would immediately come up. It would be happening now. You wouldn't have to hypothesize what will I do and how will I be. You wouldn't have to hypothesize. Rita, I understand that if I were totally aware, all answers would come automatically without thinking. But, I live in this world. Bob, if you understand that, live from that point of view, and you'll know that when you try to figure out how should I live, you'll never work it out. That will keep you in that mind pattern. I'm talking about practicality here. I'm talking about living from that point. Rita, I'm asking how to stop the automatic behavior. That's my question. Bob, that will drop off of its own accord. You'll be alert to it in the moment. That so-called automatic behavior might change altogether. Rita, so you're saying that until it happens on its own accord, we're going to suffer until we learn differently. And it, she wants a tip. James, one tip is to stop saying I know this intellectually. The fact is, you actually know what Bob is saying, and you're injecting a but. You're saying, I know it but. I know it intellectually. If you stop that and start saying I do understand, 
Then when an upset happens, you'll learn how to accept life as it is. You'll see occurrences as happenings rather than something personal happening to you, which causes nothing but resistance. Bob, the but takes you into time again. What conditioning is there if you don't think about it? You're still going to have a mind that thinks in the pairs of opposites. But, when there's no entity, no center or reference point, taking delivery, thoughts and pairs of opposites just flow. Rita, I have pictures in my mind that I can't stop. How can I stop the negative pictures in my mind so I don't think about them? Bob, be with them and watch them unfold without wanting to stop them. Focus on that which the thoughts are appearing on. Be with awareness which is no thing. You woke up this morning. You've been awake all day. Has that wakefulness been touched by any thoughts or feelings that have come up? Just like the reflections in the mirror haven't affected the mirror at all. And you can't say the reflections aren't there, but when you try to grasp the reflections you can't. That's the same as the thoughts and feelings that arise in you. In the same way you don't believe in the reality of reflections in a mirror, you don't believe in the reality of thoughts and feelings. So, if you just let thoughts and feelings be without attributing belief or power to them, they aren't going to hurt you. What you are is the essence that everything is appearing on. Emmett, it seems to me that there's so much religious conditioning that we have to let go of. The idea that there's a God who cares and who is human-like. A God who wants us to be a certain way and cares that we have sad thoughts and wants us to be happy, all that stuff. Without giving that up, our tendency will always be to wonder about our thoughts and what bad things we did that have caused our current problems. That requires major investigation if we want to unravel that conditioning of why I, as an individual, am suffering. Our beliefs keep this problem alive. Bob, that's exactly right. Our beliefs become the reference point. But, the belief can never be the actuality. The actuality is factual. It's what's happening right now. This is a fact. It's not a belief. Chapter 7 And that thou art that, now what? Eight months have passed, as these words are written, since Bob and Barbara left my home in Longboat Key. Aside from meeting my wife and the birth of my son, I consider the summer with Bob the most fortunate experience of my life. There was a period in my twenties when I taught meditation and went on many several month long meditation courses, during which I thought I had found the answer to life. But, that was a function of belief. In fact, meditation and all the concepts connected to it are essentially no different from any other worldly experience. The seeming experiences of transcendental states come and go like everything else in relative existence. In fact, transcendence is who we are. We need not search for it. It is the very basis of our experience. Further, meditation as a spiritual path is based on the notion of a someday when the great enlightenment will result. A someday that of course does not exist because the present moment is the only reality possible. Odd as this sounds, other than ultimate freedom, understanding non-duality provides no gain. In fact, there is loss. There is loss of intensity, loss of belief in a real world, loss of desire to become someone special, and loss of fears and worries in general. Concerns for the future, other than practicalities of life, such as in my case, how I will teach non-duality and so on, arise less frequently and when they do they are not the big problem they once were. A desire for enlightenment or liberation or wholeness that cursed lifelong monkey on my back has disappeared completely, and along with it, the nagging sense of separation I thought would never leave. On the other hand, the false reference point exposed throughout this book, the me often rears its head. No doubt about it. And this is to be expected. 
Contrary to what so many spiritual seekers have been taught, as long as there is a body and an apparent worldly existence, there will be preferences and desires. This is because the very nature of life is to go in the direction of greater happiness and charm. It is only when getting caught up in, or attached to, desires with a false reference point that a problem arises. Such episodes occur by sheer force of habit. But, these are transitory experiences only. They happen against a backdrop of why truly am consciousness or no thing, and are quickly seen through and dropped. Before Bob's visit, there was never a clear knowing of my true unbounded nature. I did not know viscerally who I was and had no idea how to find out. That not knowing was the basis of my sense of separation from essence or source for over fifty years. During moments when I do get caught in the reference point and my sense of unboundedness is briefly hidden, a contraction of sorts occurs. Contractions are rare and short-lived, but they do occur. When they happen, intelligence arises to meet the challenge, and a realization comes that who I truly am is consciousness or awareness or no thing. Contractions dissipate quickly because they are based on a false sense of identity that cannot stand up to investigation. At this point, investigation comes up on its own when necessary, just as Bob said it would. Contractions are not pleasant, but I have grasped non-dual understanding enough to know they are no more real or relevant than anything else. They do not mean understanding is lacking any more than positive experiences mean understanding is present. There is nothing to understand, and no one to do the understanding. What happens happens. Knowing this allows energies, so-called positive or negative ones, to come and go very quickly and to do so without sticking. For this I am eternally grateful. As mentioned already, the experiences of those who grasp non-duality vary from person to person due to different nervous systems, different genetics, different backgrounds and so on. In my case, the flashiest experience is the effortless living Bob talks about. Within a few weeks after Bob left, there was an ease and grace to life and a noticeable ability to fulfill desires more effortlessly than ever before. Solutions to problems often arise from out of nowhere, and they happen on their own with no particular rhyme or reason. These occurrences are so startling and so alien to my previous existence that when they happen, my first thought is that there is some god or force of nature bestowing them. How long this desire fulfillment will last, I have no clue. It could stay forever, it could vanish tomorrow. My ultimate conclusion, however, is that when these somewhat miraculous solutions occur, it is because the nature of existence is, as the Hindus call it, Satchit Ananda, or eternal bliss consciousness. And the only thing hindering our experience of this is our getting in the way. How do we get in the way? By believing in a separate identity, or false reference point, and thinking we are the doers of our lives. This leads to a vicious circle of desire, frustration and willfulness. For non-duality, this behavior was positively my mode of operation. Now that there is greater acceptance of what is, it is no wonder that desires fulfill themselves much more easily. Of course this explanation is completely conceptual. Further it is critical to realize that different people have different experiences. Not everyone who embraces non-duality will experience what I have. Some may experience peacefulness or extended periods of silence. Some may find their intuition increasing. Some may experience nothing other than a sense of freedom and wholeness. Different nervous systems produce different experiences. Aside from the transitory enjoyment experiences bring, they are completely unimportant. As emphasized throughout this text, experience is not what is needed. Understanding or knowing this is all. There is another point worth mentioning. During my years of study with Hindu philosophy and meditation, 
One so-called traditional teaching was that when a person has attained the great enlightenment, confirmation from the Guru is necessary. This concept did not likely originate with non-dualists who consider bondage a fiction in the first place and therefore enlightenment a false distinction. Everyone is pure intelligence energy or space or no thing whether they know it or not. It is the search itself that is the problem. What is fascinating is that from the moment Sailor Bob arrived on the scene, he began confirming that consciousness, or pure intelligence energy, is who we are, and we should therefore stop seeking. He did not confirm ultimate freedom on the basis of our apparent experience. He confirmed it on the basis of reality. Just like the gurus in the parable mentioned earlier in this book, Sailor Bob repeated, You are that but he said it in hundreds of different ways. Anyone who had ears to hear was never the same again. But my purpose in writing this book was not to share my life. It was to share non-duality with you, dear reader. Before proceeding further, however, some preparation for this chapter is necessary. First, regarding this autobiographical account, the longer one lives this understanding, the harder it is to write about oneself in a non-dual context. By the time I reached chapter 7, the notion of writing my story began to feel more and more absurd. I can find no self-center within, and I am more and more aware that James is simply an appearance being lived. And from the non-dual viewpoint, the title of this chapter, I am that thou art that now what, is ridiculous term now implies the possibility of a past, as if now was not always happening. Finally, addressing the hows and whys of gaining non-dual understanding is fallacious. There is of course nothing to get. There is only a seeing that who you are is no thing, space or emptiness. And that will either happen or not, regardless of anything in the world of appearance, including reading this book. There has never been any real cause and effect to anything that has happened in my life or in anyone else's. There is only apparent cause and effect. Likewise, there is no real reason for me to share my findings in hopes that it will aid you in your path. As mentioned throughout, we are living in a dream world, a world of appearance, a world which is as real as a reflection in a mirror. The reflection is seen but it has no independent nature. On the other hand, within our world things are happening that appear to have plenty of causes, effects and consequences, which is apparently why non-dualists teach and why I have presented this book. The rest of this chapter is a last-ditch attempt to fulfill my promise in the introduction to take readers beyond the need for help, in case Bob's dialogues have not completed the task. The most difficult feature that non-duality seekers encounter is the massive contradiction between reality and appearance. How does one see and embrace reality when appearance shows up so starkly different? Most teachers I know of, particularly Sailor Bob, point as directly as they can toward reality. They do not generally focus much on the world of appearance, because people are already only too familiar with that world. Further, the world of appearance is a world of concepts. Upon entering that world, there are as many opinions and viewpoints as there are people. So, for the most part non-dualists do their best to point to reality, and to ignore appearance. This method is analogous to bringing light into a dark room rather than analyzing or addressing the darkness. For many seekers, however, hearing about reality is simply not enough. In the end, in order to appreciate reality, all concepts must be dropped. Reality, also known as consciousness or no thing and also described as non-conceptual, ever-fresh self-shining presence awareness, just this and nothing else, is beyond concepts. And dropping all concepts can be quite hard for some. Additionally, those who have been on the path for quite some time are almost always filled with more concepts than beginners. 
Long-time seekers have generally been drenched in teachings that are now, ironically, in the way. The material ahead is an attempt to break up some firmly rooted concepts that may have accrued, particularly through the teachings of the many Eastern movements that have gained popularity during the last 50 years. What follows is written for those who may actually understand non-duality as it has been presented so far, but are still waiting for some miraculous experience, transcendental bliss, or some such extraordinary happening before stopping their search and accepting what is. The material is also written for those who believe that their gurus are more special than everyone else, as if some people are more consciousness or presence awareness, or no thing, than anyone else. As if someone being aware that their consciousness is, in reality, meaningful. Veteran non-dualists in particular, please bear in mind that I am now about to address issues and concepts that have no basis in reality, but are nonetheless quite substantial for those who are still attached to appearance. Let me again state that the purpose of the following section is an attempt to shatter some false concepts that may be in the way for certain seekers. In the same way that the stopping of my search clearly seemed related to a kind of surrender to Sailor Bob, perhaps there are some apparent misconceptions which, when clarified, can make a difference for some readers. Let me also state here and now, unequivocally, that there is no such thing as liberation because no one is in fact in bondage. Bondage only ever appears real because of a bunch of thoughts and images in the mind. As has been said in many ways by many teachers, the only difference between a realized being and an unrealized being is that the unrealized one believes there is a difference. It is for those who still believe there is a difference that the next pages are written. If you have truly understood the first six chapters of this book, you are now either beyond the need for help or very close to it. How do you know if you have understood the teaching? Simple. If it is clear that what you are seeking you already are, you have understood. If it is obvious that trying to change or become better is pointless and meaningless, you have understood. Judging or criticizing others, or their actions, now appears absurd, understanding has happened. This does not mean that preferences have ceased. But, preferences do not alter the understanding that we are all being lived and that all reference points are false. If it is now obvious that meditation is unnecessary, and that life itself is meditation, understanding has occurred. If it is clear that who you truly are is consciousness, aliveness, or no thing, then understanding has happened. If it is clear that everything in creation is transitory and only presence awareness, or the right here, right now, is real, understanding has occurred. If death is no longer a concern because you realize all that really dies are the thoughts and images of an individual me, you have understood. If you are beginning to accept experiences as they are rather than judging everything from the like or dislike perspective, and if your addiction to chasing pleasure and avoiding pain is beginning to subside, then you have understood. If you have realized that the answer to life is not in the mind, and this has generated longer periods of being without labeling, you have understood. If understanding has happened, life as you knew it is finished. Or as Leo Harton so beautifully puts it, you have awakened to the dream. You have not awakened from the dream, because you are still here, and the dream continues. You have awakened to the dream. Werner Erhard used to say that life is a game where what is not is more important than what is. When understanding dawns, nothing is more important than anything else because life is seen as appearance only. The idea that one thing is more important than something else is illusion, pure and simple. Non-dual understanding requires no effort whatsoever. What is helpful is earnestness, openness, and most of all, being ripe. Being ripe, as mentioned in the introduction, has to do with being ready to die to your individual identity. It has to do with being ready to see your game ending. 
In the short time I have been teaching, I have noticed that many say they want liberation, but their actions belie the fact. Clearly they still enjoy the wonderful, terrible game of life within the pairs of opposites. They want it to be extremely important, if their favored politician wins or loses, as if anyone can possibly know the ultimate ramifications of such an event. They want it to be meaningful and significant when they are someone they know makes a seeming mistake. They want to indulge their feelings fully when some apparently good or bad thing happens. And they want to be able to know something instead of knowing nothing. In other words, they do not want their game to end. It is too much fun. Others, when directly confronted, admit they want to have certain mystical or metaphysical experiences before ending their game. Which is perfectly fine. Life is to enjoy. Life is to fulfill apparent desires. Why else would consciousness have manifested in the first place? Furthermore there are in reality, no people wanting the game to continue or wanting it to end. Although there are apparent entities doing so, what is really happening is that consciousness is playing a game with itself. The game is called hide and seek. And within this game of hide and seek, some illusory individuals are apparently seeking while other illusory individuals are apparently finding. In the end, it is all irrelevant. It is just a game. If you feel you have understood non-duality but believe that someone as ordinary as yourself couldn't have what saints and seers spent their lives seeking, remember that Nisargadita Maharaj, one of the greatest nannies ever, advised seekers they could get the understanding within one week if they were serious. Thaler Bob said virtually the same thing. Unless there are lingering doubts or questions, what is needed now is to simply live what you have learned. Investigation of the false me will likely come up on its own. It is helpful to remember that a lifetime of conditioning does not often fall away instantaneously. But bad habits can and do fall away. They do so if in the world of appearance, you are earnest and if in reality, they are meant to. If you have read this far and deeply understood what was conveyed, your search is now over. But, what exactly does that mean? Has the search ended because you are now enlightened, liberated, awakened? It is important to realize that these terms are nothing more than labels. They exist only in the world of duality and only for the purpose of dualistic thinking. They are useful for such delusional thoughts as I am enlightened, and he or she is not. Or he or she is enlightened and I am not. If you are committed to non-duality, drop the distinction now. It is a phantom, the belief of which causes untold apparent suffering. Before shouting from the rooftops that your search has ended and allowing your head to swell, which is possible, if your understanding is inauthentic or superficial or you have that kind of personality, remember that your search has not ended successfully. It ended because the validity of seeking was seen for what it is, pure illusion or pardon my French, pure crap. There never was anyone to seek or get anything. And bondage never actually existed. It was merely a thought in the mind that arose the instant there was a belief in an individual me. Beware of succumbing to old habits of trying to make something special out of nothing. Otherwise, the belief that you have reached the end becomes yet another concept to get lost in. And then your game will not be over. It will begin again the next time a contraction occurs. Then you will start believing in a me who got enlightened. And then there will appear to be a me who can lose enlightenment and do all sorts of things. And there comes more getting lost, more becoming, and more misleading others. This is one reason why so-called realized beings are often advised to wait some time before teaching. Remember that while you may have seen through the false me, and your search may have ended, manifest creation functions in an apparently evolutionary way. Nothing in our lives is static. Your search may be over, 
but your fullness or emptiness however, you wish to verbalize it, continues its apparent growth. Do not kid yourself that Sailor Bob's or Nisargadita's experience was the same when they learned of non-duality as it is or was twenty or thirty years after abiding in understanding. Nisargadatta said as much in the transcriptions of his final books. Sailor Bob, being the strict non-dualist that he is, avoids the question altogether because change or growth exists only in the world of appearance, a world he rarely acknowledges when teaching. When I pressed him on the issue privately, he said there was no possibility of a deepening because consciousness or no thing cannot be touched, ever. It is infinite and unbounded and is who we are. But, as apparent time goes by, there can be fewer clouds and more sun. In other words, we can know our true nature with more and more clarity and understanding, something I have noticed in the time since Bob left. Your apparent search may have ended or maybe it has not. In either case, do not conceptualize an end to anything. Your apparent life process, whatever it may be in whichever direction it may take, continues until the body dies. In the world of appearance, there will always be growth, even growth of consciousness. But, if you go searching for or expecting, this growth, whatever apparent freedom non-dual understanding has brought may begin to dissipate, and you may again begin to enjoy the game of hide and seek with yourself. Remember experience or growth of consciousness is not what anyone needs. We are the experiencing. Right here right now is good enough. Period. All this being the case, what are we to think of the spiritual paths gurus and mentors of the past several thousand years? Furthermore if the search has ended, is this all there is? Where exactly is the euphoria? Is there a deepening? As presence awareness gets stronger or more prevalent with time? What about the persistent thought, sure, I now feel free, but I couldn't possibly have what Shankara or Nisargadatta or Ramana or Papaji had. And what about the fact that so many enlightened gurus behave in such a scandalous way? These and many other issues are definitely worth confronting. For doing so however, let us discuss paradox. Paradox is defined as a situation involving apparently contradictory elements and a seemingly contradictory statement that may nonetheless be true. At the entrance of nearly all temples in India stand two guarding lions. The lions represent the two elements that keep people from realizing God, doubt and paradox. If you have read this far doubt, that God or pure intelligence energy or oneness exists has obviously been conquered. Paradox on the other hand can be quite beguiling and is in my view critical. Why? For many reasons. First because our apparent existence is wholly paradoxical. If who we really are is consciousness or space or no thing but we are only able to know that we are consciousness or space or no thing by virtue of an illusory phenomenon called body and mind, then it is a good idea to become comfortable with paradox. Also non-duality, liberation, awakening, or whatever name one wishes to give it, is a function of understanding, not experience, despite how often it has been misrepresented. Yet because our apparent existence shows up in a world of experience, that is where we look to evaluate ourselves and our standing. We look to our quality of experience. And rightly so. If non-dual understanding or awakening does not improve our lives, why bother with it in the first place? Paradoxically, everyone who claims to have awakened to the dream says the same thing. Their experiences are irrelevant. Understanding is all. Paradox, paradox and more paradox. As if this is not enough, here comes a whopper. The desire to seek enlightenment, to seek an end to our apparent individuality, most often seems to occur when one has realized that life as an individual is a losing proposition. 
The game of life, when you believe you are an individual, simply cannot be won. Have you noticed? Suffering lurks behind every comer. For every gain, there is a loss. Realizing this, many of us turn inward in an attempt to find lasting peace, which of course only exists within the real self, which is eternal, unbounded, and infinite. We long to lose apparent individuality and merge with our universal nature. Unfortunately, despite what so many gurus have said or intimated over the last several thousand years, it is impossible to completely lose this apparent individuality while in human form. We can of course come close. That is what enlightenment or liberation is all about. We can understand that we are infinite, we can often feel infinite, and we can behave from an unbounded perspective. But, we can never completely lose our seeming individuality while appearing in a human body. This for some, is one heck of a dilemma. Some believe that anyone who has awakened to the dream is now completely free from apparent individuality. They believe that liberated people are aware that their reference point is false and are completely unaffected by it forever and ever. But, this is simply impossible until the dream of existence is over. It is impossible until the body and mind cease. Within the dream, some people are aware of their true natures and some are not. But, the dream continues until it decides to end. The dream is the guiding force, it controls the strings, not us. It may seem to be only a slight problem that apparent individuality cannot completely cease as long as one has a human body. After all, sages and liberated beings are nonetheless remarkably aware of their infinite being. But, it is no small matter. It is this very phenomenon that causes apparent quagmires for the so-called awakened. What I mean by a quagmire is what happens when one who has awakened finds the dream taking him, or her, towards some enjoyment that breaks cultural rules, regulations, ethics and morals and causes much upset in one's surroundings. If the person has truly awakened with profound understanding, the quagmire might not be too big a deal. It is simply a predicament within a dream of which the person is aware. Seen through the eyes of seekers, however, the predicament of a guru breaking laws and or enjoying controversial preferences is much more serious. To the follower or seeker, the situation reeks of desire, indulgence in a reference point, and downright selfishness. This occurs because the seeker believes awakening to be perfection personified. He or she thinks awakening means no desires whatsoever and total freedom from selfish or harmful behavior. The seeker has not understood that the uncontrollable events and circumstances of illusory existence simply cannot end while one is in a body. There will always be an apparent reference point and apparent preferences and desires. In fact, the awakened person is no different from someone who is unrealized except that he or she is aware that his or her reference point, the me, is false. The sage has looked to find an independent entity within and has positively realized there is no one there. But, desires and preferences still manifest. Many teachers have stated that every single occurrence in a person's life is an invitation to realize one's divinity, one's true nature. True enough. But, every moment is an invitation to indulge and enjoy one's apparent individual preferences. As mentioned earlier in this book, during my search I spent decades contemplating the controversial behavior exhibited by so many 20th century gurus. I perpetually questioned whether liberation was worthwhile since it was clear that I did not want to behave like the so-called liberated gurus I saw. These were, and in some cases, still are, gurus who presented eloquent spiritual teachings that enriched and empowered thousands upon thousands of people, but whose own lives would eventually demonstrate an apparent disregard for ethics, morals, or simple concern for fellow human beings. 
I am speaking of teachers with huge followings who seem to alter our world dramatically for the better but who lied when it suited them, profess celibacy while sleeping with their students, traumatize students under the guise of ego-busting while allowing themselves to be worshipped and adored, admitted on their deathbeds to lying about spiritual knowledge for fear seekers would not buy what they were selling, slept with young children of their disciples, amassed billions, not mere millions, of dollars while they paying their disciples poverty wages, bragged about how many women they slept with, amassed fleets of expensive automobiles, told disciples they needed high-priced courses or products in order to attain liberation, and on and on. My concern, of course, was not about the teachers. My concern was what value there could be in awakening if this is how the so-called enlightened lived. My concern was about the real meaning of enlightenment or higher consciousness. Most seekers and disciples who encountered this problem feel the need to choose between four options. The first one is to deny any problem exists by disbelieving disturbing stories about their teachers. Bad behaviors are dismissed as rumors, lies, and misunderstandings, and this allows the disciple to ignore any wrongdoing. The seeker accepts that other people's gurus may be faulty, but not his or hers. The second option is to assume that anything the guru does must be for the good of the student or the world. If the guru's actions are clearly selfish or harmful, they are deemed unfathomable, as if the disciple cannot understand the workings of such a perfect master. Everything the guru does is perfect. This includes lying if it succeeds in attracting more followers. It includes having sex with children which is explained as actually good for the youngster or a valuable method of opening the chakras, bodily energy centers. It includes finding all possible ways to get hold of their disciples' money, explained as helping the seeker learn surrender and egolessness. It includes performing ordinary magic tricks and calling them miracles, explained as doing anything to inspire people's belief in miracles and God. And on and on it goes. The third option is to say that enlightened gurus are only human and should not be judged too harshly. Instead, they may be forgiven their sins, which should be balanced with all the positive effects they have created. Final option of course is to conclude one has been duped and go find another guru who hopefully will behave better. The problem with all four options is that none of them addresses the real dilemma. What exactly was the enlightenment ancient seers and sages spoke about? What should seekers look for in the first place? How can it be that people who demonstrate tremendous spiritual understanding and experience occasionally behave so badly? Mind you, I am not talking about lifelong con artists. I am talking about talented and brilliant mystics and spiritualists who, for the vast majority of their lives, served others selflessly. Teachers who profoundly enriched the lives of most of their students and who seem to have made the world a better place. The fact that so very many 20th century gurus have succumbed to fame, power, greed, bad behavior and sexual abuse begs the questions, were these people ever truly awakened and does liberation or enlightenment have any actual meaning? Note, I am addressing the distinction called enlightenment within the world of appearance only. In reality of course bondage is an illusion and therefore liberation cannot possibly exist. Further there are no beings to get enlightened there is only one as appearing as individuals. As far as I can tell, there are three possible realistic explanations. 1. The spiritual teachings about enlightenment have been a lie from the beginning of time. 2. Liberation exists but no one or very close to no one in our day and age has achieved it. 3. Many modern-day gurus have become self-realized, but popular perception of enlightenment is seriously flawed. And seekers have drastically underestimated nature's ability to keep the game of hide-and-seek between consciousness and itself going. 
If this third explanation is accurate, and I am convinced it is, the teachers themselves, both current and age-old, are largely in the world of appearance, to blame. They have, unfortunately, publicized the positive features of liberation while ignoring or downplaying their human traits. They have emphasized their freedoms and downplayed or kept secret the fact that preferences and desires cannot possibly disappear entirely as long as the mind and body appear to exist. Such teachers also seem to have neglected to explain how perfectly, and I do mean perfectly, the game of hide and seek was designed. We are endowed with a seeming reference point that can be understood as false, but can positively never disappear. How can a being that is illusory in the first place annihilate its own illusory experience? What a conundrum! Saints and sages certainly may have experienced and understood their true unbounded natures and realized the illusion of apparent existence. They may even, possibly, have seen through the illusion to such an extent that ordinary laws of nature cease operating, thus allowing them to perform miracles. But, never forget that these same sages and seers prefer peace over war and prefer well-being for themselves and their loved ones. They would be deranged or insane not to. I am not saying they are massively attached to their preferences, but preferences clearly are present. Thus they do have desires, preferences, and some semblance of a reference point. Again I say, the false reference point can be seen through, but it cannot completely disappear. Liberated beings do not lose their enjoyments and preferences just because they know their true natures. Does the controversial behavior of gurus now make some sense? Neither well-behaved nor poorly behaved gurus have an independent self within, any more than the rest of us. In reality, teachers and gurus are not making their own choices and decisions any more than anyone else. There is, truly, no difference between a Buddha and an ordinary person. This point must be understood. When Sailor Bob and Nisargadaita and other non-dualists say we are being lived, they mean all of us. When they say we are illusory beings living illusory existences dictated by cognizing emptiness, they mean everyone. Thus, in reality, there are no teachers or gurus making proper or improper choices. No one deserves blame any more than someone deserves credit. Of course I am speaking about reality, not appearance. Within appearance, there is a vast amount of room for blame and credit, as well as apparent repercussions for apparent positive or negative actions, if the appearance is where you wish to live. So, what exactly should a seeker look for? What is the apparent difference between an ordinary person and the self-realized one? There are probably as many answers as there are paths and gurus. A good definition from the non-dual perspective is that a realized person knows, with firm conviction, that consciousness is all there is. Quote from Ramesh Balsakar, Nisargadatta's translator and author of over 20 non-duality books, may also help. What does self-realization mean to the sage? Self-realization, to the sage, simply means the realization the absolute and total conviction, that in the words of the Buddha, events happen, deeds are done, but there is no doer thereof. In day-to-day -day living, both the sage and the ordinary person respond to their respective names being called. Therefore, in both cases, there is identification with the body and the name as an individual entity separate from all others. Where then is the difference between a sage and an ordinary person? The answer lies in the fact that the sage knows that events happen, deeds are done, but there is no individual doer thereof, whereas the ordinary person has the conviction that each individual performs his or her action and is responsible for it. Regarding the confusion over today's gurus, incidentally, the fault is not caused simply by poor teachings. 
is also caused by disciples wanting to have their cake and eat it too. We want to believe that someone else can have enlightenment, but we cannot. We want our gurus to be able to create ethereal bodies, levitate in the air, alter the laws of nature at will, while still maintaining human emotions and qualities. Not that we actually want gurus to have human qualities, but a plausible explanation is needed when our guru cries upon the death of loved one, or whenever the guru's reference point rears its head. We want to believe our gurus have no reference point whatsoever and then enjoy the charm of that sage's preferences and idiosyncrasies. We want to believe our guru is desireless and then create a contrived explanation for why he or she prefers more followers rather than fewer and more money rather than poverty. We want to believe gurus have complete control over nature even while dying of strokes or heart attacks and in one case suicide by pills, and what we describe as conscious deaths. In short, there has been a remarkable naivete among modern-day seekers and an unwillingness to think for ourselves. Too many of us want a model of enlightenment that fits our pictures rather than having our pictures fit reality. There is no way out of this dilemma, as far as I can tell, except to embrace a definition of liberation that stands up to investigation. I write these words not for academic reasons, but to address students who seem to understand non-duality but refuse to stop their search and, as Advaitin Greg Good puts it, take a stand in consciousness. They refuse because they are still convinced, in their heart of hearts, that enlightenment makes a person superhuman and that liberation is an experience, not an understanding or knowingness. They are still convinced that what is needed is a blissful experience of samadhi, even while admitting that one does not have to be enlightened to achieve that state. They are convinced awakening is characterized by ever-present bliss, even after teachers have bluntly stated that emotional and psychological ups and downs still occur, but are simply not resisted or taken too seriously. They are convinced that liberation is a remarkable feeling even though so many saints and sages have said that when they awakened they realized they had always been awake. They believe that awakened individuals are perfected beings of light who perform non-stop miracles, even though some of these same individuals have said there is no difference between a Buddha and an ordinary person. Worst of all perhaps, seekers are still chasing some state they believe they will enjoy, even after being told that liberation is simply the falling away of an individual me who can enjoy anything and even after being told that liberation is about losing everything and gaining nothing, no thing. They are actually committed to the concept that right now is not good enough. Which is fine except for the fact that right now is all there is. The future clearly does not exist. It is merely an image in the mind. Finally of critical, actually monumental, importance seekers must realize, once and for all, that as long as they believe there is an individual me, to gain liberation, they will never find what they say they want. As long as seekers believe that enlightened individuals exist, delusion persists. Ultimate freedom is who we are, by virtue of our unbounded nature. The moment one believes in individuality, for oneself or for one's guru, apparent freedom vanishes. When seekers believe there is a person to gain something, their apparent bondage must remain intact. It cannot possibly dissolve. As discussed earlier, if enlightenment is an understanding and not an experience, what good is it? Part of the answer was that when one understands reality, experience does change. How could it not? How could guilt or psychological suffering persist with the same intensity if one understands there is no doer? How can one continue to try to fill the apparent void that was created when the individual me was believed in if that separate me is now clearly seen to be false? Along with understanding comes a sense of wholeness and completion. But, this does not occur until one has understood that the me is false and stops seeking. 
that is when a person takes a true stand in consciousness. For those who have understood and are ready to take such a stand, congratulations. For those who have understood and are unwilling to stop their search and take a stand, congratulations. Either way, the dream continues. Isn't it great? If you have understood that consciousness is all there is and seen that the me is nothing more than a collection of thoughts and images, it does not necessarily mean you will instantaneously stop getting lost or caught in the reference point. Habits being what they are you certainly will from time to time. Neither does having the understanding mean that contractions will be painless. They will likely hurt. But, if you are able to live what you now know the pain will be short-lived. The reason for this is that psychological suffering cannot continue without energy. When contractions come, intelligence arises to meet the challenge. When apparent pain or suffering happen, a thought soon arises, who is in pain? Who is this happening to? When you look deeply, you will not be able to find any independent entity. And that will be the beginning of the end. Whatever psychological concern has arisen begins to die for lack of energy, for lack of attention, because it has been seen as a false or illusory problem. It has been seen as happening to no one. As apparent time goes by and understanding apparently deepens, contractions occur less and less. You will begin to marvel at the fact that there was a time when so many of your thoughts and actions related to solving the problem of feeling separate. You will forget that so much of your life was about becoming this or becoming that. If by the way, you think your contractions mean something when they occur, that your understanding is shallow or inauthentic or some such concept, at least remind yourself of the good company you are in. Remind yourself that so and so Guru, who has 35,000 disciples, and who awakened to the dream in a flash of blissful ecstasy and communed with Lord Shiva on the astral plane, blah blah blah, recently got lost in his desires and was caught having sex with his secretary. Remember that so and so Guru, who has been spreading peace and joy around the world and transmitting Kundalini by tapping people on the crown chakra for 16 years, was recently exposed for having stashed $40 million to avoid taxes or some other greed based scandal. And on and on. You get the point? Everyone has apparent desires, and they sometimes result in apparent contractions. In case it is not yet clear, let me state one more time. There is not now, nor has there ever been, any true difference between a Buddha and an ordinary person. If you have seen that the me is false and that who you truly are is consciousness or no thing, then you have gone as far as any saint, sage, or seer. As Bob so eloquently puts it, no one has ever gone beyond no thing. The sage's dramatic experiences are just what happened. In the same way that some people have more artistic or mechanical abilities than others, some people have flasher, mystical occurrences. If you desire such experiences, they can probably be developed and there is nothing wrong with doing so. But, they are not what the sages and seers were pointing to when they spoke about liberation and ultimate freedom. Despite how it may appear, those with flashy experiences are not one iota more oneness or consciousness than you. And if anyone asks for help you may say confidently and truthfully you are that, and that is what you truly need to know. Whether they understand is not your business. Whether they understand is a function of the ongoing dream apparently taking place. If you wish to continue seeking, enjoy the game. If you wish to take a stand in consciousness by all means do so. What does it mean to take a stand in consciousness? It means remembering what you have learned and maintaining the conviction of what you know. It means living non-dual understanding even when old habits take you places you positively don't like. How do you live non-dual understanding when you suddenly find yourself lost in the false reference point? 
simply by accepting such happenings gracefully as part of the dream of your so-called life. Accepting gracefully means not resisting and not conceptualizing or giving undue meaning to what has happened in the world of appearance. More than anything, taking a stand in consciousness means remembering that consciousness is all there is and that who you truly are cannot be cut by the sword, burned by fire, dried by wind or drowned by water. If your experience is anything like mine, you will be thrilled to no longer feel separate from your source. You will also be thrilled to no longer be concerned about gaining enlightenment or becoming someone special. But, you may in the beginning days be constantly judging and evaluating your experience. You may be looking to see if your mind is empty or still. You may wonder whether you will someday perform miracles. And you may contemplate what your experience will be after many years of abiding in oneness. For my part, I can say that in the time it has taken to write this book these mental gymnastics have disappeared. They are gone. Right here, right now is fine. The longer time passes, the clearer it becomes that Bob taught me nothing instead of something. And I marvel at this newfound freedom that was, paradoxically, always present. There is one important facet of the teaching that does not appear in this text, even within all the recorded dialogues. And that is that once a person has grasped non-duality, insights continually occur. I do not mean the cognitions that spiritual scriptures often relate, which are generally characterized as psychic impressions coming from the ethers. Insights are simply realizations about life and spiritual issues that naturally occur when one realizes that consciousness is all there is and when one has stopped searching. After Bob returned to Australia, both Carrie and I have called him every week or two. We often discuss whatever insights we have noticed. Some insights are simple, some are profound. Do not be surprised if you begin having them. And after digesting non-duality, by all means reread your favorite spiritual authors to see if their teachings now have deeper meaning than before. Certain teachings will appear far more profound while others may seem downright fraudulent. Some of you who enjoy meditation may wish to continue while others may not. When non-dual understanding takes hold, all of life feels like meditation. Spiritually speaking, there is nothing necessarily positive or negative about meditating. In the early days of one's search, it can certainly open the mind and provide flexibility. Those who have practiced meditation for many years often have an easier time grasping non-duality and recognizing the false nature of the me. And for those who wish to enjoy mystical, blissful and peaceful experiences, meditation is excellent. For getting rid of one's sense of separation and seeing clearly that individuality is false however, meditation alone is unlikely to work. In rare cases, there are those who begin meditation and immediately understand their true natures. But, for meditators who do not self-realize right away, it is foolhardy to believe that more of the same experience will produce different results. Of course one may, after years and years and years of meditation, finally give up in frustration, like Buddha, and thus awaken. If this is how your dream unfolds, enjoy the film. No path, Advaita or otherwise, is intrinsically better than another. As they say, what is medicine to one is poison to another. For those of you who still consider that you cannot have ultimate freedom because Ramana had such and such experience, and Yogananda had such and such experience, and Papaji had such and such experience, and you have had none of these, please be consistent. If you must make comparisons, be fair. Make a list of all the famous gurus you know, and judge their experiences against each another. Decide who had the best experiences, whose were good, and whose were borderline. See if you can tell who made the cut, and who did not. If one guru lived 500 years, while another lived on the scent of roses, 
while another could read minds, while another could heal snake bites, while another could raise people from the dead, while another could create ethereal bodies, while another could cognize the Vedas and so on, try to decipher which experiences are most significant and which are least, and why everyone's experiences vary so wildly. Try to determine exactly which experiences prove someone is liberated and which do not. Oh, and try not to forget that for thousands of years sages and seers have emphatically stated that there is no experience that proves enlightenment and that any experience that takes place in space and time can be learned by one who is not self-realized. Finally, since most of us have heard about the miracles performed by yogis and gurus who alter the laws of nature, but so few have actually seen one, it is definitely worth contemplating why they are so fascinating. Of course nearly everyone has seen or experienced psychic phenomenon and perhaps even mental telepathy. But, these are natural abilities that creatures in the animal kingdom probably use regularly for daily survival. As for gurus who can transmit temporary energies or cast brief spells of unity or oneness to others, this may be comparable to snakes who hypnotize birds, or to other animals who mentally affect other creatures. Regarding creating ethereal bodies, making oneself invisible, creating objects out of thin air and so on, neither I nor any of my friends have actually seen these phenomena firsthand. Thitya Sai Baba in India is famous for materializing objects, but there are so many people on websites devoted to proving he is an ordinary magician that I am not including him. This does not of course prove anything. Such miracles may indeed exist and simply be very rare. Or maybe they are exaggerations. Unless one has seen or experienced such things firsthand, who really knows? What is critical to see, however, is the reason such miracles are so captivating. They are captivating because performing them makes us special. And being special keeps our illusion of individuality intact, the same way that our belief in reincarnation keeps the hope of our individuality alive. The same way that believing our guru is special keeps our concept of individuality intact, because if he or she is special then someday we can be special. Special means distinctive or separate or individual. The desire to become special perfectly exemplifies the sentiment that life is a game where what is not is more important than what is. As long as we keep the hope of miracles alive, we can keep our game, our illusion of individuality, alive. Living the understanding that consciousness is all there is, is the end of that game. What is so good about game over? It is the end of so much psychological suffering. It is the end of a game that could not be won. Now any takers? As usual in the world of appearance, all good things come to an end. Five weeks with Bob and Barbara passed in a flash, and it was time to send them to Carrie's house in Connecticut for the last legs of their journey. The night before leaving, we enjoyed a celebration dinner at the Columbia restaurant, a fancy Cuban eatery that had become one of their favorites. Dell and Emmett came along, and Bob ordered the giant 1905 salad for which the restaurant is famous. As always, we teased him about his love of food and how much he could eat. He complained about the 10 or 12 pounds he had gained, which convinced us that he had enjoyed all the wonderful tourist restaurants we had taken them to. Dell presented Bob and Barb with some beautiful prints of paintings he had made. Vashti and I gave them a few rolls of United States silver dollars. We thanked Bob profusely for the wonderful knowledge and wisdom he had shared and promised to keep the teaching alive. Aside from all Vashti and I had learned, Bob had restored our faith that spiritual teachers with strictly pure motives still exist. He was a man who had found the answer to life and whose peace and contentment are palpable. He's a rarity who wants nothing from others, and whose greatest enjoyment is spreading non-duality. He is a gem if ever there was one, 
and I marvel daily at my good fortune in having him at my house for five weeks. Throughout this text, Sailor Bob has stated over and over that there is no difference between a Buddha and an ordinary person. He has also said that anyone who has seen the he or she is no thing has gone as far as any saint, sage, or seer. When within my commentary and story, I have glorified Sailor Bob, or made him out to be something special, I have done so only to express my heartfelt feelings and appreciation. Within the world of appearance, of course Bob is special. He has been living non-duality and teaching it for over thirty years. As a result he rarely gets caught in the reference point. But he is truly no different from any of us. He has the normal range of emotions and reactions, and has even had ups and downs in his married life after realizing his true nature. To the extent that we consider him different, we do Bob ourselves and anyone with whom we share the knowledge a serious disservice. While Bob does not throw people out of his talks for being overly devotional as Nisargadite did, he is unimpressed by such expression. It is one thing to be humbled by and grateful to a spiritual teacher, but to consider him or her to be different is a mistake. That is why centuries ago one guru told his students, if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. He meant that if you happen to see an awakened soul, do not make him or her out to be special. See an ordinary soul who simply knows his or her true nature. As mentioned already, the difference between a realized soul and one who is unrealized is that the unrealized person believes there is a difference. If you have understood the teachings in this book, you now know what sages and seers know, no matter how often you get caught in your reference point. If you have this understanding and still feel the need to travel to Australia to see Bob in person, by all means do so. Bob has the most charming Australian belly laugh. And when I tell him that someone has gotten the understanding and wants to see him, I get to hear that laugh. Why does he laugh? For one thing, he is pleased. Very pleased. For another, he knows there is no actual need to see him. If you have looked within to find a self and have found nothing there and know that that nothing is who you are, then you have realized. If you wish to speak with Bob or me, details are in the back of this book. The day after our celebration dinner, Vashti, Julian, and I drove Bob and Barbara to the airport and sent them up to Carrie's house in Connecticut. The scene was as heartfelt as any I have known. As we hugged goodbye, there were four grown-ups in tears. Barb was particularly upset because we had all grown so close, and she was afraid we would never see each other again. I told Bob that in a few weeks after he returned home, we would mail the birthday present Vashti and I had given him on July 21st. It was a large fancy clock that plays a pretty tune each and every hour. Some time after doing so, we received the following email. Hi James just received the clock and photos. So now there is a constant hourly reminder of you all, just in case I should happen to forget. And getting some beautiful emails from different people who resonated with the talks. Some intend to come to Oz, Australia, to have a few days of one-to-one, -to, -one, to clear any lingering doubts. So in you and Carrie getting me over there, you have started a tidal wave that will surge around the world. And, as I won't be around forever, my sons will have to carry on the apparent lineage. Keep up the good work, write the book, hold meetings, and talk to those who are waiting to hear it from you. And though this is a conceptual story in essence, it is true all the teachers in the lineage are behind you. Have confidence in that. Love to you Vashti and Julian. Thaler Bob Although all dualities come from the one, do not be attached even to this one.